Hello, and welcome to our event. We will get started in just a few minutes. Audio for this event is being provided using your computer speakers. Telephone audio is not being provided for this event. Please ensure your speakers are not muted and you have adjusted your volume accordingly. Please use the Q&A pod or the chat pod to ask questions of the presenters. Type your questions at the bottom of the pod. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. If you would like to make the presentation slides full screen, click the outward four arrow button in the upper right corner of the pod containing the slides. To return to normal view, click the inward four arrow button in the upper right corner. Welcome to our event. We will get started in just a few minutes. Audio for this event is being provided using your computer speakers. Telephone audio is not being provided for this event. Please ensure your speakers are not muted and you have adjusted your volume accordingly. Please use the Q&A pod or the chat pod to ask questions of the presenters. Type your questions at the bottom of the pod. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. If you would like to make the presentation slides full screen, click the outward four arrow button in the upper right corner of the pod containing the slides. To return to normal view, click the inward four arrow button in the upper right corner. Hello, and welcome to our event. We will get started in just a few minutes. Audio for this event is being provided using your computer speakers. Telephone audio is not being provided for this event. Please ensure your speakers are not muted and you have adjusted your volume accordingly. Please use the Q&A pod or the chat pod to ask questions of the presenters. Type your questions at the bottom of the pod. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. If you would like to make the presentation slides full screen, click the outward four arrow button in the upper right corner of the pod containing the slides. To return to normal view, click the inward four arrow. Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to day two of our Generic Drugs Forum 2024, 
regulatory considerations to enhance generic drug products, generic drug access. Good day, good afternoon, or good night, depending on where you are. And it's so good to see so many you know, familiar faces from yesterday here in the room with us. And welcome back to our online attendees, especially those who stayed with us for the entire duration of yesterday, starting early in the morning and in late, despite the challenges of the different time zones across the globe, including right here in the US as well. Please note the Wi-Fi login information for here in the in on site, and it will also be available at the registration desk for those of us in the room. And um, my name is Brenda Stoddard. I'm with the small business and small business and industry assistance program, fondly known as SBIA which operates within the Division of Drug Information, which in turn resides in FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research's Office of Communications. It's my great pleasure, along with my colleagues from the Office of Generic Drugs, Pharmaceutical Quality, and together with our small business SBIA staff, to be with you here today as we embark upon day two of our agenda. Today, we will continue in the same vein as we did yesterday with a very healthy mix of subject matter experts from both OGD and OPQ. And again, we entreat you to make most of this experience. Interact with the subject matter experts if you're here on site. At, at learn all that you can learn for those on our online uh, attendees. Attend all the sessions that you can attend you know, with your schedule. Submit your questions online and network in person here in, in the room and of course online in the, chats, in the chats when you can. We are also offering live YouTube streaming, so please go ahead and invite your colleagues to attend that way if that's the only way that's convenient for them. This slide here talks about our overarching learning objectives, which are applicable to both conference days, yesterday and today. And we are very pleased to announce that this two-day conference in its totality offers 13.25 contact hours for physicians, pharmacists, and nurses. The CEs are available to all real-time attendees who self-identified as healthcare professionals during the registration process. Please note the emphasis on real-time and registration. What this translates to is that no healthcare professional CEs can be given to those who attend on YouTube or for post-event viewing. I know yesterday's attendees will have heard this following information that I'm about to provide, but we may have some individuals who are joining us today for the first time, and we are required to provide you with this information each day for CE purposes. All faculty are expected to use generic names, if trade names are used, those of several companies should be used rather than only that of a single supporting company. CE faculty speakers are required to disclose to the attendees when products or procedures being discussed are off-label, unlabeled, not FDA approved, and any limitations on the information that is presented. We do have a spectacular lineup of speakers for you here again today. And the planning committee, the speakers, and CE consultation and accreditation team have nothing to disclose. Participants must attest to the attendance and complete a final activity evaluation via the CE portal, and that's ceportal.fda.gov. For multi-day activities such as this, participants must attest to the attendance and complete a faculty evaluation for each individual day. Final activity evaluations must be completed within two weeks after the activity, and that is the rule, no exceptions. So in this case, the deadline for this event is April 25th, two weeks from today. We apologize in advance, but we are unable to make exceptions to that deadline. Pharmacists should note that failure to provide your correct NABP and date of birth information in the required format may result in the loss of credit for this activity. Your NABP profile number should be the six or seven digit profile number assigned by the CPE monitor, and your birth date should be in the month-month, date-day format, example 0411. 
do not provide your pharmacy license number. Please click the My Account tab and then navigate to edit contact information to verify that your information is correct. Physicians and nurses may then view or print this statement of credit. Pharmacists should log into the CPE monitor six weeks after the last session of the activity to obtain the CE credit. Please allow pharmacists, please allow sufficient time to do this. It's unlikely that it will be there after one week. So uh, six weeks is a good time. To simplify things, each night SBIA will send one email to the attendees of that individual event day. The event will have information in, on both the CE and claim code and survey link. And I strongly encourage you to complete evaluations upon receiving that email, as we will not be able to assist you if you miss the deadline of 4-25-24. If you do not get that email by the following morning, please email us, cedarsbia at fda.hhs.gov. Please do not wait until the 13th or 14th day to send us that email. Okay, let's move on. On this slide, you see the QR codes of our social media avenues. This is for SBI, SBIA, and it will also be displayed on screen during the breaks. Now let us turn to some logistics, and these logistics are applicable to everyone, online and in-house. And here is the link for a one-stop shop for answers to your technical questions, for downloading the files, accessing the silver link to obtain the certificate of attendance and so much more. There's a lot of information there. For online attendees, this is the same page that you accessed this morning. So please bookmark it as I'm sure you'll need it during the course of the day as well. If you have any technical questions about this conference, please check there first and you will most likely find a solution. On this same one-stop shop page, there are session evaluation links for the individual session and speakers. And there's also a final evaluation link for the general conference, which, will, which is activated already. It was activated yesterday afternoon and will be sent in the daily post event thank you email. Upon completion of this final survey, an attendee can then download a certificate of attendance, which may be used in support of RAPS, SOCRA, ACRP, and SQA credits. Now the trick is when you complete the survey, please download your certificate immediately because then if you do not, you will lose that opportunity. And we entreat you, even if you do not want or need a certificate for whatever reason, you know, you might want to put it on your wall or something, uh, please take a few minutes to complete the conference evaluation as your feedback definitely helps to guide the design of our future events. Note that both the evaluation and certificate are av only available for two weeks. Same thing with the C healthcare professional CEs. That means the deadline date for everything is April the 25th. As a reminder, all these sessions have been recorded. It will take about two, you know, 10 days, two business weeks to process the recordings, maybe a little more depending, but you will be soon able to access them from SBIA's homepage and I hope that you have already bookmarked that page. It is, right now we have about 736 webcasts accessible on that page from previous uh, conferences and webinars. It's, it's a wealth of information there if you need anything. But in the interim, the YouTube link for both days will be posted on the One Stop Shop webpage at the end of the day. For online attendees, please submit your questions using the screen link or QR code. Now for our in-person attendees, again, here's the information for the Wi-Fi and there is uh, information on each desk as well. We are going to have two mics in the room, one on either side. Uh, for when you have questions, which I know you're going to have a lot of questions, uh, just form a line behind the mic and we will rotate through the mics and online questions. Please silent your phone, use the internet sparingly, and you're on your own for lunch. There, you know, there are quite a few eating establishments in the area. I think it's going to be raining most of the day, but we are going to be offering a box lunch downstairs at the grab and go in the lobby. It's not really grab and go because you have to pay for it. So don't grab and go uh, without paying. And it's going to cost about 20 bucks or so. 
Now let's look, take a look at our upcoming events, and we went through some of these yesterday, but again, you know, for the benefit of those who are new with us today, on April 25th, we will be having, I believe it's a three-hour webinar on facilitating generic drug product development through product-specific guidances. We spoke about PHGs yesterday. This, of course, is going to be in more depth than the, you know, 20-minute presentation that we had yesterday. Then May the 9th, we're going to be talking about redesign pre-submission meetings in the for 3 benefits for under submission and approval. May the 16th, we'll be talking about statistical considerations for pre-marketing risk assessment. That is 1.5 hours webinar. Then May 29th to 30th, we'll be having an annual regulatory education for industry. And uh, we've been doing this particular conference since 2011. We started um, as of 2021, we have three tracks, drugs, devices, and biologics. Each track is parallel. People can come and go you know, between the tracks as needed. And um, I, I must say this is a fantastic, it's a, all of SBIA conferences are fantastic, of course. But uh, this one, you have the, you, you have the you know, benefit of having the three major medical product centers represented there. So, uh, let me go back to this. We also want to refer you to that website you see on the screen, fda.gov, see the learn. And that site has uh, tutorials as well. Some, uh, many of them from SBIA were, were um, created by SBIA, but there's a wealth of other information there as well. And uh, this is our website for SBIA, fda.gov slash cedar SBIA. Also, for those in-house, please take a, uh, you know, take a gander of our exhibit there at the end. All those guidances that we have there on display will be up for grabs if you want a little memento, not printed on your printer, a little memento to take home for the guidances. We have business cards with our email address there. Take a look at the different resources that we do have. Uh, we have little sticky pads as well you can take, and uh, just something to remind you of the, of the conference and to have our information at hand. Uh, here is an opportunity to learn a little bit more about enhanced CEDAS enhancing adoption of innovative clinical trial approaches. And this is where CEDA is gathering information from internal and external stakeholders on the barriers to and facilitators of incorporating innovative clinical trial approaches and drug development programs. You can still post a public comment. The deadline date for that is April 19th. And to get more information, you can scan with your phone the QR code here. Okay, so now we get an opportunity to dive right into the day's agenda. And our first session will be Pediatric Excipient Evaluation Bioequivalence Perspective. This presentation provides OGD's current thinking and procedures in assessing the safety of excipients in active ingredients, IIGs, for pediatric use during bioequivalence review in ANDA reviews. Uh, this particular presentation will be given by the Dr. Yang Lu, who is a senior staff fellow at the Bioequivalence Reviewer in the Division of Bioequivalence 3 in the Office of Bioequivalence at OGD. The next presentation in this session will be GDSABE, Modernizing Bioequivalence Assessment for Abbreviated New Drug Applications. And this presentation provides an introduction of an intelligent generic drug bioequivalence assessment tool, GDSA-BE, which symbolizes OGD's modernization of drug assessment and interactive collaboration capabilities. This will be given by Dr. Tao Bai, who's a senior advisor at the Office of Bioequivalence Immediate Office, OGD. Then we will talk about the Then we'll talk about bio-IND best practices, an analysis of common clinical safety hold and non-hold issues and comparative analysis update. And this is a joint presentation which will provide successful practices for IND submissions and updates and comparative analyses. It will be given by Dr. Andrea Dugas, a physician within the Division of Clinical Safety and Surveillance within the Office of Safety and Clinical Evaluation at OGD, 
and also Dr. Shabnan Farugi, physician within the Division of Clinical Review at OSE OGD. And finally, our last presentation for this AM session is successful practices for pharmacology, toxicology, justification in ANDES. And this particular presentation will provide successful practices for farm tax justifications to support the safety of impurities and excipients in generic drug formulations. This, this presentation will be delivered by Dr. Himena Danzi, pharmacologist within the Division of Pharmacology, Toxicology Review within OSE OGD. So, uh, like I said yesterday, I'm, with, I'm going to give you guys a final test today. I didn't do it yesterday of all the acronyms, but let's welcome all our speakers from the morning session. <laughs> and welcome you to the podium, Dr. Yang. Blue. My pleasure to give you the clicker. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice uh, uh, introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, depends on where you are on, online. So my name is Yang Lu. I'm from the Division of Bioequivalent 3, Office of Bioequivalence, OGD. So it is my great pleasure to be here um, to attend this uh, forum and to share some thoughts from uh, OGD regarding the pediatric excipient evaluation from a B perspective. So hopefully we can all learn something from what we have uh, you know, researched and learned uh, internally, and we would love to share that with the industry. So hopefully um, by the end of my presentation, uh, the audience can you know, grab some take home messages um, or some learning objectives. The first one is to understand the rationale and importance of excipient safety evaluation in pediatric population for generics. And also, hopefully, um, the industry can have a, a better understanding of how the OGD's current approach is for the, the evaluation of excipient in pediatric population when we're reviewing an ENDA. So this is my disclaimer. This presentation reflects the views of the presenter and should not be construed as um, you know, a representative of FDA's view or policies. So first, let's talk about excipient safety. So I would like to start this talk by sharing, like, if not the most important, but definitely one of the most critical landmarks in the history of drug and food um, uh, regulation is the FDNC Act 1938. Actually, uh, the passing of these sets of laws is actually a, a result of a tragedy. It's known as the 1937 elixir self, sulfonilamide uh, disaster or incidents. On the left side, I show the drug. That was the original bottle back you know, almost 100 years ago, and also the active ingredient, uh, sulfonilamide, in it. So the, the, uh, the drug, sulfonilamide, was an antibiotic. Uh, we don't use that that often today, uh, but think about that. That's 1930s, and by the time penicillin has not been purely uh, has not been purified, so that has been a success, and um, it cured a lot of patients. And there was a, a increasing demand for a liquid form of this antibiotic. So uh, one of the the drug manufacturers they decided to go for it and to manufacture a liquid based um, sulfonilamide. However, in the drug, so the disaster actually is not caused by this drug itself. It's actually caused by an excipient, an untested excipient added into the solid base, uh, I'm sorry, into the liquid based drug. And that tragedy, and that you know, response for this uh, tragedy, the, the excipient, untested excipient is called uh, diethylene glycol. And that tragedy actually caused at least, at least 107 death. Uh, just remember, 100 years ago, we do not have social media, we do not have smartphones, so this is the very conservative uh, death toll, and the actual number could be higher. And within these uh, you know, victims, uh, mostly our children, un un unfortunately. Um, so this actually brings to um, a deeper thinking um, about how we should evaluate the safety of a drug, not only the safety of the drug itself, but also something we put in the drug formulations. 
From this uh, tragedy, uh, a very important lesson we learn is not all excipients are inner substance. Some may have, and you know, uh, even higher, very high uh, potential toxicity. In general, at this at this time, as we are talking, uh, uh, if an applicant wants to develop a drug, no matter it's a new drug or a generic drug, the applicant must identify and characterize excipient, not only the API, but also the excipient in the proposed drug formulation and provide information to demonstrate that the excipients do not affect or um, interfere with the efficacy and the safety. More things are actually, this is not just recommendation or guidance, this is actually law. And you know, if you are interested in more of these, this is uh, where you can find uh, additional information. So at the FDA, um, as I, I said in this uh, previous uh, elixir tragedy, um, most of the victims are pediatric. That's because they are more vulnerable compared to uh, adults. So FDA generally consider pediatric population to include those patients from birth to younger than 17 years old, or we can say from birth to 16 years of age. And sometimes we do further characterize them into uh, subgroups, as I listed here, depending on their age. And that sometimes is very uh, important uh, for um, either the efficacy evaluation and the safety evaluation, including what I'm about to talk today. So more, uh, you are more than welcome to visit uh, the FDA pediatric website to get more information uh, if you're interested. So the reason that uh, examining the safety or potential toxicity of excipient in uh, pediatric patients is that critical, it's because the excipient are commonly uh, you know, the, the excipient commonly used um, and determined safe in grown-ups are not necessarily safe uh, in pediatric population. Uh, they may have, you know, significant toxicity or, or toxicological risks. So there is an FDA-drafted guidance uh, published in 2019. Actually, is for the industry to understand how um, uh, the uh, excipient can be evaluated using an inactive ingredient database, or IID. However, at this moment, the IID, uh, it does not provide enough information regarding different exposure models, uh, including safety in pediatric population or other specific subpopulations. On this slide, I'm showing like a list of known excipient that may have safety concerns. Um, you know, I just want to point out, it's very hard to read from here, but um, there are a lot of literatures online that we can find. And the, the, what I want to point out is this list is not uh, exclusive, and it's not like only excipient on this list may have a risk, uh, a potential risk for pediatric pa population. And believe it or not, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, as we are gathering more and more toxicology uh, data, this list can only grow longer, not shrinking. So in general, in, uh, in ENDA uh, applications, uh, the recommended DB study, usually we do evaluate the safety. However, even though the drug can be given to pediatric patients, um, the recommended BE studies usually only recruit or, or enroll uh, grown-up patients due to ethical or uh, recruiting challenges. <clears throat> so additional pediatric excipient safety evaluation is very important and is very needed, and that's our current practice at the OGD. So before I jump into the next part, I would like to um, give the, uh, my first challenging question or check mark. Um, if the maximum daily intake of an excipient in the proposed formulation is below or within the limit, of the same excipient for uh, per FDA's IID, it will be deemed safe and acceptable for all ages, including adult and pediatric. Thank you very much. Yeah, it is false because as I said, the IID is not that comprehensive and it does not re uh, uh, reflect um, the potential risk and potential acceptability for subgroup, including pediatrics. So my next part will be, you know, how we actually do um, the uh, pediatric excipient evaluation in the OGD. Ooh. Okay, so let's just jump into the, I'm sorry about that, the formatting, I think. Uh, let's jump into the second bullet point. Um, so 
at the OGD, when we are reviewing ENDA and we are reviewing the formulation data, actually all excipient uh, will be evaluated uh, for pediatric population if the RLD can be given to uh, those younger patients. And our first step is usually to compare the excipient levels in the test formulation with that exceed the same excipient in the RLD or the approved and the, or approved generic versions of the same product. The reason is um, the RLD and the approved generics, uh, they will have identical target patient population, identical route of administration and recommended dose, et cetera. So that is the most conservative way um, to, to do the, eva the pediatric uh, excipient evaluation. However, if the, the excipient level in the test formulation cannot be justified by RRD or the approved generics, it will be, it's not like, you know, there's a red light, uh, we do uh, extra steps. Uh, it will be compared with other approved drugs for the same route administration. And in addition, an applicant can sub submit additional supporting evidence, including toxic, uh, toxicology uh, data, uh, literatures, uh, regulator, re regulatory history, et cetera, for um, you know, supporting um, their, their uh, conclusion that the use of a certain excipient at a certain level is safe and should not, is not causing uh, concerns in pediatric, patient, uh, pediatric population. So this kind of work is not only done you know, within the Office of Bioequivalence or uh, divisions of bioequivalence. Uh, is usually in involved uh, more offices uh, and sometimes super offices, uh, including the bio team, the clinical team, uh, toxicity team, and also product quality team. And I do want to point out the evaluation of uh, pe uh, pediatric uh, excipient safety is based on the maximum daily dose. So it's not based on the per unit dose, it's based on how much uh, a patient may take uh, during a day. And that will be uh, taking, consider taking into consideration of the MDD, maximum daily dose, for different drugs. So pediatric drugs usually have recommend dose for different age groups, and sometimes we do, and you know, need to do a further evaluation depending on uh, what age of patients will take this drug specifically. But generally speaking, there is uh, what we call kind of a risk-based approach that is to evaluate the safety of an excipient in the youngest age group per ROD label. However, this needs to be justified to, to see that um, the same uh, excipient will cause the, the most uh, concern in the youngest group. Uh, the rationale behind this risk-based approach is uh, because the youngest age group is usually the most vulnerable group. Um, they have probably the least developed uh, physiological immunity and uh, 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 they, are, they have the most immature uh, physiological condition or development, such as uh, metabolic system, the GI, uh, uh, the GI uh, development, uh, renal development, et cetera. Um, there is a potential higher risk in the younger pediatrics uh, for the same excipient comparing to older excipient, uh, I'm sorry, older pediatrics uh, or adults. Uh, we also need to consider, uh, especially for some older um, uh, ROD, uh, ROD products that has been approved like years ago, uh, the swallowability. Like uh, per FDA's current thinking, we determined that uh, uh, patients younger than six years of age will have a potential challenge to swallow uh, a, a solid base or a tablet or a capsule intact. So we also take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. So let me use a case example to, to show you how we are actually seeing this uh, evaluation on how we are doing this evaluation. Let's just assume this is based on a real case, I need to point out, but for a confidentiality reason, I, I just uh, kind of use some uh, dummy numbers, but the excipient names are actually uh, from the real case. I just point out four excipient in this example, and as we can see, the, the first one, uh, microcrystalline cellulose, and the third one, magnesium stearia, they are actually below the level in the ROD or an approved generic version. So in this case, as mentioned before, that's the most conservative way, and these two excipients will be determined acceptable in the test, a proposed test formulation. However, the, the other two, metadol and BHT, they actually exceed um, 
the limit we can find in the RLD or the generic, uh, past the generic version, either because they have a higher level or because uh, BHT was not actually found in any of um, uh, the approved, uh, approved drug for the same product. So we do take the next step, we need to take the next step, is compare that with uh, other approved drug for the same context of use. Uh, as I said, based on the risk-based evaluation approach, we uh, you know, evaluate this excipient in a, a newborn. And I can see, as we can see in this, uh, in this slide, uh, mannitol can be justified by other drugs, while we're still having a hard time finding any drug approved before that has a higher BHT level in the group of newborn. So this will raise a concern that whether this can cause a um, safety issue or um, can cause tox uh, a toxic effect, has a toxic effect in uh, this subgroup. And very limited information uh, can be found regarding the BHD safety in newborns uh, from the literatures. So we do need to point out, and that's actually what happened, is we actually pointed out to the applicant asking them to provide additional uh, toxicity data or additional evidence to demonstrate the safety of this particular uh, excipient for a newborn use. So then my next challenge question um, is uh, which of the following statement is true? Uh, number one, OGD only evaluate uh, safety of the most riskiest uh, excipient in pediatric population or OGD evaluated this uh, pediatric excipient safety evaluation uh, based on MDI, or the excipient levels in proposed generic formulation is evaluated only by comparing to the RODs? And the answer will be the second one. The problem with the first one is uh, we're not only evaluating the riskiest excipient, we actually uh, evaluate O excipient if the drug can be given to pediatric population. And the problem with the third is, yes, we do compare that with ROD and other approved generic, but that's not all. You know, if these drugs cannot cover our test uh, formulation, we do take extra steps. There are a couple of extra considerations where, when we are doing this pediatric eva uh, excipient evaluation when the drug or when the, the, the proposed excipient level cannot be justified by ROD or approved generics. So the first consideration is um, whatever drug we are trying to use to justify the current formulation, it must be, uh, it, it must, it should be given to same or even younger uh, age groups uh, based yeah. on uh, the, the, the rationale I provided before. And also the, the drug we want to uh, reference or want to use as a justification, it should have, it should be available on market or at the bottom, uh, at, at least it should be discontinued, not due to safety or effective reasons. And the context of use, of, uh, uh, context of use during the excipient evaluation is very, very important. And I will spend the next slide talking about that in a little bit detail. I still have three minutes, I guess. So the, the, the first um, concern or the first item we check about context of use is the route administration. Um, at this moment, we, we cannot accept like a, a cross a route administration uh, uh, justification. So the, the drug we want to use for justification must have the same route of administration. The second one, the second thing we consider is the duration of treatment. Um, that is because the excipient evaluation we, we, we do is based on MDD, uh, uh, MDI, is based on the daily intake. However, um, you know, the drug can be taken for a different amount of uh, periods. So some are taken for a short term, some for chronic use, uh, et cetera. An example would be if, uh, say, we are reviewing uh, a drug for supplemental hormone medication, and we want to justify one of the excipient. Probably we do not want to use a PET imaging agent, which you just take it once. So this consideration is based on potential risk uh, due to long-term intake. We also consider the severity of indicated diseases uh, between the drug we want to justify and the drug we want to use for justification. An example is if we are actually trying to justify excipient in a formulation of an anti-coughing syrup, probably it's not the best idea to refer to a chemotherapy formulation because you know, uh, the patient will take different kinds of risks. 
and also swallowability of a solid dose uh, form, uh, if the LD uh, specified actually uh, make it very clear that the drug should not be uh, uh, trued or should not be crushed before taken. If that's the case, we do need to take into uh, swallowability issue in younger pediatrics, for example, younger than six years of age. So I, I can't help showing this picture. This picture was uh, actually cited from uh, my dear colleague um, um, from the, the OGD. Uh, don't worry, this is not a real picture. This is my colleague generating uh, this picture using AI. Um, so this just reflects our thought that, you know, we do want to take consideration of as much as possible uh, during our excipient evaluation. So this will be my last challenge question. It's a little bit long, uh, but let's say if we can think from an OB reviewer perspective now. So the proposed generic drug in a uh, new ENDA is an orally dosed anti-infectious drug. It can be given to grown-ups and patients uh, uh, older than two, uh, pediatric patients, uh, two years of age and older. The recommended uh, re uh, dosing regimen is a four-week treatment, uh, daily treatment, I should have said that. Um, the, so which of the following, if they are all approved, they were all approved in the past, which of them are the best to justify um, the excipient in current test formulation. I'll just pause here and give everybody uh, like a few seconds to read the, the options. Okay, I, I'm gonna jump into um, the answer. The answer is B. Um, instead of talking more about uh, option B, again, let me see what, let, let's see what the problem uh, there are with uh, option A and C. Uh, in, in answer A, it says an anti-inflammatory drug indicated for colitis in adult patients. Um, it has a three-month re recommended uh, uh, dosing period. So this actually is not recommended for pediatric, so it cannot be used to justify pediatric drugs, even though it has a longer uh, recommended dosing uh, tra treatment period. And for number three, and um, you know, anti-seizure drug that can be given to grown-ups and pediatric one year and older, but it has a box of wording for toxicity in the RLD. So this one actually, if we forget about um, the severity of the drug, uh, the drug uh, of the disease, um, this is a, a, a acceptable justification. However, if we do consider the severity of the uh, of the disease, uh, these two drugs are treating. This is not the best idea. So to um, wrap up my presentation, I do, there are a lot of thanks I want to give to my dear colleagues. First of all, I want to, a special, th special thanks to um, Dr. Papa Roy, uh, the OB director, who's actually presenting here. Um, so Partha actually made the, the whole thing, um, multiple projects and multiple working groups available uh, and going in the Office of Bioequivalence, and thank you very much for the support. I do want to especially thank uh, April and uh, Lisa from OB and OSE respectively. They are the pioneers, pioneers that actually put these projects on table. I want to thank Dr. Ki Yiren, and she's uh, Deputy Director uh, of DB3. Um, she has been you know, along, this, uh, along the way uh, supporting and, and also leading the, the working groups, uh, you know, multiple working groups. Uh, I just list two working groups here, the Pediatric Evaluation Working Group and the uh, Internal excipient, uh, Pediatric Excipient Database Group for a lot of support. Um, and last but not least, I want to thank OGD, OB, and OSC management and staff for their great support. And of course, thank you for your attention. I would love to take questions. Please feel free to put it in the chat. Thank you. Now I'm gonna turn it to my dear colleague, Tao. Thank you very much. Good morning, or good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> um, my name is Tao. I'm from Office of Equivalence. I'm senior advisor. Um, today, you can see that um, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit different from other speakers. And but I just want to say, just now you heard my colleague talking about how bioequivalence assessor assesses safety for pediatric use for inactive ingredient in the proposed formulation. Um, during and uh, assessment for bioequivalence. Next, I'm gonna tell you 
where this assessment occurs and how efficient this assessment could be by using a modernized regulatory assessment tool called GDSA-BE. Uh, we give it a beautiful name, just easy to remember. Listen carefully. It's called GDESA-BE, okay? Um, so hopefully you all can remember that after my talk. Uh, but here I'd like to pause and take a, I mean, make a quick poll in our uh, on-site audience. So how many of you have heard another um, agency's structure assessment initiative called CASA? Please raise your hand if you do. Ah, okay. Um, how, how many of you have heard Gadesa BE before today? Okay, none. Oh, maybe one. <laughs> All right. Um, so actually, it's not surprising. Uh, today is the first day or first time that OGD is officially talking about this uh, great modernized generic tool, um, generic assessment tool. And I have the greatest honor to do the job today. So please do me a favor. If you could only remember one thing from my talk, that would be OGD is scrapping text-based, decades-long review process for Cadesa BE. This is a modernized generic regulatory assessment for accelerated um, bioequivalence regulatory uh, 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 process, right? For accelerated review, for efficient review, for streamlined review. So we're changing for good. Okay, now let's see. Um, so why we are initiating this Cadesa BE? Um, any, any thoughts? Because we need a modernization, right? <laughs> For decades long, we have been sort of uh, thinking about what we should change for this text-based uh, review process. We know we need a change, but just recently, you know, um, we have, every day we see these new innovations such as AI, ChatGBT, right, um, Sora, continue influencing uh, human, humanity for almost every industry in the outside world. That makes us think and make us cannot stand still with the current text-based review. We just need a change. Thanks to the IT technology advancement that makes this possible for us, now we come up with this modernized generic drug assessment called GDESA BE, and this is really the next generation of generic drug assessment process for bioequivalence. And please remember these four words, consistency, standardization, efficiency, and knowledge management. These, are, these words are really the model of GDESA BE. So these are really, um, you know, highlight the benefits this GDESA BE tool can provide to the entire generic drug program. And um, the need for the modernization also comes from the challenges, right? The challenges that we're facing for the current regulatory assessment process. Uh, for example, externally, um, growing complexities with endless emission that makes us feel we need a streamlined assessment process in order to successfully meet the GDUFA go dates. And also the growing uh, expectations from Congress, from the public, from all of you have motivated us to make the change. Um, like I said before, the current regulatory assessment is not ideal, not perfect, right? We recognize um, there are a lot of room to improve this process. So the freestyle narrative text-based review just provides a lot of limitations. And uh, for example, knowledge management, it just doesn't give us a very good visibility, right, for any prior, uh, previously completed review. Um, also, you know, it involves a lot of manual administrative tasks. For example, reviewers need to copy pasting data from the submission, reviewers need to manually searching databases in FDA data sources, right? So all of these need improvements. And most importantly, we feel during the development of GDESA BE, we feel we probably also need structured data submission from ANA applicants, okay? So think about Right In the future, if we have structured data submission, we can make this interface with GDESA BE. So GDESA BE can really achieve very high level of automation, right? And this will really help free our assessors from the manual excessive work and allow them to focus on 
the areas that really require human intelligence and their professional ex expertise. So now we have talked about why we made the change. Um, really, the modernization is a key, right? And actually, modernizing the generic drug program is OGD's top priority for its five-year strategic plan between 2023 and 2028. So um, for the process, uh, we'd like to modernize to enhance efficiency and consistency across the entire generic drug pro program. And we believe, we believe that once GDSB is fully developed and implemented in OGD, and we can really enrich the effectiveness and consistency for the regulatory assessment for bioequivalence, and really, this will be a significant step for OGD to make, right, towards, making, towards achieving this goal, modernizing the generic drug program. And OGD has published 2023 annual report. Um, it is available online. So we have shared a little bit of details about the progress we have made to developing this tool in 2023. If you are interested, please download the copy from the internet and take a read. Um, so at this point, I believe everyone um, probably understand what GDESA is, right? Generic Drug Structure Assessment. So this is really symbolizing the next generation OGD's regulatory assessment tool for, regulatory, uh, uh, for generic drugs. Uh, so this is kind of busy slide, but I, I'd, like to, I'd like you to uh, focus on these four graphics on the slide. Uh, so let's take a look at the middle row first. This illustration uh, really help you to understand um, from the old or decades long text-based disorder form, which is on the left, um, to move to you know, a more future structured state of the regulatory assessment. And this future state is much more ordered, much more structured, and it has this dynamic interactive capabilities with all the different resources. I'll explain that in a little bit of detail in the next slide. Um, so with that thinking, you know, the bottom two images will show you an example of GDESA BE using generic drug regulatory uh, bioequivalence assessment as example, right? The bottom two images will let you know um, the comparison view of regulatory bioequivalence assessment before GDESA BE, which is the left image, and after GDESA BE, which is on the right bottom corner. So before GDESA BE, the bottom bottom left image is a snapshot of our GDESA, uh, sorry, of our regulatory assessment for bioequivalence. You can see all of these rows and columns needs to be manually filled by our assessors and they all need to go to the submission and manually retrieve the data and put that in this review template. Okay, and now once we move to the GDESA-B stage, and this is the interface of GDESA-BE, by the way, and they only need to enter this end number, and then a lot of information from the left image will be auto-populated for them. Okay, think about that. And the, in this red box, it really highlights the future state of generic drug regulatory assessment. So how efficient, how streamlined it could be once GDESA is fully implemented in OGD. Okay, so now I come to my million dollar slide. <laughs> so if you could only remember one slide from my talk today, this would be it, okay? Um, so as I said, uh, GDESA has a model, right? Uh, the four words. Efficiency, consistency, standardization, and knowledge management. So on this slide, it really tell you why the features of GDESA BE can provide us, provide generic drug program, all of these benefits. So first, data automation analysis. Um, so GDESA is a tool that we could integrate this tool with some assessment tools that we developed in-house. And by using these assessment tools, currently we are able to achieve certain level of automation. For example, we can auto-populate in some data from the end of submission to GDESA BE. We can even auto-analyze some PK data using that tools. 
And uh, we are visioning, right, in the future, once the structured data submission is in place, we can achieve even more high-level automations. So this really helps cut down the time that reviewers spend in you know, manual um, administrative tasks like copy-pasting and uh, allow for a higher efficiency for the review process. Second, data mapping and comparison. So uh, remember I mentioned in the previous slide that Gadesa BE is a tool that we could, um, we could have more interactive capabilities with various data sources, right? These data sources in FDA um, resource page that we could create a linkage um, with Gadesa BE. So Gadesa BE can link to these data sources. And um, previously, uh, assessors really need to go to these data sources one by one, and some of them may be in the different systems. They can, they have to go jump in and jump out of the system to do a manual search of the data that they need to complete their review. Um, but once we, once we link Gadesa BE with these data sources, the assessors really just need to sit in within Gadesa BE, right? Once they opened up Gadesa BE, uh, all of these data sources are available to them. They don't need to go out, go in, you know, different systems to find the data. Just one click away, they can have the data available to them or even auto imported from these data sources to Gadesa BE. So think about how efficient that process could be, right? We are saving tremendous amount of time for the reviewer spend searching databases, searching data sources. And we also allow a higher level of standardization and consistency for our review process. And um, third, you know, we can also link Gadesa B with various different language libraries. So over the years, right, based on all the years uh, review experiences, we have develop, developed all different types of language libraries. And we can really link Gadesa B with, with these language libraries so we can make sure a consistent deficiency language can be used for similarly situated cases. Um, right, and also we can capture any new uh, unique deficiency language that's used for a unique scientific um, issue. So in that case, this new deficiency language can be used for the future use, right? So this really helps me, um, you know, it's a great segue, help me to go down to my last, but not the least, probably the most prominent feature of Gadesa BE, which is knowledge management. Okay, so um, at this point, I hope you probably get a sense Gadesa BE can capture data, store the data, um, curate the data, and use that data for future cases, right? So this is really a great knowledge management tool and also, you know, intelligent bioequivalence review tool. Really. So this is a slide I really want everyone to remember in your, in your mind um, when you walk away from today's presentation. Um, so Gadesa B is our next generation uh, regulatory assessment for bioequivalence. And it's, it is both an intelligent review tool and a valuable knowledge tool for Office of Bioequivalence and OGD. Lastly, I want to share with you a little bit about where we stand today for Gadesa BE. Uh, since 2022, we have, we have launched three releases, including the very first software release in December 2022, and there are about 60 and applications reviewed in Gadesa BE system now. And uh, I want to um, emphasize that Gadesa BE is fully implemented in Office Bioequivalence. And with that, um, it's my challenge question time. Gadesa BE, Generic Drug Structure Assessment Bioequivalence Tool, is A, Generic Drug Bioequivalence Review Tool, B, Bioequivalence Knowledge Management Tool, and C, both. Any takers? C, right? <laughs> yeah, it's obvious. And um, um, in summary, you know, Generic Drug Bioequivalence Assessment is entering a new era. Right, you all can see that we are dumping the old um, text-based review. We are very excitedly going to this new stage, Gadesa BE. And like I said many times, this is not only assessment tool but also a knowledge man management tool. 
And with GDESA BE, we are, we are looking to achieving higher efficiency, higher standardization, and um, we can empower our um, assessment to make more consistent and, and uh, more informed the regulatory decision. And so this is a wonderful tool that the entire Office of Bioequivalence and OGD are very excited to embrace. So with that, um, I end my presentation today. But before I leave the podium, I, I just want to make an, uh, another quick poll. By now, how many of you know Gadesa BE? All right, a lot more hands, right? <laughs> thank you, and it looks like you learned something new from my talk, and thank you for helping me achieve uh, my mission. And um, you know, I'm very happy to come back to answer any questions you have in the Q&A. All right, uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to my colleague, Andrea and Shepnam for BioIND. <laughs> It's always tricky to follow a talk about modernization with my paper notes. Um, but then again, I'm also that person that like reads actual books, like really paper books. I'm that old. So, um, all right. So I am here with Dr. Faruji, and we're going to be talking to you today about bioinds and comparative analyses. Two for one here. All right. Bonus deal. Let's ride. Um, just as a disclaimer, this presentation reflects the views of the authors and should not be construed to represent the FDA's views or policies. So to start things off with BioINDs, I'm going to give you some tips here about how to avoid clinical holds and how to just streamline your BioIND processes. So I'm Andrea Dugas. I'm a reviewer in the Division of Clinical Safety and Surveillance. I am a physician. And um, we are the division that is responsible for reviewing these bioINDs from a clinical safety standpoint. Obviously, these are going to be going over to our colleagues in bioequivalents and chemistry and all that. So what I'm going to talk about here really is focused on clinical safety. So there are two things that I want you to take away. She just had one thing. I've got two. I've, you guys can do it. I have very high expectations for you. Um, one is to be able to identify the FDA resources that are there to assist the bioIND process. Hint, they're at the end of this presentation in the resources slide. It's like labeled. And second is to learn some tips on how to avoid clinical holds and, and save time and back and forth on these bioIND submissions. So no FDA talk would be complete without mentioning 21 CFR. This is my obligatory slide. I did it. Um, so <clears throat> as opposed to the Office of New Drugs, where INDs are really going to be um, a lot of times you know, new to human or not approved drugs, these are already approved. They've already been in humans. So there are three reasons why people you know, would need to submit a bioequivalence IND. And that is if the study includes a radioactive product, if it includes a cytotoxin, toxic drug product, or if the study has a product in it, and it could be the drug, it could be some other product that is being given above the dose that is recommended on the labeling. And when you submit those bioINDs, like I said, we do the clinical safety review in addition to the multiple other colleagues we have at the FDA that do reviews of bioINDs. And from our perspective, we can issue a clinical hold, which basically stops the study and does not let it continue um, or does not let it begin if it hasn't begun yet. Or we can give you non-held comments. These are helpful suggestions on kind of how to improve the safety or study design. There are four reasons from a clinical safety perspective that we can put that BioIND on clinical hold. So the first is if human subjects are going to be exposed to an unreasonable or significant risk. That's actually the most common one. That's the main reason in this day and age that we tend to put um, studies, uh, bioINDs, on clinical hold. The other three... Yeah, you can pretty, you know, are fairly easily avoided with some due diligence. So, uh, one is if the clinical investigators are not qualified to conduct the bioIND. That's rarely the case, but what happens more often is people just forget to submit the CVs of those investigators showing that they are qualified to do that. So that one can be avoided for the most part by submitting a, an appropriate CV showing that the investigators are qualified. Number three is that the investigator brochure is misleading, erroneous, or incomplete. 
Again, submitting a complete accurate investigator's brochure, boom, knock that one out. And then the fourth one is that if the bio IND doesn't contain sufficient information uh, to demonstrate the or to assess the risks of safety to the subjects, and again, submit a complete study protocol. So if you submit those three things, you know, a clinical investigator CV showing they're qualified, a complete and accurate investigator's brochure, and a study protocol, that's really going to narrow this mostly down to the main reason we put studies on clinical hold is uh, significant risk or injury to the subjects. So <clears throat> we took bio INDs that have been reviewed over about 18 months and looked at all of the comments that we gave back to the applicants or sponsors and categorized them into kind of main class categories to see where we are having most of our um, comments and, and critiques on these bio INDs. And this is a, a lovely pie chart, even though in my PhD they told us never to use a pie chart. Uh, I am a rebel. So um, as you can see, this little, little like wedge that's like 8% for application completeness, we already talked about that. That's where you submit the you know investigators brochure, the complete protocol, the um, the investigator CVs. Boom, taken care of that one. Then you know that biggest wedge there in red is selection of subjects, and that's where really where we have the most comments going back to the applicants. And so I'm just going to walk right around that pie circle, and we're going to talk about each one of these topics and give some specific tips on how to improve submissions. So. Study design and protocol tips. <clears throat> You're gonna hear me repeat this over and over again with every slide. My first two points are going to be look at the PSG and look at the RLD label. So the FDA issues these product specific guidances uh, for generic drug development. They are not mandatory, they are guidances, and you can absolutely use an alternative approach, but I would suggest you to give adequate justification. But these are our best thoughts on how, on how to complete these studies, and so um, they bear to, to look at and consider. Um, and then the next is to look at the RLD labeling. That's what we consider too. It really highlights some of the safety issues that are gonna be occurring with this drug. So, subject selections. Shockingly, I'm gonna say, Follow the PSG. Who would have expected that? Um, so, but the PSG is going to give you tips on study design. Um, it will let you know, um, you know, maybe this is recommended more in patients versus healthy subjects. The RLD labeling is going to let you know who should not be receiving this drug, who has contraindications to it, what are some potential drug interactions. So, you know, if a drug is contraindicated to be given to patients with thyroid disease in the subject selection. You know, we as reviewers are going to be looking, make sure patients with thyroid disease are not, you know, are excluded from that population so that we know that we're keeping them safe. Something that I see a lot of is that, you know, uh, protocols will say that they are enrolling healthy subjects with normal vital signs or with clinically insignificant. That is very vague. It is hard for me as a physician to know what you mean by a clinically insignificant vital sign. And so who's ever enrolling your patients is going to have a hard time too. So that's why we really recommend giving specific parameters. Instead of, you know, normal vital signs, say, you know, normal vital signs and this is what we consider normal. And the same with lab values. You know, with normal laboratory values, okay, just give us our, your normal that laboratory value so we know what you're talking about. Um, if a drug is contraindicated, say in people with liver disease, then again, I will look to the inclusion exclusion criteria to make sure that you're only enrolling people with normal liver function. And normal liver function means normal liver function within the range of normal liver function that you gave me, not 5% above that or clinically insignificant, you know, liver values. Study drug administration. Again, the PSG will give you the kind of recommended dose. Um, <clears throat> sometimes they will comment on timing. Uh, in terms of the um, RLD labeling, they'll also give instructions. If the RLD labeling goes into detail on how a drug should be prepared, you know, dilute it like this and infuse it over this time with or without a filter, I would expect that also to be in protocol so that the um, so that we know that the subjects in the study are getting the drug the way that it is recommended to be administered when it is given in patients. Um, <clears throat> also, you know, if a drug can cause 
uh, anaphylaxis or some sort of severe allergic reaction, it's important for us to know from a patient safety perspective, how are you, how are you assessing for that? How are you checking those patients? How often are those subjects? How often are you checking them? Do you have a code card available? Do you have epinephrine available? How are you going to be identifying and monitoring these subjects for anaphylaxis? And then um, the last thing I'll say is that if you are enrolling patients, patients that are taking this drug for a disease, then for their safety and for their treatment of their disease, they need to stay on their regular treatment schedule. And that treatment schedule should not be changed because of the study. So sometimes we'll see, you know, a drug dose may be delayed for administrative reasons. Well, that's really interfering with the patient's treatment. If the patient needs to stop treatment because of some adverse event, you know, that's very different rather than just for the study. All right, safety monitoring. Again, look at the PSG recommendations, look at the RLD labeling that will give you a lot of information about the types of adverse reactions that need to be monitored. Again, define what is a normal vital sign range, define what is a acceptable laboratory range. Um, and then consider the timing and the frequency of how you might do that laboratory testing or vital signs or EKGs, et cetera, whatever you're using to monitor these subjects. So if a drug can cause neutropenia about a week after giving it, checking the white blood cell count the next day isn't going to detect that adverse event. That's not going to help protect the subject's safety. You need to check for the neutropenia a week after and whether that's having them come back for another study visit or combining it with another blood draw. Um, but the timing of it needs to make sense in the context of the adverse reaction that you're looking for. Um, same will be, you know, if a drug can cause liver injury, um, you know, then it would make sense to check and make sure that the patient does not have liver injury before continuing to give them additional multiple doses of that. And the one, the one safety monitoring timing that I, that I see actually the most is that, um, so for drugs with embryophetotoxicity, um, you know, people are testing for pregnancy before each dose. That's great, wonderful, spot on. But also just remember to check for pregnancy at the end of the study just so that we can, you know, record any sort of adverse events and discuss briefly how you plan to follow that up. All right, subject withdrawal. If a subject develops a contraindication to the drug during the study, maybe that's an allergic reaction, maybe that's a kidney injury, something like that, then they should not be receiving further doses to it. So if they develop a contraindication, that needs to be listed in the subject withdrawal criteria so we know that those subjects will be safely withdrawn and not additionally dosed with the medication. Adverse event reporting. This is actually usually done pretty well. There's a really nice guidance for industry um, that the FDA put out that talks about safety assessments. The one point in here that I do kind of notice is there are specific um, adverse, sorry, specific adverse event reporting for bio INDs. Um, they're, that if they're going to be uh, submitted for marketing for the FDA that you need to report those to the FDA and so and with a timeline. So if there is a serious and unexpected suspected adverse reaction that needs to be reported to the FDA within 15 calendar days and if there is an unexpected fatal or life-threatening suspected adverse reaction that needs to be reported to the FDA within seven days um, and just make sure that that is also included in your adverse event reporting. Informed consent. Um, again, the FDA has some nice guidance here on, on informed consent guidelines. You know, the main thing is just making sure that the informed consent is clear and understandable. If you tell a patient that they could have hepatic toxicity, they probably are going to have no idea what you're talking about, you know, stating as, you know, you could have damage to the liver or liver injury, you know, in a way that is understandable to the subjects. Uh, make sure to fully inform the subjects about the study risks. Uh, one tip there is if the if the label has a medication guide on it, that can be tacked on to an informed consent and that will walk through at least some of the safety risks related to the drug uh, in a way that patients can under, or subjects can understand. Uh, and then also, you know, if you already have a study event table in the protocol, that is something that could be added to a uh, informed consent as well in order to help and in fully inform the subjects about the study events. And uh, my last point here is just if there are specific study restrictions that the subjects need to know about, put that in the informed consent. That way they have been clearly informed of them and we know they've been clearly informed of them. The most common one there would be contraception. If they're required to use contraception during the study and for four months afterwards, 
just make sure that's clearly spelled out in the informed consent so that that is highlighted for the subjects and they know about that. Everything I've said before is about uh, BioIND submissions, mostly about new submissions, but for BioIND amendments, just a touch base there. If you are amending the BioIND, uh, just include a track changes protocol and ideally it would be very nice uh, to have like a little table with the differences between the submitted, per the new submitted protocol and the current study protocol. That just highlights for us what the changes are, the rationale for the changes and really helps us kind of understand uh, the thought process and ensure that there is no change to patient safety with this new amended protocol. So this is that big highlighted resources page I promised at the very beginning. Here's a list of a whole bunch of resources. Um, I have those um, FDA uh, guidances that talk about informed consent, that talk about um, adverse event reporting. There's uh, information here about um, how, when to submit a BioIND uh, or exceptions for a BioIND submission and a reference actually to a presentation here two years ago that was really great that kind of walked through the you know submission of, of INDs and when to submit it. All right, challenge question. Uh, which of the following statements about BioINDs is not true? Um, I will just let you read through these for a second. And in the interest of time, because Dr. Ferrugi told me that if I went over my time, I have to bake her a cake. And I don't have time today to bake a cake for her. So <laughs> you're going to lose your cake. Um, I'm going to jump. The answer here is uh, bioequivalent study and healthy subjects absolutely needs to consider the RLDs, labels, warnings, and precautions. That's how we, you know, that's how you're going to make sure to that these subjects are not having, you know, significant adverse events and that they are staying safe for this study. So in summary, the FDA has multiple resources to help you with these BioIND submissions. I strongly encourage you to come back to this presentation online and go to that resources page to find a large number of them. And just again, refer to the RLD label and to the PSG when you're designing your BioIND studies. And with that, and 30 seconds over, and a cake I have to make later, I pass stuff over to Dr. Ferrugi. Thank you, Dr. Yes, for the nice introduction. Um, and to continue on with the clinical theme, my name is Shabnam Frugi. I am a clinical reviewer with the Division of Clinical Review within the Office of Safety and Clinical Evaluation. And today I will focus on comparative analysis update. My learning objectives are to review the comparative analysis process, to provide key principles for conducting comparative analyses, and to discuss tips for user interface assessment during product development. Generic drugs are considered to be therapeutically equivalent to the reference drug if they have the same clinical effect and safety profile when administered to the patients under the conditions specified in the labeling. The same expectations are applicable for the generic drug device combination products, and FDA considers whether end users can use a generic combination product when it is substituted for the RLD without the intervention of the healthcare professional or without additional training prior to the use of the generic product. That being said, generic and RLD products do not need to be identical as long as the differences do not preclude approval under an ANDA. The comparative use interface assessment process is a cross-office collaborative CEDAR process. Our groups work together on comparative analysis and comparative use human factor studies throughout the ANDA life cycle. Note that the guidances for comparative analyses apply to different stages of the life cycle. They apply in the pre-ANDA and ANDA submissions, but also in the submission of post-approval changes and supplements. Within the DCR, we are the lead for ANDA submission and post-approval CA assessments of combination products to ensure they have the same clinical effect and safety profile as their RLD. This, this slide provides an overview of the types of combination products that were submitted in ANDA to OGD. And just like Dr. Dugas, I have a pie chart as well, and my chart represents the CA assessments done by DCR from 2018 to 2023. And as you can tell from the pie chart, injectable and oral products make up over two thirds of the combination products submitted under the ANDAs. 
So the graph guidance for industry published in 2017 provides the current recommended approach to comparative analysis in an ANDA. And I will go over the three comparisons in the next few slides, which are the physical comparison, the comparative task analysis, and the labeling comparison. Within each comparison, consider and include all components with which end users interact. Before going any further, let's review some key definitions. User interface, that refers to all components of the product with which a user interacts. This includes the delivery device constituent part and any associated controls, displays, product labeling, and even packaging. A critical task is a user task that if it performed incorrectly or not performed at all, would or could cause harm to the patient or the user, where harm is also defined to include compromised care. Ultimately, an external critical design attribute is a feature that directly affects how users perform a critical task that is necessary to use or administer the drug product. Let's just start with the physical comparison. In your submission, please include clear, detailed, and color photographs. And according to draft guidance for industry, in your comparison, you should consider the visual, the auditory, the tactile examination of the physical features of the proposed generic to the RLD, such as the size, the shape, the color, the resistance, and even the sound. Include all components necessary to deliver the drug, from packaging to the connectors, and external design mechanisms and features should also be noted. Ultimately, please clear, clearly identify, characterize, and provide justifications for the differences noted. For the comparative task analysis, we recommend that you physically manipulate the device and systematically analyze and compare the sequential activities required for the end users to use the generic drug product and administer the drug product. Be sure to include all the steps with which end users need to perform to use the device from opening the packaging to disposing of the product and highlight the differences in tasks that arise due to differences in user interface design. Be sure to note if those differences may impact an existing critical task or even give rise to a new critical task. For the labeling comparison, use the current version of the RLD labeling. Ensure that labeling, including IFU, and images accurately describe your proposed generic combination product. Make sure that all the tasks necessary to use the generic combination product is also identified. Generic drug product labeling generally must be the same as the RLD. However, certain limited exceptions are allowed, and those will be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Be sure to evaluate labeling statements on the container label and even carton labeling. These may include important elements that are intended to minimize medication errors or use errors. IFU differences may also reflect differences seen in comparative task analysis. According to the draft guidance for industry, for each comparison, you select an outcome, and those outcomes are no difference, minor design difference, and an other design difference. All identified differences should be considered, again, within the context of the overall risk profile of the product. If you choose the outcome of no difference, please provide explanation in the comparative analyses to support your assertion that there are truly no differences in the design of your proposed user interface as compared to the user interface of the RLD. A minor design difference, on the other hand, will not affect an external critical design attribute. For instance, the different color of the plunger rod for a pre-filled syringe and also knowing that the color of the plunger rod is not critical to the correct use of the device. If FDA agrees that the design differences is a minor design difference, then it would likely be acceptable. On the other hand, an other design difference is one that may impact an external critical design attribute that involves administration of the product. When you have other design differences, consider redesigning the user interface to minimize differences from the RLD or provide additional data to support the user interface design difference. The type of information and data will depend on the differences and risks to be considered. 
With appropriate outcome classification and justification, it is reassuring to know that most efficiencies are communicated and resolved within the review cycle. Indeed, between 2018 and 2023, 90% of the CA assessments that were done by DCR were found to be adequate, and only 10% of them had another design differences that were inadequate. Now let's go over some general recommendations. Identify and provide adequate justification for all the differences in the user interface in your comparative analysis. Focus on potential differences in the critical tasks between the RLD and your generic drug product combination. Always consider the context of use. Let's go over the context of use. For instance, a drug may be intended for an emergency use versus non-emergency use. The frequency of use is also important. Is it intended for single use or repeated use by the end users? The end users may be your lay users who have no experience with the drug. That may be a patient or a caregiver versus an experienced healthcare professional. Ultimately, also consider the environment of use. Is this drug going to be used in a non-clinical setting, such as homes and schools, or in a healthcare setting, such as inpatient hospitals or outpatient clinics? Ultimately, always consider your patient populations, those who suffer from dexterity issues, from a rheumatologic or a neuromuscular disorder. To continue with the tips for your comparative analysis, Know that design differences are product specific and must be analyzed within the context of their comparison to their RLD. If the RLD is discontinued and or unavailable, we highly recommend submitting a controlled correspondence or a pre and a meeting request to discuss the alternative approach with the agency. Use the to be marketed generic information product in your comparative analysis. Engage with FDA early during your product development via controlled correspondences and pre enda processes. Submit your comparative analyses, the samples of your products, and specific questions in pre enda communications request. And if you identify other design differences, we again highly recommend discussing that early with us. Incorporate recommendations in the draft comparative analysis guidance throughout your combination product and we're able to design the generic product to minimize differences in user interface and critical tasks as compared to its RLD. Perform your comparative analysis throughout the development program, especially if changes are made. Let's talk about the changes. Generally, when there are changes to your proposed product after approval, these are submitted as a post-approval changes and supplements. Again, DCR is the lead for the assessment of of the comparative analysis submitted with post-approval changes and supplements. A change may be a change that's applicable to the device constituent part. For instance, if a new oral dosing syringe is needed to replace the approved dropper, or a change from a single-use vial to a pre-filled syringe, or a change of the color of the dust cap of the inhalation device to match the RLD. Some of those changes may also apply to the labeling. To revise the graphics, and the text of the instructions for use to be consistent with the RLD updates or to represent the revised needle shield without other device changes. In all those situations, submit a CA report with supplements reflecting changes to the device and device-related labeling and mention the CA report in your cover letter or submit it in module five, which is the preferred module for the submission of those CAs and compare the updated drug device combination back to the RLD. Again, when in doubt, submit a CA report with changes and consider a controlled correspondence with us. Now time for a challenge question number two, true or false. The physical comparison includes visual, auditory, tactile examination of the physical features of the proposed product compared to the RLD. Of course, the answer is true. So to summarize, please refer to the draft comparative analysis guidance for all the recommendations. Again, note that all design differences should be identified, adequately analyzed, and scientifically justified, and ultimately engage with us early during your combination product development. Thank you very much. This sums up for me. I will be back for the uh, Q&A um, answer. Thank you very much for your attention.
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jimena Dancy. I'm a pharmacologist in the Division of Pharmacology Toxicology Review within the Office of Generic Drugs. And today I will be presenting successful practices for pharmacology toxicology justifications in ANDAS. This is my disclaimer. Here's a brief outline of my talk. First, I'll present the learning objectives, introduce you to PharmTox review in the Office of Generic Drugs, I'll provide you with some common issues and deficiencies that our division encounters, and provide you with uh, some best practices and resources for submitting farm tax justifications. Here's the learning objectives we're gonna cover today. I will come back to this slide throughout the presentation, but the first one we will go over is understanding the role of farm tax review in OGD. Before I go into details, I would like to provide you with a brief overview of the role of the Division of Pharmacology Toxicology Review, or DPTR, in the safety assessment of generic drug products. We conduct safety evaluations on excipients and impurities in generic drug products on a consult basis. And we conduct our reviews within the context of the ANDAs we're consulted on, so we take into consideration the dose, duration of exposure, patient population, and route of administration. Uh, our goal is to determine that the generic drug, profi uh, generic drug product has the same safety profile as its uh, RLD. And uh, DPTR is involved at various stages in the life cycle of the generic drug product. In the development uh, phase, we participate in pre up product development meetings and work on control correspondences. In the pre-marketing phase, we review drug master files or DMFs, ANDAs, and control correspondences. And in the post-marketing phase, we review ANDA supplements and health hazard evaluations, and occasionally we uh, review citizen petitions and media content. So what does PharmTox and OGD do? Uh, we review the safety of generic drug formulations where their safety profile may differ from the RLD, and um, these differences may be in the form of impurities, excipients, residual solvents, and contaminants from the container closure system. Uh, DMF holders and ANDA applicants submit toxicology data to support specification limits when these limits exceed allowable safety thresholds. And these um, justifications may, be in, uh, may fall under three main categories. The first one is written justifications, for example, collections of published information or written expert opinion. The second category is in silico prediction. Um, these are mainly uh, in the form of quantitative structure activity relationship or QSAR predictions to determine bacterial mutagenicity. And then lastly, in vitro and in vivo studies, and these are generally to um, qualify genotoxicity or general toxicity through repeated dose toxicity studies. Next, I will present you with some farm tox safety assessment challenges. <clears throat> And the first topic we will cover are impurity review in generics. Um, and impurities are any component of the drug substance or drug product that is not the drug substance itself or an excipient of the formulation. Now please note that generic drug formulations may have different impurity profiles as compared to the RLD. And these may be in the form, um, I mean drug substance or drug product related impurities. Uh, elemental impurities, residual solvents, and extractables and leachables may arise during the manufacture uh, and or storage of the API or final drug product, which is illustrated in the diagram below. And uh, DPTR evaluates the safety of impurities when their specifications exceed the safety thresholds that I mentioned in the previous slide, and I will um, go into more detail on these thresholds um, in, the in the coming slides. And there are different approaches that an applicant may take to qualify an impurity that exceeds these allowable safety thresholds. One is a comparative impurity analysis with the RLD to show impurity levels are similar between the two products. Or submit toxicology data to qualify the general safety of the impurity. This can be via genetic toxicity assays to determine back, uh, mutagenicity potential or general toxicity studies. And also, an, an applicant may qualify an impurity as a metabolite. So now I'll describe some common issues or deficiencies that are division issues for impurity, um, just an, an impurity review. One is the use of in silico methods to uh, uh, qualify the general safety um, of the impurity. 
In silico methods are only adequate for bacterial mutagenicity via QSAR. Uh, in silico methods are not validated for the general endpoints of general toxicity. And additionally, using a read across approach for the surrogate compound is not an adequate ap approach, meaning using toxicity of a similarly or structure compound to justify the safety of a target compound is not an adequate approach. Also, I mentioned that an applicant may try and qualify an impurity as a metabolite, and this is because ICH Q3A and Q3B state that impurities and degradants that are also significant metabolites detected in animal or human studies are generally considered qualified. However, we have seen scenarios where an applicant may uh, submit published information stating that uh, an impurity is detected in animal or human urine, but there's no quantitative exposure to that, um, to that impurity as a metabolite. Or there's quantitative systemic exposure, but the limit, the level is not sufficiently high, meaning, meaning that it's lower than the proposed clinical exposure to the impurity. And then a third pitfall is irrelevant justification, like I mentioned, submitting data for a surrogate. And then another deficiency that we issue sometimes is when an applicant submits proprietary data. Uh, proprietary data cannot be used to justify impurity limits without permission from the owner of that data. The next review type we will cover are extractables and leachables, or ENLs. ENL studies identify compounds that are extracted or may leach from the container closure system, or CCS. And PharmTux reviews safety of ENLs above safety thresholds, like the threshold of toxicological concern, or TTC, or the safety concern threshold, or SET, both of which are thresholds below which a compound may pose negligible risk of carcinogenicity or other toxic effects. Again, there are different approaches to qualify an ENL. One is to demonstrate that uh, extractables are not present in a leachable study. So extractables are also what we call potential leachables. An extractable assessment is conducting using extraction solvents on materials or packaging or uh, container closure systems, so filters, tubes, caps, et cetera. And a leachable assessment is performed using actual drug product um, or a solvent that mimics that drug product. Another approach is to demonstrate that ENLs are below the safety concern threshold that I mentioned. Submitting genetic toxicity assays to predict uh, mutagenicity or general toxicity studies for compounds exceeding these safety thresholds. Or using a surrogate molecule. So when uh, there's no co uh, compound specific tox information available, an applicant may use uh, a surrogate approach uh, as well as quantitative structure activity relationship predictions. Now here's some common deficiencies we issue with ENL reviews. One is inappropriate an, uh, calculation of the analytical evaluation threshold, or AET. Uh, and this is a threshold above which uh, a compound has to be identified, quantified, and reported for uh, potential toxicity assessment. Another is when all compounds above the AET or SET are not properly identified, meaning that a compound name is provided without a structure or vice versa. Classifying uh, ENLs by the Kramer classification method in lieu of submitting a safety assessment is not acceptable. This is because the, uh, the Kramer decision tree right, classifies compounds into one of three classes of uh, low, moderate, or high probability of toxicity it, with using structural elements. And I mentioned that using a surrogate, a, a surrogate approach may be used for safety assessment of ENLs when compound-specific tox information is not available. But in order to determine if a surrogate is appropriate for an ENL, the ENL in question has to be uh, adequately identified. Next, we will cover excipient reviews in generics. So excipients are ingredients of the formulation that are added to enhance the performance of the drug product but do not exert therapeutic effect. Again, when conducting our reviews, the goal is to ensure that the proposed generic has the same safety profile as the RLD when used according to the labeling. Um, our initial assessment includes comparison with approved levels with, um, in similar context of use using the IID. Now, if these comparisons cannot justify the proposed use of the excipient, additional assessment is conducted by DPTR on a consult basis. 
there are different approaches to excipient qualification. One is using or leveraging uh, levels and products with the same excipient in similar context of use. Um, submitting farm tox data to inform the safety for the route dose and duration of the proposed generic product. And also taking into consideration specific patient populations like pediatric patients. So now we'll discuss some common deficiencies with excipient review. One is referencing the IID for excipient use under a different context of use. Another is referencing an unspecified grade of an excipient in the IID for a specified grade of an excipient in the formulation. In such uh, cases, a bridging approach may be used uh, with similar grades of an excipient. Now, um, when there's alternate routes of administration, uh, alternate um, submitting, not submitting information to qualify the local or systemic safety for those alternate routes like ophthalmic, rectal, buccal, sublingual, dermal, et cetera, may lead to deficiencies. And then along those same lines, not submitting information uh, for sensitive populations like pediatric patients, particularly newborns and young infants that may have immature metabolism, or patients with conditions that need dosage adjustments like patients with renal or hepatic impairment. Now I'll go over some overall challenges that we, um, that we see during our farm talks um, evaluations. One is issues with data integrity. For example, suspicious data patterns like data repetition or biologically implausible data. Um, claims of GLP compliance, meaning that there's a GLP, GLP compliance statement, but when we review the study, we realize it's not really GLP compliant. Another one we've seen is the same data reported for different studies or even the same data reported between different species. We've also had instances of false negative results. These are um, primarily in in vitro studies done to detect bacterial mutagenicity. Sometimes FDA has data to support a positive result, but the applicant or firm submits the negative results, which may raise some questions about data um, study integrity. Another challenge we see sometimes is missing information in data reports, like missing data, uh, incomplete methods or results, unsigned quality assurance documents or pathology reports. I've mentioned that uh, submitting literature references may uh, serve as a, a, a justification for general toxicity. However, something that we see sometimes is not submitting the full article or the full reference, um, and that can be advantageous in ensuring that that's an acceptable approach. Uh, missing quantitative data for metabolite levels in plasma of animals uh, or humans. The applicant must uh, demonstrate that quantitative um, exposure of the uh, metabolite and that it, it, um, it qualifies the impurity levels. Again, referencing proprietary data under another application without right of reference is not an acceptable approach. And lastly, misunderstanding the major versus minor amendment. It's important to know that safety justifications are generally defined as major, and data submitted within the cycle that requires a, a farm talks consult may extend your goal date. Uh, next, I'll explain some best, best practices for successful farm tax justifications. I mentioned that a major pitfall is not evaluating the uh, impurity, ENL, or excipient within the context of use of your drug product. And I'll describe some best practices for the three review types that I covered, impurities, ENLs, and excipients, but some of these apply to all. So for impurities, conduct comparative impurity analysis with the RLD and then also controlling the impurities at limits that support that analysis. Now, if impurity specifications exceed the threshold of toxicological concern, or TTC, which is an estimate of safe exposure for any mutagenic compound, then a mutagenicity assessment is necessary. And this can be in the form of a QSOR analysis using appropriate models. And if the impurity is predicted to be negative for bacterial mutagenicity, then it can be controlled at QT uh, per ICH uh, Q3B and Q3A. And if the impurity limits exceeds the QT, then general toxicity needs to be addressed. And again, this can be in the form of full literature references and full study reports to justify the safety of a proposed higher level. 
And also, when the applicant is conducting their own general toxicity study, it's imperative that they consider the context of use. For metabolites, I, I'll reiterate the best practice is to submit that quantitative information of the metabolite levels in plasma of either animals or humans. For ENLs, I mentioned uh, a surrogate approach may be used uh, for a compounds that there's not that compound-specific tox information. And also uh, know that structurally similar ENLs can be grouped together in safety assessment with appropriate justification and identification of the individual extractables and leachables. This can be with a name, structure, and cast number, and any other relevant information. For excipients, comparison with the RLD, comparison with approved levels for proposed route using the ID, and uh, submitting literature data to justify the safety of the proposed level of the intended, with the, for the intended context of use of your drug product. And next, I will finalize my talk by providing you with some avenues to get advice from OGD. And one is control correspondences, which are a great resource, and there are several um, inquiries that we can address with the control correspondence. One is related to the inactive ingredients of a formulation, request for Q1, Q2 formulation assessment, determination of the maximum daily dose, determination of thresholds for ENL studies like calculation of AET and SCT, questions pertaining to ICHM7, so treatment direction of the drug product, acceptable intake for mutagenic impurities, and whether or not the drug product is ex excluded from ICHM7 and falls within another scope like ICHS9 for products with uh, advanced cancer indications. Some aspects of acceptable intakes for nitrosamines and input on a proposed non-clinical study design. It's also important to note that there are limitations to what can be addressed in a control correspondence. Although we can provide input on a non-clinical study design, a control correspondence is not intended to conduct a full study review, and therefore a safety call is not uh, addressed in a CC. Here are some links to the resources um, that I covered during my talk, as well as links to DPTR's prior SBIA generic drug forum presentations, which also highlight some of the topics I um, discussed today. And now I will conclude my talk with uh, two challenge questions. The first one is, which one of the following is not an acceptable approach to assess general toxicity of an impurity that exceeds QT? Perform comparative impurity analysis with the RLD, use a read-across approach with a surrogate compound, cite published uh, scientific studies demonstrating the impurity is a metabolite of the drug in vivo at levels that exceed the proposed maximum exposure, or D, perform a repeated dose toxicity study in rats, taking into consideration context of use. Anyone? Yes, it's B, use a read-across approach for the surrogate compound. I mentioned that that is an acceptable approach for an ENL, but not for an impurity. Challenge question two, OGD farm, uh, farm talks does not address which of the following inquiries in a control correspondence. A, questions pertaining to ICHM7. B, questions regarding a protocol of a proposed non-clinical study. C, determination of the AET and or SCT for extractables and leachables or D, review of genetic toxicology study report to characterize xenotoxicity prior to ANDA review? D, again, a control correspondence may address or provide input on a non-clinical study design, but it does not review the study itself. And with that, I'd like to thank you, and I look forward to answering any questions during the panel discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much to all our experts on um, previous session. We invite all of our panelists to come up and have a seat, please. And we will start in-house like we did yesterday. We will start um, at the mics. If uh, there are no questions in-house, we will go and take as many as we can from the online repository that we have. All right, which one came first? Okay. On the far side, please. Question in-house. Yes, hi. My question is for uh, Dr. Bai. Um, 
when you were presenting Gadusa BE, I think that was terrific. It's great. And it's going to provide a uniform approach. My question is, um, how closely integrated is that with the current PSGs as they were formed over to say the past 20, 25 years? And is the data that is going to be taken from the from the GSD from that system database is it actually integrated with how those were formed today and in the past 15 years? So my concern would be, my concern would be that the threshold of burden to obtain approval for an ANDA is higher than the threshold that the NDA had from 10 or 15 years ago. So is that true or is there a mechanism in place to make sure that that, that doesn't happen? So first, um, thank you for the question, and I'm very proud that you can pronounce Gadessa BE right. <laughs> um, and second, I, I'm trying to understand what you're trying to alluding to. Um, so I think you're referring to the legacy data. Yeah. So the mm -hmm. data, right? Right. That is used to form the, the PSG, presumably, right? How is the current data in the system? Are we using new data from the literature to form PSGs? modern day PSGs that might not have been needed by the NDA board itself. For example, IVPT testing was not something performed earlier by the NDA boards, right? So now it's a requirement, right? Which is fine, it makes sense, right? But how much of that is going to be newer data, right? Uh -huh. Sometimes the NDA board if the NDA holder did not have to perform some of those tests and have some of that data, because you can see this by reviewing the SBOAs, that the data did not exist in some cases, right? So, and they might be discontinued, right? So there's no way to even get their product to determine what, if it's similar. So unless you use the, obviously use the RS, the current RS, but are there data, is there data that's needed today that was not, you know, didn't exist before? So in other words, you, you're gonna need to, to get approval, you're gonna have to meet the PSG requirements, but the NDA holder themselves did not meet those requirements. So in other words, the, the threshold is higher now for the generic to get approval. Am I? Am I... Um, I wouldn't say the threshold is higher. By the way, my answer probably is not going to be fully addressing your question because GDESA uh, or GDESA BE is actually a generic drug structure assessment tool for bioequivalence reviewers. And for PSD that you're alluding to, that's another office, right, ORS. And currently, ORS is not using GDESA system for their PSG development yet. But uh, you're right, and we are trying to incorporate some of the legacy data in our GDESA B system to inform our bioequivalence assessors to make an uh, informed decision. But that data is based on the bioequivalence assessments in the past years, right? Like the deficiency language that I was alluding to in my talk, and also any critical decision-making process during the past years about equivalence assessments. Of course, um, for those discussions, ORS or PSG develop, development offices, they are also involved in those discussions too. So um, I wouldn't specifically address, you know, how this uh, GDESA BE tool will help, uh, you know, ORS offices in terms of the PSG development, development um, because that, that's a future state, if there is. <laughs> I, hope that, I hope that answers some level of your questions. Thank you, thank you for the question. Again, I'm so proud that you can pronounce the a BE tool right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question here, please. Yeah, uh, this question is uh, for Ang on the pediatric excipient levels. Uh, is the agency going to provide us a resource uh, to know what are the acceptable levels for pediatric use for the excipients, like providing an additional column in the IAD database? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I think, um, as I mentioned in my slides, at this very moment, there's no extra column in the IAD specifically designed for um, the levels approved for different age groups in pediatric population. Um, I cannot give you like a, a conclusion or a, you know a foreseen 
date that when this data will be or if it's, it will be uh, added to the ID at all. But uh, I can only say at this very moment, if there's any question or um, proposal or concern about the safety uh, for a specific excipient used in the test formulation, then uh, the applicant is more than welcome to send a control correspondence uh, to uh, uh, confirm with the agency before the end was submitted. So that's my question, uh, th my answer to your question. Hopefully it helps a little. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I have, can I ask? Uh, let's, let's go to online, please. Online? First question for either Tao or Yang. Is excipient level critical in the drug approval process? Uh, are, are you saying if excipient level is critical for ENDA approval? Uh, is excipient level critical in the drug approval process? So, it, it, uh, you know, I, I, Tao can probably chime in later, but uh, to me, um, uh, the acceptability of a proposed excipient level, it is a critical aspect during our end of review. So the, the excipient level, as I said, it needs to be demonstrated to not affecting the efficacy or the safety of the uh, test product or, or generic product comparing to the ROD. So yes, I would say that is a critical aspect in our end of review. And Tao, if you can. Sure, I, I would say everything that we require you to submit is critical. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, uh, if you have any additional questions, then please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, this question is uh, to Tao only. Uh, it's, it's great to know about the Gadesha B tool. Uh, is this going to affect us the way we are submitting the data in future uh, to the on the BE data? Sorry, say that again. It will. So is there any effect on us the way we are presenting the data, bioclins data in the application? Uh, this Gadesha B tool is going to affect us uh, the, uh, on the way we present the data to the division. Right, you, you, you get that, <laughs> you get that point. And I only mentioned once in one of my slides, really, um, that is the structured data submission, right, from the end applicants. You're right, in the future, um, we are uh, planning to have structured data submission, but right now it is currently under development for the requirements. So more details will be released later. Like we are presenting currently, you know, structured product labeling now. So labeling is a structured one already now. The exactly, same, same exactly. Kadesa is the generic drug structure assessment for the entire generic drug program. And labeling is actually the first stage. And BE is the second stage. You're gonna hear more and more uh, programs, you know, releases in Kadesa BE, in Kadesa, sorry. Uh, there'll be safety, filing, you know, later on in future days. So you're right, labeling is already in structure stage. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the far uh, mic, please. Good morning, all. My question was... You need to stand close up, please, so we can hear you. Also, the people online. Yeah. yeah. Good morning, all. My question was similar to previous uh, questionnaire for Speaker Tao regarding the Gadesa labeling. So I'm going to switch my question to, like, uh, Speaker uh, Yang for <laughs> history. So we saw that uh, all of the innovations and discoveries happened only after the tragedies, like innovations followed by the tragedies, Be, being it uh, thalidomide tragedy, uh, being it uh, Tylenol tragedy and everything. So do you think uh, FDA is providing any preventive measures at the back end? to uh, streamline or cut the future tragedies to be happened? <laughs> so this is a little bit history talk. Um, so about the, the, the example, the tragedy, the uh, 1937 tragedy I was talking about in my presentation, uh, I was not in the right position, I believe. I, I'm not in the right position to judge. What is the best approach? Uh, I can only say, um, as you can see, um, the tragedy occurs in the autumn in 1937, uh, and the law was passed in 1938. So only after one year, um, at that time, I, I don't think it's the Congress actually made a very, very um, fast move. Uh, actually, after the incident was firstly reported, you know, thousands of inspectors were sent 
across the country to collect data, to, to visit patients, to visit victims, and, and try to gather as much information as possible to do that. So I, I, would, I would say this is uh, very, very unfortunate. As you mentioned, there are actually more than one tragedy in the history of drug development. But I can only say anything that we see that e either in the laws or in the guidances um, it is a little bit later or a little bit delayed comparing to what if, God forbid, what anything bad could happen. So we can only do um, either call that a corrective action or a preventive action after something bad happened. But I think the one thing that I do want to point out is, you know, a quick action is always needed, uh, especially for uh, uh, bigger issues like like what you mentioned and what I had uh, in my slide. So I, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but uh, I will only say uh, anything that um, the, either the FDA or the Congress pass as a law to prevent something bad or something similar bad happen uh, is always a little bit delayed. Uh, it cannot prevent any bad thing to happen in the future because we don't know what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, that's I think that's okay. my, my pro point of Thank view. Thank you for your answer. <laughs> so if I could add a little bit, I, I just want to say um, Gadesa B could be the tool, right? <laughs> Yeah, now with Gadesa B, we are able to make more consistent, informed decisions. So that could really help us prevent any future uh, tragedy to happen. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, as I understood the relation between the BE and labeling from Speaker Shrabnam's presentation, I had the similar question for that as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go online, please. Question for Yang. Does FDA have plans to add pediatric information to the IID? If yes, what time frame? And if an applicant can't find strong supporting information from the public domain, can they submit controlled correspondence to OGD for input? Yeah, thank you for the online question. I think that's very similar to the question I, I addressed before, uh, but let me just reiterate what I think is true. Um, at this moment, there's no uh, a specific timeline for adding additional pediatric IEG safety data into the ID. Uh, there might be additional data in the future, but unfortunately, I cannot give, and I'm not in the right position to give a, a clear timeline. Uh, but uh, in that question, that's right on the spot. If there's any question or any new proposal from the applicant side, um, always a good idea is to confirm with the agency uh, through a, a control correspondent. Um, there's one thing I didn't say in my previous addressing the question, similar question is um, because just be considerate that uh, the response time for a controlled correspondence is usually kind of fast turnaround. So it would be very helpful for we reviewers to review um, the safety acceptability for excipient if there's additional data, literature including, um, to be submitted alongside with the control correspondent that will kind of speed up or ex expedite the review cycle for a co a control correspondence for this kind of question. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the mic right here in front of me, please. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for all the presentations. My question is for Dr. Dancy. For an extractable impurity that has been detected above the AET, but has been identified and evaluated as safe, for example, it's well above or below the PDE at the amount detected, can the agency please confirm or clarify if that extractable still needs to be included in a leachable study? Yes, any extractable above the AET needs to be identified quantified uh, for us to determine whether or not it is further evaluation, right? And we, ha we have these safety thresholds on top of the AET to determine whether or not it um, um, it's potentially mutagenic or there's any other general toxicity. Okay, thank you. Thank you. At the mic at the far end, please. Step up closer, please. Yes. <clears throat> Good morning, and thank you all for your presentations. Very informative. Um, this is probably for Dr. Dancy, but whoever would like to answer, feel free. Uh, so if there's a general category for an excipient, um, I'm going to use the example of microcrystalline cellulose, but there's also specific ones for, for given grades, like uh, 102 or 202. Can the applicant justify using the general category in the IID if it has a higher limit for the 
<clears throat> with all the other things that it's the the right route of administration all of those things um specifically can we provide that justification do we need to do a cc um where here like the grade differences are related to particle size and bulk density but not related to, to something else yeah so i'll reiterate that if there's any question regarding the excipient like uh, a control correspondence as you know um, my colleagues have mentioned it's a great approach um, and then when it comes to um, your question, I mean, normally we're a consult-based um, division, right? So normally like OB will do their initial assessment. And then if there's any question, you know, if the, if the excipient cannot be justified based on the IID or approved products, then they'll con consult us regarding that specific grade and we'll conduct our, our evaluation. Um, and I also mentioned that during excipients, we do use a bridging approach a mm -hmm. lot of the time, but again, that that's, once it comes to us, we do have to um, conduct that general um, evaluation on the that, that specific grade. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Online question, please. Okay. Question for Shabna. How do we perform comparative analyses when the RLD is discontinued or unavailable? Um, hi, um, thank you for your question. Um, Indeed, when the RLD is unavailable or discontinued, we recommend that you reach out to us. And there are two venues to do that. There is a venue of controlled correspondences, and there's also the venue of FOIA. If they, for instance, the RLD is so old, that is um, hard to find. But we definitely recommend that you reach out to us and find a solution because the generic has to be compared to its RLD. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, In-house, first year. Yeah. I have a question regarding the bio and the procedural uh, related question. So we understand that once a bio ID is submitted, agency has up to 30 days to respond if there are any clinical hold comments. But once an applicant responds to the clinical hold comments, how long does agency take to uh, clear the uh, protocol? I mean, is it 30 days again or is it longer? I believe. I don't think that that 30 day hold is there for the clinical hold. I think that that 30 days is for the initial response. We try to expedite it as much as we can. Yeah, I think the guidance for INDs basically indicates that response to the clinical comments are also responded within 30 day time frame. But for bio IND, it's not very clear. Sorry, can you say that one more time? Uh, for the INDs that we submit for the NDAs and all, uh, the guidance states that even response to the clinical holds are responded within 30 days. But for bio IND, like, there's no such uh, clarity. I would have to verify that. Okay, thanks. Thank can you. Can I ask one more question? Go ahead. Uh, this is for Dr. Dancy. A very uh, helpful presentation on the extractable impurity limits and um, the other uh, parts that you covered. So it, you mentioned that for impurity limits, proprietary data for RLD cannot be uh, like referenced to uh, like you know justify the limits. But if the applicant carries the analysis and you know generates data with the RLD samples, would that still be considered proprietary information? I think that would be considered a co comparative impurity analysis, mm -hmm. right? So that that would not fall, I don't think, under proprietary data as long as you know the comp the comparative impurity analysis is conducted using uh, yeah. validated methods. And for that, we um, normally collaborate with OPQ to determine whether or not the comparative impurity analysis is uh, adequate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Question at the far mic, please. Okay, thank you for your presentation. And this question is more uh, to Dr. Liu, but maybe a little bit um, uh, with uh, Dr. Nancy also. Uh, so we are, we are uh, so it's very informative about that the excipients uh, level is uh, addressed to different populations, especially uh, pediatric. But there are cases during like generic development um, or that even to submission stage that the ROD have not like fully complete their assessment around pediatric or that it's uh, further extended by like new indication like uh, when will this um, uh, evaluation extend to a different population be triggered? Uh, like it was a, when there is a potential or effectively when that ROD have this uh, indication and or that will this may result in generic having a different population uh, or indication than the ROD on labeling? 
So let, let me make sure I get the question. You're, you're saying if um, a generic drug re referencing an ROD um, and the ROD label has not covered, for example, pediatric patient yet, but it may be expanded to that population, what, what should be evaluated during the generic? Is that, is that exactly, what? Exactly. Okay, so that, that's more relating to um, the, uh, the drug uh, label revising or uh, apparently additional data will be uh, needed. Um, so I, I would say if what uh, the, the current labeling, the current rank labeling is, uh, is specified um, that the drug is not indicated to pediatric patients when the ENDA is submitted, um, then um, the, at least at this, I think uh, it, at the OGD, the current practice, if the current uh, drug labeling does not specify pediatric use, uh, we will not concern about uh, the safety in pediatric. But if there's any um, you know, evidence or any record showing uh, the NDA drug or the innovator drug is actually considering uh, to be given to a pediatric patient down the road in the future, and, and we, we will take that into consider as well in the uh, in our end of review. But to, to your question, we, we you know pretty much stay with uh, the current ROD label. And just to clarify, is there any case that um, any chance that it will result in different population? Like maybe that um, the ROD will have this uh, extension to pediatric, but the generic do not have. You know, first of all, I, I would I would you know kind of ask you a question. You know, how how it was hypothesized that an ROD will be given to pediatric patients if the RLD label, current RLD label doesn't say so. Um, so as a generic drug um, company, um, that's actually really my question is, you know, we are, a the generic drug is trying to be pretty much uh, exactly the same as the RLD product, right? Mm -hmm. and, and one of the key important information or uh, the most important information will be gathered or specified in the current RLD label. Mm -hmm. um, so, what triggers that? Um, you know, we, we have the concern that this drug will be, like five years later, will be used in pediatric patient. That's um, so. The, the same thing for regulators, for for reviewers, we, we do the same thing. Uh, at this very moment, uh, when we're reviewing, it and uh, you know, we just follow what the ROD label is uh, talking about, especially for like uh, the target population. Uh, you know, I, I can uh, you know, hopefully this answer a little, but maybe. Um, others can chime in. Perhaps we can go to an online question, and um, you guys yeah. are here, and maybe you can get to the speakers for a lengthier explanation during the break. Okay. okay? Thank you. Uh, online question, please. Question for Andrea. A BE study that was previously submitted under a bio IND needs to be performed again with minor changes to the study protocol. Do I need to submit a bio IND amendment? Yeah, if you are going to change, um, if you are going to make changes to the protocol for that study, then a BioND amendment does need to be submitted. Thank you. Mike, uh, closer to me, please. Yeah, so thank you. Um, I don't have a question, but um, I'm Partha Roy, the Office Director for the Office of Bioequivalence. I just wanted to address uh, the okay, question Dr. Roy. which uh, <laughs> a gentleman has regarding the PSG and the uh, Gadesa BE. Um, I think there is no difference between what we are doing today. Um, and, and when we are using the GADESA, it's just a tool to make it, you know, the review ha you know, quicker. Um, also, uh, you know, accessing a lot of the databases that we have. We are trying to build the system so that we can get to those databases quickly. Uh, but the PSG, you know, the information that comes, and that's a regular process which is coming from our research or coming from NDA, coming from all of the ANDAs that we are reviewing. So. So there is, there is no change in that process. It's just we are trying to do it much faster, more optimized, and hopefully, you know, ultimately our responses will be more standardized. You find less consistent, you know, more consistent. Um, and also, you know, we're trying to, you know, probably prevent the next tra tragedy. You know, the data security is a very important aspect for the agency. The agency, um, you know, People around the world are trying to get to the agency information and the database. So this is another opportunity to put it in the cloud system and have the you know the greater security of our data. So that's one of the reason also we are going into more of the structured review and all that. So, uh, but we can you know I don't want to take too much time. But no, next time you next time you have an answer, put your hand up. Don't uh, come to the line. Right, okay. <laughs> Give me a mic. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Roy. Um, 
Mic at the far end, please. So this is for the tablet doses form, where RLD has been discontinued, and it does not have any uh, scoring on that. But can generic work uh, to have a score scoring on the generic tablet? What could be the bio perspective, or how FDA take this change? Should I come again? This is, this is related to bio perspective mostly. So there is a RLD which has been discontinued and it does not have any scoring. So as a generic applicant, can they do scoring on the generic tablet? And how FDA take this change? I can attempt to answer that from a clinical perspective. So. Okay. Um, if you're proposing a scoring that was not available in the RLD, we're going to go back and evaluate it based on the label of the RLD. So from a clinical perspective, the allowance of that scoring will be based on that. And if, for example, as you score it, if the scores still can, you can apply the same labeling for the, for the um, end users to take it, and if that's applicable to that or not. From a bioequivalence um, perspective, I guess you guys can comment. Okay, thank you. Um, no more answers for the panel for this one, right? Uh, I, I would just uh, quickly chime in, just my personal perspective. Uh, if the, the RLD, no matter is discontinued or is still on the market, if it's not scored, then uh, the generic drug, uh, it wants to put a score on the tablet, then needs to consider whether there has been any tested um, when the ROD was being approved or being tested or approved or, or reviewed, uh, is there any concern about keeping the tablet, for example, keeping it intact? Or can that be split or crushed? So that also is a consideration. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a more a complex question, not just simply say, hey, there's already no uh, reference there. So we can do what we think is the best way to, to manufacture the generic. I think there's more uh, thinking behind that. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's take one question from online, then we'll finish up these two here. We're running a little late, so let's take one from online. Question for Himena. How to challenge to the feedback received from FDA if a sponsor found it not appropriate? Or how would you? Can challenge? you repeat the question, sure. please? To whom was it addressed? Uh, to Himena, uh, how to you challenge? The, how would you challenge the feedback received from FDA if a sponsor found it not appropriate? Um, I mean, I guess it would depend on the feed or you know what the the deficiency was. Uh, but if if there's any clarification questions. Um, I guess I, my first thought would be submit a control correspondence. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Microphone in front of me, please. Hi, my question is related to Gadesa B. Uh, what's the timeline of its implementation? Are you implementing to a part of the review right now? What stage it is? And is it going to be depending on the type of ENDA submissions? Like, is it implemented all across right now? So first of all, Gadesa BE is the assessment tool, assessment tool for the bioequivalence assessors, right? I have alluded to a little bit about the structured data submission in the future. Uh, right now, it's currently under consideration. Detailed requirements will come up. So right now, the scope for Gadesa BE, like I said, only about 60 ENDAs have reviewed by Gadesa BE system. Um, so we are um, taking the approach from oral solid dosage form and to expand to other dosage forms. Right now, we are only focusing on certain study designs. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Last question at the far end, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, back to pediatric excipients again, and uh, feeding into the previous question and, and the question from the panel. So, so the way a generic uh, manufacturer knows that an NDA is going to be pursuing or have to pursue approval in, an, uh, in, a, in a pediatric population is because of their PMRs. That's all posted on FDA's letters. So when you see in an FDA letter that they have post-marketing requirements for multiple PED assessments, one can imagine that in the not too distant future, they're very likely to be approved in the pediatric population. So I think part of the question, it was a question I shared as well, 
If somebody submits an ANDA now and the RLD is labeled only for use in an adult population, and we get an ANDA that's approved based on an excipient level, but later on, it ends up being labeled for use in pediatric populations, and all of a sudden an approved application has an excipient that has a, a pediat uh, some sort of pediatric issue, what's the agency's position on that? You would certainly be applying a standard of pediatric excipient evaluation to any pending or future approvals. What would you do for a consistency standpoint with approvals that have already taken place? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the clarifi clarification and the follow-up. I think that's a very, very good point, first of all. Um, and also, I think whenever that scenario happened and uh, the drug actually, um, the PSG, um, not the PSG, the RLD will be expanded for pediatric use. If that's the case, I think for a generic drug, which has been approved, referencing that particular RLD, uh, also needs to have you know additional evaluation. For example, uh, the revising of the labeling and everything. I think during that process, um, at this moment, uh, personally, I have not encounter with this kind of review yet, but that's a very good point and we can definitely have a further discussion back in the office. Uh, but I think during that phase when uh, the, gener the approved generic drug also needs to submit like a post-approval revision of their, the, the generic labeling, in that phrase, uh, when it considers the use in pediatric patients specifically, additional evaluation within the office will be conducted and there will be a, a close communication with the applicant. Uh, I think that's the, the current uh, thinking, uh, at least from my personal per perspective. But uh, again, I have not encountered into that scenario at this moment. Thank you. That's a great point. Thank you. So this is the end of the formal Q&A session, but our speakers are available for during the break. Should you have individual questions you want to ask them? So let's break now, and we will resume at 11 a.m. Thank you.
Is it 11 o'clock on the dot? Yes, I have to be true to my word. Okay, thank you all, everybody, for coming back here in the room and online. We're going to start our next session, and um, I'm going to introduce the speakers for this next session here. And the next session presentation within the next session is nitrosamine risk assessment in type 2 drug master files supporting GADUFA applications. And that will be given by Dr. Govindaraj Kumaran, who's a chemist within the Division of Product Quality Assessment. Is that true, 19? Quality Assessment 19? Yeah, thank you. Whoa. Office of Product Quality Assessment 3. Then we will do the presentation entitled Post Approval Changes in Complex Generics from Drug Products. Chemistry, Manufacturing, and Controls, fondly known as CMC Perspectives. And that will be given by Dr. David Awate Otu, from C a Senior Pharmaceutical Quality Assessor at DPQA3 within OPQA at OPQ. Following that, we will be talking about quality considerations for topical optical drug, ophthalmic, I'm sorry, topical ophthalmic drug products guidance for industry, and that will be given by Dr. Asif Rashid, who is a senior review chemist within DPQA8, OPQA2, at OPQ. Let's welcome our panelists, our speaker and the panelists. I'll leave that to you. Thank you, Brenda, for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Govind Raj Kumaran. Um, I'm a CMC reviewer uh, in OPQ, Office of uh, Pharmaceutical Quality, CDER FDA. Uh, so I'm happy to be here uh, to present uh, nitrosamine risk assessment in type 2 DMFs supporting uh, good of applications. A quick disclaimer. This presentation reflects the views of the presenter and should not be construed to represent FDA's views or policies. I would like to uh, start off with uh, OPQ's uh, overall uh, goal and mission. Everyone deserves confidence in that next dose of medicine. Pharmaceutical quality assures the availability, safety, and the efficacy of every dose. This slide provides the learning objectives of uh, my presentation. First, I will discuss the formation of nitrosamines, and then nitrosamines in drug products and the FDA guidances, potential root causes of nitrosamines in API, nitrosamine risk factors in API, recommendations to API manufacturers, approaches to determining acceptable intake limits, nitrosamine control strategies, and finally, summary. So the nitrosamine is a class of compounds in which the nitroso group is attached to an amine. Uh, one of the uh, most uh, common way to form the uh, nitrosamine is the nitrosation of secondary amine under acidic condition. Um, if a, nitros if a nitrosonium, uh, uh, nitrosonium species is generated uh, from the nitrosating agent, then the secondary amine will uh, readily react with the uh, nitrosonium species and it will produce the uh, nitrosamine. Tertiary amines may undergo dealkylation uh, to form secondary amine, which may undergo uh, nitrosation to form the uh, nitrosamines. And amide solvents may decompose to secondary amine, which may undergo nitrosation to form the uh, nitrosamines. So the nitrosamine um, uh, is a, a probable uh, human carcinogens. Uh, they are potent. Uh, genotoxic reagents, and uh, uh, these nitro, uh, the nitrosamines are referred as a cohort of concern in ICH uh, M7 guidance. Uh, because of their high carcinogenic potency, they are regulated more tightly than typical mutagenic impurities. The TTC limit, that is the toxicology, threshold toxicology concern limit, should not be applied to the nitrosamines.
This slide describes the, uh, the small molecule nitrosamines uh, in uh, drug product. The, the first uh, nitrosamine issue was uh, um, uh, uh, reported in June 2018. So in June 2018, FDA informed the presence of uh, NDMA, that is N-nitrosodimethylamine uh, impurity in, uh, from a balsartan manufacturer. And then later, uh, small molecule nitrosamines in drug product were reported, uh, and some of them are uh, listed here. Then, uh, to, uh, to address these uh, you know, small molecule uh, uh, nitrosamines, uh, FDA first published the uh, uh, nitrosamine guidance in September 2020, and then it was later revised in uh, February 2021. Uh, the guidance is control of uh, nitrosamine impurities in human drugs. So this guidance um, actually provides some basic information about the nitrosamines, and uh, also it uh, uh, provides a control strategy for the nitrosamines in uh, drug substance and drug product. More importantly, uh, this, uh, uh, this guidance recommended uh, control limits for certain uh, small molecule nitrosamines. Some of uh, the small molecule nitrosamines are listed in this table. At the time, um, these small molecule nitrosamines are uh, probable uh, nitrosamine impurities in the drug substance and the drug product. When the small molecule uh, nitrosamine impurities uh, were reported in the uh, drug products, simultaneously NDSRIs in uh, drug products were also reported. Uh, NDSRIs are nitrosamine drug substance related impurities. They are class of uh, nitrosamines sharing structural similarity to the API. The FDA identified uh, this issue in a public statement on November 18, 2021. So the uh, presence of NDSRIs in drug substance and drug product added additional complexity to this uh, uh, nitrosamine issue, uh, primarily because uh, Determining the acceptable intake limit for this NDSR is more challenging than the small molecule uh, nitrosamine impurities, primarily because these, uh, the NDSRIs are unique to each API, and there is no uh, uh, safety data or carcinogenicity data reported for these NDSRIs. So determining the acceptable intake limit for these NDSRIs uh, is more challenging uh, so that becomes a huge issue in the uh, pharmaceutical industries. Uh, to address this issue, um, FDA again published one more guidance in uh, August 2023. Uh, that is uh, uh, recommended acceptable intake limits for the NDSRI, that is rail guidance. So the major uh, component of the rail guidance is the uh, CPCA, uh, carcinogenic potency categorization approach. Uh, using CPCA, the rail guidance categorized the NDSRI into uh, five different categories, and the associated acceptable intake limit ranges from 26.5 nanogram per day to uh, 1,500 nanogram per day. You can um, find this uh, guidance in this uh, uh, in this web page, and the link is uh, provided here. And uh, this uh, web page also provides some additional information on acceptable intake limits. Uh, there are two tables are there in this web page. Uh, table one contains searchable list of 264 hypothetical NDSRIs, potency categories, and associated recommended acceptable intake limit. And the table two contains list of NDSRI for which FDA has identified acceptable intake limits based on compound specific data or read across analysis. This web page will be updated periodically. So moving on to the uh, next section, uh, root cause of nitrosamines in API. Uh, the root cause of nitrosamine in API uh, can be categorized into three categories. Uh, first is intrinsic properties of API, process related, uh, quality of uh, raw materials. Intrinsic properties of API. Suppose if an API has a nitro group and a secondary or tertiary amine in the same molecule, then there is a possibility that the API can generate the uh, nitrosamine impurity. For example, in the case of the ranitidine, uh, this ranitidine has nitro group and a tertiary amine in the molecule, and it was reported that 
the ranitidine can generate the NDMA impurities by the intramolecular degradation of API without the requirement of any exogenous nitrate source. So the other uh, category uh, for the root cause of nitrosamines in API is process related. Um, in, in the most common pathway uh, to formation of nitrosamines, three factors are required. Presence of nitrosamines, presence of uh, nitrosating agent, and the conditions conductive to nitrosamine formation. Presence of nitrosamine, uh, nitrosable, nitrosable amines. Excuse me. Okay, presence of uh, nitrosable amines. Amine functional groups are very common on API molecules, uh, isn't it? Uh, um, almost 20% of the approved um, uh, drug, drug products contains the uh, amine functional groups. And the tertiary and secondary amines are uh, common bases used in the synthesis. And uh, amide solvents are very common in the API manufacturing process. Uh, they can significantly degrade under high temperature uh, to form uh, secondary amine. For example, uh, dimethyl formamide. Dimethyl formamide can degrade at high temperature uh, to form the dimethyl amine, and di that amine uh, could cause the formation of the uh, uh, nitrosamine impurities. So the other uh, factor for the formation of uh, nitrosamine is the nitrosating agent. So the nitrosating agent can be intentionally added as a nitrate salt or nitrous acid or it can be an impurity from another reagent, such as nitric acid or sodium acide. The less common uh, nitrosating agent is alkyl nitrates. Alkyl nitrates may be intentionally added to the uh, API manufacturing process, or it may be an impurity from a rearrangement of uh, nitroalkanes. So the third factor is the conditions conductive to nitrosamine formation. Acidic condition facilitates the uh, nitrosating reaction. So the other uh, process-related uh, root cause of nitrosamine um, is the oxidation of 1,1-disubstituted uh, itrazine. Um, in the case of 1,1-disubstituted uh, itrazine, um, you don't really need any uh, external uh, nitrosating agent. Even the molecular oxygen uh, can oxidize the 1,1-disubstituted uh, itrazine, and that will generate the uh, nitrosamine impurities in the API manufacturing process. Nitrate formation uh, from oxidation of uh, hydroxylamine is known, or nitrate release from nitroaromatic precursors is also known. And uh, the other uh, root cause of, uh, um, uh, process-related root cause of nitrosamine in API is fluid bed drying. Um, Nitrogen oxides uh, in the intake air of the uh, fluid bed drying um, can generate the uh, nitrosamine in the uh, API. And uh, use of activated charcoal also uh, can uh, uh, pose the nitrosamine uh, risk because when you use the uh, um, uh, activated charcoal in the final stage, especially in the final stage, and if there is a secondary amine present in the, uh, uh, in the process, then there is a risk for the formation of the uh, nitrosamines. So the other uh, process-related uh, root cause of nitrosamines uh, is a poor operation uh, design of the process. Suppose if a nitrosamine is uh, uh, formed in the, um, in the API manufacturing process, and the, uh, because of the poor operations or design of the uh, you know, process, the, uh, the adequate purging may not happen uh, for the, uh, the nitrosamine impurities. Then it will, that impurity will carry over to the, uh, the final EAPI uh, uh, product. And uh, crash contamination, uh, uh, crash contamination of uh, nitrosamine impurities in multipurpose facilities is, has been reported. So the other uh, category uh, in the root cause of uh, nitrosamines in API is uh, quality of uh, raw materials. Uh, use of uh, raw materials containing impurities. So the amine and nitrosamine impurities were found in the fresh solvents. Uh, uh, some of them are listed here. And uh, use of disinfected water uh, can generate the uh, nitrosamine impurities. And nitrate impurities are, nitrate impurities are, are found in the several uh, reagents, such as sodium acide water, 
and uh, sodium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, and sodium hydroxides. And uh, uh, it has uh, the recycled materials, such as uh, solvents, reagents, and catalysts, are confirmed source of uh, nitrosamines. So these are all the, some of the root cause of nitrosamines uh, in API manufacturing process. So moving on to the uh, next section, small molecule nitrosamine risk factors in API. Uh, one of the uh, risk factors for the formation of small molecule nitrosamine is the use of secondary amine or tertiary amine bases or tertiary amide solvents. And the nitrosating agents are deliberately added to the process or if the nitrosating agent is present as a significant impurity in the other materials, especially if these precursors are uh, used in the same or adjacent process, or adjacent steps. The other uh, risk factor for the formation of a small molecule uh, nitrosamines in API is uh, uh, presence of 1,1 disubstituted itrosines or their imines in the process. Because I said that 1,1 disubstituted itrosine uh, can react with the molecular oxygen and it will produce the, uh, you know, uh, the nitrosamine impurity. How about the uh, NDSRI risk factors in uh, API? Um, if, if the starting material, uh, intermediate, related substances, or API, have a secondary or tertiary amine, amine functional group, and the nitrosating agents are deliberately added to the process, are present as a significant impurity in other materials, especially if the precursors are in the same or adjacent steps. The other, uh, suppose if the process uses the fluid bed drying or jet milling process, and the API are counter ion contains secondary amine, then there is a risk for uh, uh, NDSRI in API. If the activated carbon is used in the purification of the crude material, crude API, uh, sorry, crude or final API, and the API contains, uh, API or counter ion contains secondary amine, then there is a risk of uh, uh, NDSRI in API. Recommendations to API manufacturers. Look at the uh, API uh, synthetic route holistically. Uh, don't look at piece by piece when you do the risk uh, assessment of the uh, nitrosamines. Audit the starting materials, intermediate vendors. Understand the risk coming from the purchase materials. And if the risk, if a risk of nitrosamine is identified, confirmatory test of BHS should be conducted using sensitive and appropriately validated methods. If nitrosamines are detected, then perform a root cause analysis and implement changes to manufacturing process to prevent or uh, reduce nitrosamines add control wherever it is necessary, and repro report the implemented changes to FDA. Approaches for determining acceptable intake limit of NDSRA. To determine the acceptable intake limit, first you check the uh, EI limit appears on the uh, table one or table two. Uh, you can find the, uh, you know, the, the link for the, uh, I, I provided the link for uh, table one and table two. You can check that table and then First, check those those tables to see whether that particular NDSRI is listed in the in the table one or table two. If AI limit cannot be found in the above tables, determine using uh, a CPCA to uh, determine the acceptable intake limit using CPCA recommended in the rail guidance. if they are unable to meet their CPCA-based acceptable intake limit. They can use read across analysis uh, from a surrogate to determine the acceptable, in acceptable intake limit, or they can submit the compound-specific toxicology data to determine the acceptable intake limit. Uh, certain nitroso compounds, for example, um, nitroso amide, uh, nitroso guanidine, and nitroso urea, uh, the CPCA, the, these nitroso compounds are out of scope of CPCA. Um, for this type of uh, uh, nitroso compound, alternate approaches uh, such as uh, uh, read across analysis from a um, surrogate candidate or compound specific uh, toxicology data um, 
uh, may be used to, to uh, determine the acceptable intake limit. Nitrosamine uh, control strategies. Um, the ICH M7 um, provides uh, uh, four options uh, to control the, um, uh, the mutagenic impurities. The API manufacturers um, uh, can use that four options uh, as a control strategies, but it has to be, uh, uh, the, the control strat strategies should be supported uh, by the uh, appropriate data and justification. Suppose if you have multiple nitrosamines are controlled in the specification, um, and the total level of uh, uh, nitrosamines exceeds the acceptable intake limit of the most potent nitrosamine based on the MDT, the manufacturer should contact the agency. Um, I, I provided the, uh, the contact information in the final slide. Uh, you can contact the agency in case if the, uh, you know, the total uh, uh, level of the nitrosamine exceeds the, uh, the level of most potent uh, nitrosamines based on MDT. Challenge question one. Fluid bed drying or jet milling uh, in the API manufacturing process has potential to form NDSRI when API contains primary amine, secondary amine, tertiary amine, or amide. The answer is secondary amine. Challenge question two. Which of the following nitrosol compound is out of scope of CPCA? n nitrosamines n nitrosamides n nitrosoguanidines n nitrosourea All the above except A. The answer is all the above except A. In summary, nitrosamine formation may be a risk in API. Process understanding is essential to mitigate the risk. Built quality into the process to minimize or eliminate the uh, nitrosamine formation. Always uh, uh, take a holistic approach when assessing the uh, nitrosamine risk. If you have any questions related to uh, nitrosamines in API, use uh, cedar-opq-inquiries at fba.hhs.gov. Uh, we will uh, get back to you uh, with the answer. And with that, uh, uh, I thank everyone. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, um, uh, I'm happy to answer in the uh, question and answer session. So I would like to invite the next speaker, David, to the podium. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm David Awachio, and I'm SPQA with um, the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, um, mainly involved in uh, post-approval changes of um, supplements. And um, pharmaceutical quality, we all have this natural inclination towards um, uh, quality products for use in our everyday lives, such as computers, cars, cell phones. Um, and drugs are no different. Um, patients expect very safe and effective drugs from us. So pharmaceutical quality basically is to assure that every dose that gets to the patient is safe and effective and it's free of contamination and defects. It is what gives them that confidence in their next dose of medicine. So um, today I'll be talking about um, uh, post-approval changes in complex generic drug products from the CMC and then product quality perspectives. Um, per the GADUFA 3 uh, commitment letter, complex drug products are defined as any product with a complex active ingredient or complex route of um, delivery, uh, any product with a complex formulation such as liposomes, colloids, um, complex um, dosage forms, or even complex drug device combination products. Uh, for the purposes of um, today's um, presentation, I'll be focusing on um, pre-filled um, uh, synthetic um, peptides, on um, meter dose inhalers, and then um, transdermal systems, as well as um, uh, dry powder inhalation products. Um, 
Per the Code of Federal Regulation, um, it requires that FDA be notified of any changes made to conditions established. And I would very much like us to focus on um, the phrase condition established, as we'll come to that later. Um, it is applicant's duty to notify the FDA about any change in each condition that is established in an approved um, application beyond the vari variations that are already provided for in the application. And the notice is um, required in the form of a supplement for change. Um, it's required that the applicant clearly list all proposed changes in the cover letter to that supplement. Um, we also require that the holder of the application to assess the effects of these changes before distributing a product made with a manufacturing change, which means that supporting data must be provided for those proposed changes. Um, the Code of Federal Regulation also provides us with um, the filing categories for these um, based on the risk. Um, there's a reporting category based on um, whether the, the post change has a substantial, moderate, or minimal um, potential to have an adverse effect on product quality. Um, and when we talk about product quality, it talks about the identity, strength, quality, purity, and potency of the drug product as it relates to the safety and effectiveness of the product. Based on these reporting categories, we have major changes, which means that these are changes that have the potential the key word here is the potential to have um, um, adverse effect on drug product quality after effecting those changes. Um, we usually call it the tell, and then we wait for FDA to assess um, what has been submitted to um, support those changes. Once approval is given, then the firm can go ahead with um, effecting those changes. And it's, in the, uh, it's called a prior approval supplement. We also have moderate changes. And with the moderate changes, we have the two. You said tell, wait, and do, which I call the CBE 30, which means that F uh, applicant notifies or tells the FDA that this is the change we want to make. Within, I mean, within 30 days, FDA is supposed to actually grant that change, the CBE 30. Or if there are any issues, applicants will be notified that no. The change you want to uh, uh, you proposing or the change you proposing must be in a higher filing category than you have proposed. Um, in which case, it's elevated to a PAS. Or you have the CBE zero, where the change is moderate. It's just tell, do and tell. You do it and then you tell. Same with, with the minor changes, which is the annual reportable changes, where a firm actually reports those changes in its annual report. Uh, I've listed here um, some current post-approval guidances as it relates to um, um, some common dosage forms, such as uh, immediate release, modified release, uh, semi-solids. And then there is um, the post-approval changes for alternate testing and um, laboratory testing sites. Uh, changes to, uh, which is the general, which is not dose specific, the changes to approved NDAs and ANDAs. There's also the annual reportable changes guidance, um, as well as for drug substances, and then the comparability protocol. For complex generic drugs, um, due to the complexity in nature of either the drug product or the drug substance itself, some of these um, guidances appear either outdated or not applicable, not specific to that particular dosage form. And that is where the challenges come, in that it results in filing categories for um, some products that are not clearly defined. And then for such um, products that are not clearly defined, it results in overly conservative approaches to post-approval changes. Um, there's therefore the need for um, transparency and clarity regarding the life cycle management of these products. Some common regulatory barriers that such complex generic drug products face include, I mean, um, confusion as to which filing category would um, they fall into, as well as the data requirements um, for such changes. 
So for this reason, and due to um, the timeline, confusion in timelines, ICH um, has come out with um, uh, some guidelines from QA through Q14 that actually deals with early stage um, of the product life cycle, as well as um, drug product development. Um, of importance is the IC, I mean, all are very important, but um, the, 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 um, the forward here is that we want quality to be built into the drug product, rather than for quality to be um, by testing of the product after manufacturing of the product. So we have that quality by design. Um, we're going to focus more on ICHQ12, which talks about, um, as I said earlier, established conditions as well as um, the post-approval um, changes management protocol. Um, established conditions are legally binding um, or conditions which uh, require submission of a, a supplement if these are changed. So they form the elements of control strategy in an application um, based on the product and process parameters or, or facility and equipment operating conditions or in-process controls, finished product specifications and associated methods and frequency that are necessary to assure um, process performance and product quality of the drug. So if any established condition is changed, it requires a submission of um, uh, a supplement. Supporting information does not require regulatory submission if changed. And the extent of ECs vary based on the understanding of the drug product, uh, as well as the process, the manufacturing process itself, characterization of the product, and then the first on developmental approach, and then the potential risk to product quality. Product and process understanding come from um, the development studies, platform knowledge that is built, or commercial experience. After established conditions are identified, the applicant may follow um, existing guidelines or regulations or uh, to, um, as far as the reporting categories for any changes that are proposed, um, or they can propose an alternate reporting category, but based on uh, thorough risk assessment as justification. Reporting category is always dependent on the potential risk to product quality, as I stated earlier. So the risk assessment should follow approaches described in um, the risk management protocol in ICH um, Q9. Consider overall control strategy and impossible concurrent changes. What this does is it increases transparency between industry and um, regulatory authorities in that there's better design of the product as quality is built into the product right from the onset um, with fewer problems in manufacturing since decisions are made based on process understanding and risk mitigation. And for agency, there's improved quality information and require regulatory submissions as well as the quality of the review. Post-approval changes uh, man management protocol. Um, it's referred to in the US um, by the FDA as um, comparability protocol, and it provides predictability and transparency regarding the information that's required to support a CNC change and the submission required for that change. It may be submitted with the original application or as a standalone submission could be a prior approval supplement, and can be submitted to address one or more changes for a single product, or it may address one or more changes to be applied to multiple products. For example, if a company has, um, let's say, injectables and then wants to um, qualify, let's say, a stopper for um, the products, um, it can submit a comparability protocol um, in a higher filing category, and then once that protocol is approved, um, it can be applied to all the other products. It submits um, as long as the FDA approves um, those um, proposed tests as well as um, conditions that um, are submitted, then a lower filing category can be submitted for the other products. 
to use those. You should know that um, CMC change that will require supportive efficacy safety, that's clinical or non-clinical or human uh, pharmaco kinetic or pharmacodynamic data is not suitable for inclusion in a PA CMP. Um, the first step involves the submission of a rating protocol with the proposed test to be, um, to be carried out um, for um, the proposed change. Usually that's the strategy is to submit a PAS um, with the um, listed number of tests and, con tests and conditions to be met. Um, once the FDA reviews these tests or strategy and approves it, the firm goes to the execution stage where it generates the necessary data for the exhibit batch as well as validation and uh, verification reports and stability. And then step two, once it's approved, is for the firm to submit um, these um, data in a lower filing category. So I have provided here a timeline where for, let's say, the submission of a PAS, assuming it takes about four months for those comparability protocols to be reviewed and approved, the firm goes through the execution stage and then um, generates the necessary data, submits an exhibit batch with all the um, supporting information. It's submitted as a, at a lower um, 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 filing category. So in that case, a CBE 30 submission, that is to tell, wait, and do. So within 30 days, the firm can implement the change as long as all the conditions or the results that are uh, generated meet the acceptance criteria and conditions in protocol. They are met. Applicants submit the information to FDA. If the acceptance criteria and other conditions stated in the protocol are not met, then the change cannot be implemented using this approach. The advantages with this is um, there's increased um, clarity um, and standardization. There's increased manufacturing efficiency, reduced regulatory burden, uh, reduced drug shortages, reduced time, as well as costs. Post-approval changes to um, drug device con combination. I'm going to have to run through this. Um, the current um, guidance for industry um, changes to approved NDA, ANDA, to only gives two examples for container closure or for devices. What about which talks about the manufacturing site, um, as, as well as for the container closure. Um, change itself to be submitted as a PAS um, for these devices. Design control um, for MDIs, that's um, for metered dose inhaler as well as for um, dry powder inhalers, require a combination of product understanding, process understanding as well as device um, understanding um, to um, gain a thorough understanding of these. Usually, drug device um, combination products is a split review between um, CDRH and then CEDA or CEDA. Um, um, I have provided um, a correlation between um, dry powder inhaler or MDI components, mainly dry powder inhaler, of um, some of the um, critical quality attributes for the device constituents as well as um, the drug formulation constituents that go together to affect the final product quality of these devices. Um, for the drug substance, assay particle size, um, as well as um, some uh, the morphic form of the drug substance, excipient CQAs, device CQAs, all go in together to affect the final drug product quality that is provided. And knowledge of this is very helpful in effecting changes post-approval. Um, the FDA um, came out with a guidance for the ICH implementation strategies for, um, and part of it includes the identification of established conditions and then the reporting categories for the device constituents part of a, a drug device combination product. So um, the three questions that you ask is whether the device constituent part is very essential for safe use based on risk management, or whether it's essential to achieve 
the delivery of the label dose? And does it, infect, uh, does it impact drug product um, critical quality attributes? If the answer is yes, then um, the device constituent is actually very essential um, or pr performs a primary characteristic to the drug product. Um, based on the level of potential risk, uh, either uh, PAS or CB30 or CB0 can be submitted. If the answer is no to all, then um, it's not reported. It's annual report is submitted in the um, firm's annual report. Here's a challenge question. So if an applicant submits a CB30 to propose the extension of micronization pressure parameter range during the micronization of the drug substance that was used or that's used in the manufacture of a dry powder inhalation product. Applicant size section 7C1B of the um, post-approval changes guidance, that's a change in um, uh, drug substance um, manufacture or parameters um, to support a proposed change. Should this supplement be granted CBE 30 based on the submission or should it be elevated to PAS based on section 7B1 of the drug um, of the um, post-approval changes guidance because the changes in the micronization pressure parameters involve um, elevating the upper limit of those parameters for the drug substance. And the answer is B, it, will be, it should be ele uh, elevated to PAS. And the reason is that the revision to the drug substance micronization process parameters may affect the particle size distribution for the drug product. We all know that um, one critical quality attribute is the aerodynamic um, particle size, um, uh, particle size um, distribution of, for a dry powder inhaler. So it will, be, or it, will, it will be elevated to PAS based on that, the criticality of that change. Post-approval changes to transdermal delivery systems. We know that transdermal delivery systems um, usually consists of the drug in adhesive mixture, um, the release liner, the backing, based on whether it's a, a matrix type, transdermal, or it's a, it's a reservoir, a transdermal, or topical delivery. Um, the questions remain as to what should be submitted. How far should the, um, the firm go into the characterization of any change? Is there a BE study that should be performed based on that change or in vitro? Um, skin permeation test or in vitro um, um, release will suffice it. That is where the con con uh, confusion is. I have uh, provided some um, supplements where the changes have been submitted as a PES or a CBE 30 for yeah, examples of these. Um, the challenge question is, an applicant submits a CBE 30 to propose an increase in batch size less than 10 times. Changes to components of the adhesive and sources of foil within the pouch material. The data submitted to support the proposed change indicate that the changes do not adversely affect draft product quality. Should a supplement be downgraded to a CBE 0 based on the data provided? Or should it be granted as a CBE 30 as submitted? or elevated to uh, PAS due to the potential high risk change to the adhesive component? And the answer is that this is a multiple related change, so it's um, elevated to a PAS. Um, we know that the adhesive or adhesive component represents a change in the component of a formulation, uh, and it has a substantial potential to have an adverse effect on product quality. The adhesive of, of a transdermal delivery system is critical to the safety efficacy and quality of the drug product since it is in intimate contact with the drug substance and or other excipients that may alter either the adhesive properties and or influence the release of the drug. So the key word here is the potential of that change to have an adverse effect on product quality and not how good the data looks. So synthetic drug um, products, um, the FDA defines um, peptides as any alpha um, amino acid polymer composed of 40 or fewer amino acids. 
The FDA released um, the guidance for submission for NDAs that refer to RLDs or recombinant DNA origin due to the um, current state of technology for peptide synthesis and characterization, applicants can submit ANDAs under um, the 505J pathway or the Food Drug and Cosmetic Act for which synthetic drug products that reference previously approved peptide drug products of recombinant DNA origin. So generic peptide drugs must demonstrate the same sameness to RLD in that the API must be characterized to show that peptide-related impurities are same or lower than those of the RLD, and any new specified peptide-related impurity that is found must be less than 0.5, and the appropriate justification provided on why or how its presence would not affect um, the safety and effectiveness of the generic product compared to the RLD. So in the absence of a specific post-approval changes guidance for generic synthetic products, post-approval changes have been based on a combination of risk assessment and knowledge gained from the original submission. And especially, I'm going to um, hit especially on for approved drug substance, any change in the drug substance manufacturing process require the applicant to demonstrate that a new peptide is thoroughly characterized to show all peptide-related impurities are the same or lower than the approved drug substance, as well as the RLD. And to characterize any new specified peptide-related impurities and justify why the presence of such new impurity would not be expected to af affect the safety and effectiveness of the drug product. So characterization of um, the generic drug substance provide adequate information on the primary sequence, secondary structure if there is, oligo or aggregation studies, as well as the biological activities. Um, these are examples of some PAS and CBE studies um, based on the type of changes that are proposed by the um, applicants. So in conclusion, um, it, it's um, applicants' responsibility to improve the quality of submission by using science-based and race-based approach to assess the impact of proposed changes on drug product quality. Um, to also demonstrate good product and process understanding of your supplement. That we should ad adopt modern quality techniques with focus on sound science for assessing and mitigating risk of poor product quality and process quality. So CV, uh, quality by design, CQA, CPP, CMAs, and control strategy needed. So at the end of the day, we'll be able to stand by our products. Thank you. Thanks, David, uh, and thanks to SBIE organizers for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Asif Rashid. I'm a senior review chemist uh, in uh, the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality Assessment 2 uh, within OPQ. And today I'm going to talk about this guidance for industry, rather the draft guidance for industry, uh, which is titled Quality Considerations for Topical Ophthalmic Drug Products. Oops. And for those of you who are attending uh, this event for CME credits, the learning objective for my presentation is to provide you with an overview of the draft guidance Oops. and explain current practices on assessment of key topics discussed in the guidance. This guidance covers ophthalmic drug products which are intended to topical delivery only. And that may include gels, ointments, creams, liquid formulations such as solutions, suspensions, and emulsions, uh, and the applications under which these dosage forms are submitted. And these are NDAs, ANDAs, BLAs, and OTCs. Uh, the guidance was initially published in October of 2023 and subsequently revised in December of 2023 to add one more technical section. Uh, currently, as of now, the guidance has seven substantive technical sections, and these are listed here. Uh, these include microbiological considerations, visible particulate matter, extractables and leachables, impurities and degradation products, uh, in vitro drug release and dissolution testing for quality, 
container closure systems, design uh, and delivery and dispensing characteristics, and finally, stability. So I'm going to briefly discuss each of these sections and just highlight uh, the uh, salient features and uh, expectation for these sections. So uh, the guidance provides that uh, for microbiological considerations uh, related to product sterility for all ophthalmic drug products. And emphasis is placed on complying with current good manufacturing requirements to ensure product quality. And in that regard, the guidance refers to two documents. The first is another guidance for industry, and that is a sterile drug product produced by aseptic processing, uh, current good manufacturing practices. And the second document is the submission documentation for a sterilization process validation in applications for human and veterinary drug products. Uh, the guidance puts specific uh, consideration for multi-dose drug products, as you can imagine. For multi-dose drug products, because of multiple use, uh, the susceptibility for microbial ingress is significantly high. Yet, these products should remain free from any harmful contamination uh, if such a potential microbial ingress happens. So due to this concern, uh, the guidance recommends use of preservative if the drug product itself does not have inherent antimicrobial activity. And speaking of preservative, uh, lately some applicants uh, have approached uh, the agency uh, with proposal to use silver sulfate or other silver containing compounds as preservative, and agency has not recommended that because of safety concern. Some applicants have approached agency with multiple, uh, with multi-dose preservative free formulations. And for those type of formulations, uh, the guidance recommends application, applicants that they must demonstrate protection, uh, robust protection for each unit from incidental contamination during multiple use, as well as provide validation of all aseptic and sterilization processes. The next substantive section is visible particulate matter. And in general, uh, testing for visible particulate matter is accomplished uh, by visual inspection. And this to ensure that the products are not adulterated. However, we know that uh, most ophthalmic dosage forms, the liquid, uh, they are packaged in opaque containers. And for that, applicants can use either a destructive or a non-destructive testing. Uh, and I should point out that the guidance is silent on what type of destructive or non-destructive technique could be used. So that is up to the applicants. Applicant can choose a technique of their choice and provide adequate information to demonstrate, uh, to justify uh, the suitability of that technique uh, for the intended use. For dosage forms, where uh, the particular matter are by design, for instance, suspensions and emulsions, stability testing could be or should be evaluated, should be used to evaluate changes in particle size over the shelf life. And this is uh, uh, done to accomplish to ensure uh, uh, that any uh, intrinsic particular matter uh, should not be there with due to product instability. For extractable and leachable recommendation, the guidance expect that uh, the assessment for extractables and leachables for primary, secondary, as well as tertiary packaging components, including labeling of the container closure system. And the studies for extractables and leachables should be performed within the framework of uh, the USP uh, General Chapter 1663, which is the assessment of extractables associated with pharmaceutical packaging and delivery systems, as well as USP 1664, which is the assessment of drug product leachables associated with pharmaceutical packaging and delivery systems, and this guidance for industry container closure systems for packaging human drugs and biologics, chemistry, manufacturing, and control documentation. So I'm not going to go into the details of uh, the methodology and the requirements, because after lunch, uh, there's a whole presentation on this topic alone. So you are going to get more insights from our colleagues on the topic of extractables and leachables. Uh, for specific for leachable study, the guidance provides the safety thresholds. And these are given as follows, uh, 1 ppm for reporting threshold, 10 ppm for identification, 
and 20 ppm for qualification threshold. And here I would like to point out that these numbers uh, should not come as very new to our uh, colleagues in the industry. Uh, these numbers have been out in public domain for quite many years. Uh, it's just that the, now the guidance has formalized them. And we believe that there is merit for this approach. Providing these thresholds upfront takes some level of uncertainty out. So if you are a generic applicant, uh, you are working on your leachable study and your st stability study, you are monitoring the leachables. So you know when to take action for identification or qualification uh, should a certain uh, threshold is reached. Uh, and also, uh, leachable testing should be performed by fully validated analytical methods. And just a point of caution uh, that uh, the limit of quantitation for the analytical methods should be less than or equal to the identification threshold. Uh, the next substantive section uh, for the drug guidance is impurities and degradation product. So in general, NDA and ANDA drugs uh, follow ICHQ3B. Uh, OTC monographs are generally covered under USP uh, 10, uh, 1086. Uh, but for NDAs and ANDAs, the information on impurities are provided along the lines of these four bullets. So it's for each specified identified degradation product or impurity, each specified unidentified degradation product or impurity, any individual unspecified degradation product or impurity, and total degradation products or impurity. However, uh, this section provides a footnote which states that acceptance criteria for specified degradation products in generic drug products should be established according to the guidance for industry and as impurities in drug products, which was published in November 2010. So that means if you are uh, an applicant for a topical ophthalmic drug product, uh, uh, for a generic, rather, topical ophthalmic drug product, you should be following that guidance in order to establish a specification criteria for a specified degradation product. Uh, but this guidance provides specific recommendation for unspecified degradation products or impurities, and those thresholds are different than the corresponding thresholds uh, in ICHQ3B. And the guidance gives you the rationale. Why is it so? Uh, for one, uh, that these impurities uh, poses potential for high local concentration in the eye. And there's a lack of data on potential effects for these impurities. So because of that, uh, the, the thresholds given are different from ICHQ3B, and they are given in this table. So you may notice that the thresholds are two-tiered for drug products with strengths greater than 0.1% to less than or equal to 1%. The recommended identification and qualification threshold is 0.1%. However, for drug product with lower strengths, strengths less than or equal to 0.1%, the recommended threshold is 1% or 1 ppm. That is 1% of API or 1 ppm of drug product. For drug product with strengths higher than 1%, uh, the recommended identification and qualification thresholds would be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And also please note that, that these thresholds are for both identification as well as for qualification. That means if you observe an impurity, an unspecified impurity above these thresholds, uh, we expect uh, the applicants to identify as well as qualify these impurities and provide the safety information, we should address both local ocular toxicity as well as general systemic toxicity. And those information will be assessed by relevant disciplines within the agency. Uh, the next section in the guidance is in vitro drug release slash dissolution. The guidance recognizes uh, that uh, rate and extent of drug release uh, is a quality criteria to ensure consistency for certain dosage forms, namely suspensions, emulsions, and semi-solids. Uh, and for that matter, uh, this test could be used or should be used as part of quality control strategy. Uh, and the guidance provides an alternate also. So if an applicant believes that there are one or more critical quality attributes uh, that are sensitive to the formulation and process variants, then those CQAs could be used in lieu of in vitro drug release or dissolution testing. With this, time for a challenge question. For leachable study, 
in topical ophthalmic drug products, thresholds at or above which the observed leachable should be qualified for safety is, I'll give you a few seconds to think, and by show of hand, uh, if you believe it's A, 1 ppm, or 10 ppm, or C, 20 ppm, or D, 0.1%. I think most of you agree it's 20 ppm, and you are absolutely correct. So moving on uh, with the guidance, uh, the next substantive section is the container closure design and delivery and dispensing characteristics. And this section has multiple subsections. The first subsection is tamper-evident packaging. And this is specifically for non-retaining tamper-evident ring, uh, as depicted in this uh, picture, uh, that in the past, agency has received multiple complaints from consumers that the non-retaining tamper-evident, sometimes it is loose enough that it slips past the bottleneck. And if a patient is going to administer the drug, that loose ring can fall off on the eye and causes injury and that's uh, not acceptable. So the guidance recommends that applicants should employ uh, some sort of positive retention mechanism to ensure that the ring stays in its place and does not fall off. The next subsection uh, is uh, for the container closure tip, uh, and specifically the tip which are sealed, and they are uh, sort of uh, unsealed only at the time when the patient first time uses the container. And if that procedure involves multiple steps, then the agency discourage this practice. So for instance, uh, if the package insert instructions tells a patient to twist the cap clockwise, and that motion, because of a spike inside the, inside the cap, uh, pokes a hole on the tip. And then the instruction says to the patient to uh, twist the cap counterclockwise to open the container and then administer the drug. We find that this instruction could be complex to certain consumers and may lead to confusion. And we have received reports uh, that some consumers or some patients were not able to uh, appropriately puncture the hole on the tip. And then they resort to certain other techniques. They start using knives or uh, scissors and that's a huge risk for contamination. So, so that, that is discouraged. Uh, guidance uh, uh, recommends that keep it simple. Uh, simple instruction, use of single step procedure with simple directions. The next subsection uh, is for torque specification or the twisting force that is required to open the container. And there the guidance recommends for the applicants to consider the patient population. The torque should be low enough for elderly patient population to open the caps without difficulty, and it should be high enough that it, that it remains in place during manufacturing, storage, shipping, and handling. Uh, regarding the color coding for caps, uh, which is to characterize the therapeutic class, guidance uh, recommend to use the uniform color coding system as described in the American Academy of Ophthalmology's color codes for topical ocular medications policy statement. Uh, for the delivery and dispensing characteristics, uh, the guidance provides uh, the fill sizes for unit dose containers. So for uh, liquids, non-preserved liquids, solutions, suspensions, and emulsions, the fill volume should not be more than 0.5 ml. And for semi-solids, ointment, and gels, the fill size should not be more than one gram. And these unit dose containers should not be able to recap. So it's a one-time use. Any leftover drug should be discarded. For multi-dose containers, the guidance provides a recommendation for drop size, and it should be between 20 and 70 microliters. However, for generic drug products uh, submitted under ENDAS, the drop size should also be within plus minus 10% of the drop size of the reference listed drug and be within the drop size of 20 and 70 microliters. Uh, however, if there is deviation, then applicant can justify uh, those deviations to demonstrate sim similar number of delivered doses. Then the next uh, subsection uh, deals with suspensions, specifically suspensions which are packaged uh, in multi-dose containers. So a quality test for resuspendability or redispersibility should be proposed in drug product specification, and this is a qualitative test, and it should be performed for labeling instruction to mimic actual patient use conditions. 
So for instance, if the labeling instruction says to shake the bottle before use, right? So you can anticipate what could be the average time a patient is going to shake the bottle, right? And, and based on that, you can propose some acceptance criteria. So for example, it's just an example. Uh, the acceptance criteria could look like that time for resuspension for drug product after storage could be between 15 and 30 seconds. Then uh, also for suspensions packaged in multi-dose container, uh, uh, test for dose uniformity should be uh, proposed, but that's only a one-time study. And uh, that's a quantitative test. It is performed by withdrawing the drug from the top, middle, and bottom of the container after shaking per labeling instruction. And then the samples should be tested uh, by assay, uh, for assay using assay acceptance criteria. So this test ensures that throughout the container, all the doses are uniform. Switching to the last substantive section of the guidance, uh, that's stability. And in general, stability studies are to evaluate the appropriate storage conditions and the expiration date. Uh, so for instance, uh, the ophthalmic drug products packaged in semi-permeable containers, for example, low-density polyethylene, they should be kept at relatively low humidity conditions. And those low relative humidity conditions are provided in ICH Q1A. Uh, but applicants have choice to use higher relative humidity. It says that they can use the calculation provided in ICH Q1A to derive water loss at the reference relative humidity. Then the section provides recommendation on uh, orientation during storage. And for NDAs, preliminary development work uh, can be done to evaluate the storage conditions in two different orientations. So upright and inverted or horizontal. And then the worst case orientation for batches uh, should be uh, used for batches representing commercial manufacturing processes. For ANDAs, however, two different orientations are tested for the primary stability batches. And the data from both orientations should be provided and analyzed. And the worst case orientation is used for routine stability testing. For BLAs, uh, the primary stability studies are done or performed to determine the storage conditions under real, under real time uh, conditions. Then uh, the guidance provide recommendations on certain studies. So for instance, Study for water loss should be conducted uh, to assess moisture transmission properties of the CCS and protective properties of any secondary packaging. Uh, freeze thaw study should be done for emulsions and suspensions. It's a one-time study, and guidance provides a condition that it should be three cycles uh, from freezing all the way back to ambient condition for a cumulative minimum of three days. However, applicants can justify alternative conditions and durations uh, with adequate justification. In-use stability is performed if uh, the labeling claims uh, has some indication that the storage condition may change after opening, such as change in temperature or change in light exposure. With this, uh, time for a second challenge question. Which of the following studies is most suitable to mitigate the risk to drug product quality for ophthalmic suspensions and emulsions due to temperature variations during shipping and storage? Uh, give you a moment to think, and again, by show of hands, could it be in-use stability or photo stability, water loss study, or freeze thaw? Yeah, if you are thinking it's freeze thaw, you, you're absolutely correct. Uh, so that uh, concludes uh, my presentation, and I'm going to uh, sort of, as a take home, just point you to the last uh, bullet that adequate supporting data in and in and application that ensure a smooth and timely assessment of applications and ultimate approval. And this uh, guidance hope to accomplish uh, the same. And with this, I'm going to hand over to Brenda. Thank you very much, Dr. Rashid. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> we invite the other two speakers to come back up to the podium, please. Time for Q&As. OK, everyone is familiar with the process. Do we have any in-house questions? OK, uh, do we have any online questions? 
Sure. First question for Kumar. Do you see the duplex sequencing as an acceptable method to determine the safety of NDSRI instead of TGR? Uh, could you please repeat the question, please? Sure. Do you see the duplex sequencing as an acceptable method to determine the safety of NDSRI instead of TGR? Okay, that's a, a good question, actually. Um, so the NDSRIs, um, um, so if they uh, don't use the, you know, the CPCA-based acceptable intake limit, then uh, the agency has uh, proposed uh, uh, two alternate approaches. That is uh, um, the surrogate analysis, the read across analysis uh, using surrogate candidate, and then um, the uh, compound specific toxicology data. Um, they can submit, uh, you know, the compound specific toxicology data to determine the acceptable intake limit. But the uh, rail guidance, uh, which is published in August 2023, uh, they provided some information about the how what to submit in the compound specific uh, uh, toxicology data. So I um, I think uh, the question is that they should refer that uh, the rail guidance for NDSRI. So they provided uh, some information about the uh, uh, the compound specific data um, regarding that particular uh, toxicology uh, studies. What they are saying, um, actually, I am a, a CMC reviewer. I, this is a pharmaco uh, pharmacology for farm uh, questions. So um, it's uh, out of scope of you know um, uh, uh, the CMC. Uh, I out of scope of uh, my knowledge, so um, I think at least uh, uh, to get some uh, you know preliminary information, uh, they should refer that rail guidance. It, uh, it has some information about the uh, uh, the compound specific toxicology data, uh, what to submit, what not to submit. Thank you. Uh, first question in house. This is for Asif Rasid. Um, for the acceptable leachable of the ophthalmic drug product, uh, it is recommended to have a labeling also included in the acceptable leachable study. So if a product is using package insert, which is not directly like it is on the cap of the bottle, do we need to include that in the study too? So uh, in ideality, you try to mimic as close to the commercial packaging as possible, right? Uh, and uh, uh, I understand that that maybe at the time of development you may not have developed the entire tertiary packaging system, but uh, but there are ways to circumvent around. And uh, the package insert, I mean, it's it's a, it's part of the label, right? Uh, so so I would say uh, that yes, it should be uh, part of the tertiary packaging system, uh, uh, which should be put in place for a legible study. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And our second in-house question, please. Uh, good day. Thank you again for all your presentations. <clears throat> um, so can the agency comment on how successful the comparability protocol has been? For example, how many have been approved versus submitted? And have you seen success in reducing regulatory burden? You can turn on the mic, please. Yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been very successful. Um, it cuts the timeline for submission. Um, as to the numbers that have been approved, um, there is um, I would refer that to. I mean, there is a comparability protocol team. Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, so I can't tell. But as far as I can tell, um, it's been very good, and it actually gives more information to the FDA when it comes to the approval process for post-approval changes. Thank you. Question, but okay, to... you stay right there then. Yes. Um, question from online, please. Another question for David. Will the FDA publish a guidance for industry for post-approval changes for complex generics in the near future as the current guidances may not be applicable to these specific complex drug products? Um, 
for questions about guidance, I would refer you to the, um, is it, um, there's, um, um, there's um, a website on the FDA, I mean, that talks about guidances that are in line to be um, um, released. Um, so I wouldn't be able to give you um, a specific answer as to, yeah. But um, I would also use this opportunity to say that um, if you have any questions or if you have any doubts with the submission for these complex generic products, um, controlled correspondences are your friends. You can submit controlled correspondences and then you receive um, uh, confirmation from the FDA on what to submit or the filing category that is needed. Thank you. And just for informational purposes, every year for the past four years or so, we've been holding a complex generics two-day conference in September. And we will be working on doing one this year as well. If you go to SBIA website, business cards over there, you will see all the webcasts from the past few years of complex generic drugs. It's called uh, advanced, Advancing Generic Drug Development in the Past Few Years. So please uh, take advantage of that wealth of resources that we do have already available. Thank you. Uh, question in house, please. Hello again. Um, this is kind of related to the last question, but a little more specific. Um, does FDA intend to update the changes guidance or any of them to address, for example, the question that you posed several times of number of batches <clears throat> and things such as that, which are somewhat addressed in SUPAC, um, but obviously that's a very old <coughs> guidance. Um, as I already said, um, guidance is, um, has to do with, I think, policy and then um, OPPQ, I think. Um, um, so I wouldn't, but what I would say as a CMC reviewer and for post-approval changes is that control correspondences with such questions are the best way to go. And then based on FDA's um, current thinking, we respond to those. It actually even helps to gather more information if there is any update as to what to put in and then the way forward. So again, um, uh, I wouldn't be able to give you a specific answer, but control correspondence are the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a second question in house? So this is a in general question. Uh, I think it's a good panel for impurity questions. So uh, I notice a lot of times you'll see ICH guideline when you calculate the limit is one thing and USP is another. And then you go to the FDA's guidance for lack of proper justification for impurities in one of the footnotes and send there, you have to use the worst case, right? Uh, if it's ICH or USP, right? So I'm just wondering, is the, is the FDA um, planning on having some sort of meetings or correlation with the USP to try to align the specifications with the compendia? Um, you know, so, so there's not inconsistencies because I can imagine that it would reduce the number of post-approval supplements. Um, just, just a thought. Uh, I mean, I can start and then my colleagues can chime in. Uh, this is a great question. And unfortunately, I'm not able to answer it right now. Uh, uh, so I, I'll just leave it at that. No more comments? So the USP is, uh, you know, uh, is a gold standard for you know all these uh, you know limits for all these impurities. Um, um, so of course that is the uh, a minimum requirement, you know, uh, when you want to uh, control some impurities. But uh, also if there is some specific issues are there on the you know um, on the impurities, then um, we would uh, follow the you know ICH uh, guidelines. For example. Um, uh, any until um, uh, any unspecified impurities, the ICH uh, you know uh, guideline says that you know it is zero point one zero percent. So we just follow that limit uh, as a you know, as a standard impurity control uh, for the any unspecified impurities. So of course the USP also we uh, take into consideration, but when it comes to uh, controlling uh, certain specific impurities, we also take into consideration of ICH guidance too. Thank you. Let's take a question online, please. 
Question for Asset. For particulate matter for suspensions, you mentioned to check for particle size distribution changes over stability. Since the product inherently contains particles, are we exempt from testing for visible particulates in the drug product as a release testing? So I would not say that applicants are exempt. Uh, USP chapter 790 uh, and then the general chapter 1790 provides uh, certain strategies for those type of dosage forms uh, to test for particulate matter. Uh, the example that I provided uh, in my presentation is for intrinsic particulate matter. That means uh, how the interaction of the, uh, the particles, the EPI interacting with the environment, the surrounding, and the container closure system, and if that indicates any product instability. For extrinsic particulate matter, uh, I think USP 1790 has certain recommendations. And if uh, there are compelling challenges uh, to fulfill particulate matter requirement. And so that could be a good question for a control correspondence for us to see beforehand. Thank you. In-house question, please. Um, this question is for David. Uh, when it comes to like post-approval change management control protocols, uh, especially for multiple products, which are using like similar uh, container closures, like we're using the same stopper, can there be like a tool where we can use like a group submission instead of making like separate submissions for each of the products? Yes, group submissions are allowed in, um, and it has to be stated as long as your um, comparability protocol is approved. You can state as part of those um, the submission that if this is approved, maybe it's going to be um, a lower submit uh, a lower filing category for um, some products as long as your test and every uh, conditions that you specify in the uh, comparability protocols are reviewed and approved then a group submission can be done okay. there are instances where group submissions have been done for a lot of uh, um, let's say for like stoppers or the same container closure okay. for the other products Okay, but that has to be submitted through like um, a normal ECDD, not like to seed or next gen or something. Um, can you repeat what you said? That can only be submitted through like normal uh, ESG gateway, not through like a seed or next gen portal, right? Yes. Um, yeah, group submissions can be made through the um, ECTD. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. Online question, please. Question for Kumaran. Does the API manufacturer need to submit risk assessment documents to the agency? Actually, um, they don't have to submit the risk assessment uh, documents to the, uh, you know, uh, to the, in the DMF submission, um, but it should be available uh, whenever it is needed, uh, it should be available at the site uh, for the evaluation. Next online question, please. Thank you. Another question for Asif. For a freeze thaw study, if the RLD label doesn't mention do not freeze, but the generic product fails any CQA on a three freeze thaw cycle, but okay for one or two cycle, uh, does the generic product label need any special note? Is that acceptable or do we need to test the RLD and show that the RLD has the same issues? Uh, I think that's a little bit of a specific question uh, without knowing the details and the data for that particular product, uh, it would be a little difficult to answer. Uh, so my recommendation again, uh, if the questioner has a specific case in mind, uh, so that could be uh, submitted via control correspondence because that uh, needs to be looked at what's going on in terms of product quality. Uh, and if the change, if the labeling has to mention certain uh, instruction in, in terms of do not freeze, for example. So that would be a deviation from the RLD labeling. So that's a multi-pronged question. Uh, and I think it is best to be addressed via control. Thank you. Can I, can I also address um, um, the last question about the group sure. submission for comparability sure. protocol. Um, I'd also like to state that, yes, group submissions can be 
I mean, it can be submitted to the FDA, but it has to be approved as a group submission before it can continue. And as usual, one of the um, conditions for group submissions to be as, uh, 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 accepted or approved is that the same piece of information should be submitted for all the groups involved. So once that is met, yes, you can propose a group submission, and then it's up, once it's approved by the FDA, it can be reviewed as such. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. I think that particular inquirer is out of the room, but thank you for that answer. <laughs> It will it will be on record. Thank you. Online um, question, please. Okay, another question for David. Can an applicant submit a controlled correspondence to seek clarity on post-approval change data requirements while the original ANDA is still under review? Can you repeat the question again? Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Let's, um, let's wait one second while the drilling stops. <laughs> Not exactly the music we're looking for. Okay, okay let's try again, please. Okay. Can an applicant submit a controlled correspondence to seek clarity on post-approval change data while requirements, or change data while the original ANDA is still under review? Did you hear the entire thing? Yes, I did. Uh, and the answer is yes, but um, as part of the um, submission for the controlled correspondence, the applicant has to state that the submission is currently under review and then you state the changes that you or the clarification that you you are seeking thank you Okay, next okay, question, please. More online question. Okay, for Asif, does your presentation contents apply to ODIC preparation also? Uh, could you please repeat? Does your presentation contents apply to ODIC preparation also? OTIC, yeah. So yeah, in, in general, there are similarities between OTIC and ophthalmic. This particular guidance and my presentation is specifically for topical ophthalmics. So it should be taken as only for topical ophthalmics. Thank you. Any more online? Yeah, one more question for David. If you, if you could try to sure. speak a little louder than the drill, it would be OK. <laughs> when multiple related changes have different recommended reporting categories, should the submission adhere to the most restrictive category as suggested by CEDAR? The answer is yes is the most restrictive um, filing category that carries the day at the end of the day for multiple related changes. Thank you. How are we doing? Any more online questions? No? Any in-house questions? Go in once, twice. Okay, let's thank our panelists and our speakers. And we will break for lunch now and uh, resume at 1.30, please. Check out the box launches downstairs if you so, are so inclined. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for coming back after lunch. It's after lunch, the afternoon of the second day. So let's put a little bit more effort into it and keeping awake and, and making it to the end of the day. And it is my pleasure to in introduce our next sequence of speakers and that um, for the next session that's coming up. And uh, the first presentation within the sequence is Anders Submissions, Risk-Based Extractable and Leachable Quality Information. And that presentation will be shared by Dr. Chris Patar, Senior Pharmaceutical Quality Assessor within the Division of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment 1, Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment, OPQ, and Dr. Jin Shu, Senior Pharmaceutical Quality Assessor from DPQA9, from OPQA2 at OPQ. The second presentation will be facility assessment for pre-marketing applications. That will be shared by Dr. Derek Smith, who is the Deputy Director for the Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment within OPQ, and Dr. Raki Shah, Associate Director of the Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment, OPQ. And then the third presentation within this sequence will be emergency, not emergency, emerging technology program and advanced manufacturing technologies designation program, uh, which asks the question, which advanced manufacturing program is for me, right for me? And that will be given by Dr. Elissa Nickham, Senior Regulatory Health Project Manager from DRBPM4 within OPRO within OPQ. So please let us start this first session off with our first speaker, Dr. Patel. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kshetish Patkar. I am uh, in Office of, uh, office of uh, Pharmaceutical Quality, and uh, me and my uh, colleague, Dr. Jin Shu, today will present um, our, uh, our talk. This talk is about uh, assessment of extractable leachables information regarding uh, manufacturing uh, process equipment as well as container closure system that is submitted in ENDAS. So this is the presentation outline. Uh, I will briefly introduce the topic of extractables and leachables. I'll talk about briefly what extractables and leachables are. Then I'll briefly talk about various safety concern thresholds that, uh, that we typically use, an applicant should use to assess the safety of the leachables from equipment or container closure system. Then I will talk about how we assess extractable leachables uh, information in ANDA for the manufacturing equipment and uh, Dr. Shu will talk about extractable leachables from container closure systems. So just to uh, talk briefly about extractables and leachables, extractables are the chemical compounds or entities that are released from the surface areas of either process equipment or containers uh, in, into an extraction solvent uh, under laboratory conditions. Typically, these extraction conditions are exaggerated uh, conditions. Um, that means they are a little harsher than the typical process parameters or process conditions and um, that uh, you typically have for uh, uh, any process like filtration, filling, what have you. Whereas leachables are the chemical entities that are released from the surfaces into the drug product under normal uh, operations, like during the manufacturing process and over the shelf life of the drug product. Uh, a, lot of a lot of good information about how to conduct uh, successful extractable and leachable studies is provided in uh, many publications, such as USB chapter 1663 talks about how to conduct extractable studies. Chapter 1664 talks about design and conduct how to conduct leachable studies. There are also technical uh, documents available, PQRI publications available that talk about in detail extractable leachables from manufacturing equipment 
or container closure systems, safety control, or safety um, thresholds, etc. So applicants should use all these publications uh, when they are assessing their legibles in their drug products. These are uh, some of the safety concern thresholds for different routes of administration that applicants should consider when they actually calculate analytical evaluation thresholds and assess the safety of the leachables. Uh, most of the routes that are uh, for the chronic treatment, uh, the safety concern threshold is typically 1.5 micrograms per day. For the non-chronic ones, it's five micrograms per day. For the ophthalmic topical products, typical qualification threshold is 20 ppm. Uh, there are some routes of administration that are considered to be very high risk, such as epidural. And for those, the safety concern threshold could be even lower. And if applicants have any doubts about which safety concern threshold to use for such scenarios, they could uh, contact agency via control correspondence. So I'll just briefly talk about how uh, we assess extractable legible information submitted in ANDA, uh, particularly for manufacturing equipment. What we typically uh, assess are the study protocols, analytical procedures, data. So we check if the study studies are conducted for all the relevant surfaces that come in direct contact with the, uh, with the bulk solution. We also look at if extraction conditions are relevant, appropriate for extractable studies. Uh, we also look at if worst case scenarios um, are typically considered for extractables as well as legible studies. For the analytical procedures, we look at if the procedures are fit for purpose, if uh, they are able to detect the potential extractables or legibles, if the reference standards used for these studies are adequate or appropriate, relevant, and then we also uh, look for any method qualification reports provided for these studies, for these uh, analytical procedures. Uh, we also expect to see data uh, in that we see, uh, we, we, we typically expect to see if the extractables and legible compounds are individually identified and quanti quantified. And this is the kind of uh, information that's typically uh, we see uh, a lot of applicants do not provide. We also look at mitigation of extractables if they were found above analytical evaluation thresholds. And this mitigation uh, could include engineering controls such as washing um, the filters or tubing with uh, solvents or bulk solution or um, if there are any legible studies provided for the drug products for these uh, extractables. For the legible studies, uh, if there are any compounds found above the AAT in the final drug product, then we look for how these uh, compound risk is uh, addressed, whether uh, there is a safety assessment provided for these compounds, or whether um, applicant, again, uh, has proposed any engineering controls. If the engineering controls are proposed, we would like to see a data to justify that these controls have worked. That means um, you may have to carry out legible studies after the controls have been implemented. So for example, if you are uh, proposing to wash your filters by say 1,000 liters, I mean just making it up, of um, say water or, or bulk solution, then we expect to see that legible studies are carried out after again, and then now they sh show that there are legibles, uh, that's, those were above AAT before, are now uh, below AAT, or they are not there, or could not be detected. Um, I'll also talk about this aspect of how the data is provided typically in the ANDA applications. So we observe that um, currently the extractable legible inf information typically for the equipment is, is kind of scattered uh, throughout different modules and it's uh, kind of tedious and difficult sometimes to even find the information. 
and sometimes the information could be missed if it is not uh, easily accessible. So what we are recommending to the industry is that they, they provide a structured summary uh, of the extractable leachables studies that they have carried out in addition to the actual reports. That, is, that means the, the protocols and the data. Uh, this summary can be submitted in a, in a structured format um, where typically you would use um, um, product attributes and, and the process variables next to the relevant, uh, say, parameters that were considered for the studies. And I'll talk about uh, how, it, how it can look like in the next slide. So this is an example of a structured summary. Uh, it, it can be an Excel sheet with, um, with different tabs, uh, if you can see at the bottom. And you can see this, uh, the, the uh, tab number one could be the overview of the, the, the drug product with application ID number, um, what the drug substance is, what's the commercial strength, or the lowest strength um, for the commercial bat size, maximum daily dose, what's the pH, because all of these are very uh, relevant to the actual studies. So um, if the formulation contains organic solvents, what organic solvents are there, how much, uh, whether it's a chronic uh, treatment or non-chronic treatment, which is useful to determine correct SCT. Then you could have the equipment tab where you have various columns. Column number A would be a description column. Um, you can have the information about the process parameters. So what equipment is used, whether it's filter, tubing, bag, manufacturer, catalog number, surface area uh, that's in contact with the bulk solution, maximum duration of contact, what the temperature for that particular you know, operation is. So for example, filtration is carried out at say uh, four degrees. That's very relevant because then the, the the, the potential for leachables is, is lower if the, if the uh, uh, filtration is carried out at low temperatures, and vice versa. Also, if there is any flushing that is proposed, and then along with that, you have extractable study report uh, summary where what have you used as uh, a surrogate for these process parameters in your extraction, and then largest extractable uh, identified um, its name, description, et cetera. And then similar information can be in the third tab for leachables. Again, you can answer some of these questions or you can actually provide the numbers. So it's up to the uh, applicant. But this is the type of uh, structural summary that, that we are sort of envisioning that if we could get it, um, it our life will be a little easier. So what is the advantage of providing this summary of extractable leachable studies is that we can identify if there are any deficiencies in the studies right away. So then you, we don't have to go through the reports uh, you know, and dig through the information. It will also reduce the amount of uh, number of information requests for some, something that we couldn't find, but it, it may be there. And it also, it's very useful for a data-driven uh, evaluation of uh, extractable legible information from application to application. And we are recommending that this structured summary be provided in regional information section 3.2.R and preferably in uh, Excel format. So I have a question for the audience. In what module um, of the application the structured summary should be provided? Yep, you got it right. So thank you for paying attention, and um, <laughs> Doc <laughs> and Dr. Shu will present uh, about extractive leachables from container chloro system. Thank you, Chris. Um, so let's switch gears to extractable and invisible from container closure system, CCS. Let's talk about the design of extractable study first. So before you do anything, um, you may want to talk to the manufacturers of the CCS. Uh, ask them if they have performed any extractable study already. 
uh, on the CCS they, they are uh, sending to you and ask them what are the materials of constructions of the CCS, any information available from the literature, and look into your own lab to ask your own people if they have performed any extractable study on the same CCS or CCS at, that has similar components. The selection of solvents and extraction conditions is always very, very critical. It's one of the most critical components of the extractable study. And uh, USP 1663 has a very good and detailed discussion on the selection of solvents and extraction uh, conditions. And I'm not going to repeat here. You can always go to read that chapter. Um, it, it is very informative. Just like the selection of solvents and extraction conditions, analytical uh, method is another critical component of the extraction study uh, for the reason that you need a method to identify and quantify the, extract the extractables. When the method is properly developed and qualified, the very same method could be used later on for extractable studies which is the next topic, design of literable studies. The study conditions are typically the same as the formal study DP studies, meaning that you will put three badges on accelerated and long-term stability studies, and you will test literables uh, on these three badges on multiple time points. And the reason to test multiple time points is to inform the training of legibles. And you, you would expect that towards the end of uh, shell life, the level of extractables will be level off. Just like extractable studies, analytical method is very, very critical. The method should be validated so that it is capable of identifying and quantifying the legibles above AET. Uh, the method validation is actually nowadays very uh, standard according to USB 1225. You can go there and take a look. But there's one thing I want to bring to your attention is the limit of quantitation LOQ, which is very, very critical. You want to validate LOQ to the level that is below AET so that you can quantify a, uh, any legibles that are observed above AET. The calculation of AET uh, is also uh, published in USP 1664. It is derived from maximum daily dose and safety, and safety concern threshold, which Chris has presented to you. And if you are not clear about what MDD should be for your product and the SCD to use, you are welcome to submit a control correspondence to OGD for consultation. And I want to remind you that the inclusion of an uncertain factor is important. To account for the uncertainty of the analytical matter, a factor of 0.5 multiplied by 0.5 or dividing by 2 is quite common. And this factor is actually dependent on the method. It could be different. Okay. When you see any legibles that are above AET, then you are required to identify the chemical structures as well as perform the toxicological assessment. And when you submit your application, you do need to submit both, not only the chemical structures, but also the toxicological assessment so that we can review your application. Another thing I want to bring your attention is the correlation between extractable and legible. And this correlation is beneficial to you as the applicant of any application because this correlation allows for the control of legibles upstream at the QC stage of CCS or manufacturing equipment. Uh, for example, if you see the legibles are approaching the tox level towards the end of product shelf life, you know that risk is higher. In that case, one of the mitigation strategy is to control the CCS at the QC stage 
meaning that you test the extractable of CCS when you receive a lot of CCS and determine and project from that correlation, you can project what the least of level will be in the product and decide if you want to accept that lot of CCS for manufacturing or you want to reject it. Okay. The correlation will also uh, inform post-approval changes. So it's a good stuff that when you want to make a change to your CCS, you can actually rely upon this correlation to project what would be the legible of the CCS with the change. And that way you minimize the risk of the CCS with the changes. Developing a drug product based on a risk based a risk based approach is always good to do. And um, extractability evaluation is no exception. Uh, first, you want to look at prior knowledge. You may have already have used the same CCS for a similar product or different product. By similar, by similar product, I mean that you could have used the same CCS for the product of different strength, for example, and you might be able to use the data from that product to support the new product that you're developing with a different strength, given that provided that the vehicle is the same. You may also use data from a different product packaged in the same CCS to support an application uh, under development that use the same CCS, but the formulation could be different. In that case, you won't be careful though, you, because you want to compare the leaching propensity of the two different products, lot of nutrition and maximum daily dose of these two products. And the reason for that is that you do not want the new product to have a higher level of leachables compared to the one that has been developed and approved. There are some routes that are considered uh, not as risk, low risk, for example, oral route. When I say lower risk, it doesn't mean that it is no risk. Um, we know that if we eat wrong stuff, we get into trouble. So the oral route still have risk, okay? You may able to develop a product without performing extractable eligible study for oral drug by referencing by referencing 21 CFR 174 to 86, the integrate full additive regulations. If the following conditions are met, if the following conditions are met, number one, materials of construction should be the same as those specified in the regulation. Use conditions should be the same as those, or the same or less stringent uh, compared to those specified in the regulation. For example, some material can be used to package alcoholic beverages and if you have a product that is a very simple um, aqueous solution or suspension, then you should be fine because we know that uh, your product will not be leaching more compounds from the CCS or equipment compared to alcoholic beverages. The CCS should also be tested according to the regula regulations using the same method, meeting the specification specified in the regulation. And another point which is tricky is how do you compare a drug to a food? As an example, I gave to you earlier, some materials can be used to package alcoholic uh, beverage. And if your drug is a simple aqueous solution or suspension, then that is straightforward, knowing that your drug will not leach more compounds from the CCS compared to food. But if the drug is, but Vice versa may not be okay. So just to uh, just be careful, careful when you compare a drug product to a food product. So time for a uh, knowledge check. FDA published a guidance for industry container closure system for packaging human drugs and biologics, biologics in A, 1989, B, 1999, C, 2009, and D, 
The correct answer is 1999. The year this guidance published isn't really that critical. What I want to bring to your attention is this guidance. This guidance was, was published 25 years ago, but this guidance even today still uh, remains a valuable reference when you qualify your CCS for your drug product. With that, I'd like to pass the podium to uh, Derek Smith. Thanks, Jen. Um, so uh, switching gears a little bit here, uh, we're, we're going to give you an update on the, uh, the facility assessments uh, ongoing in, in OPQ um, from respect to the GDU for three updates, as well as our efforts uh, on inspections and alternative tools. So when we conduct a, a facility risk assessment, uh, we're looking at high level areas, um, you know, within the application. So we're looking at the product attributes, how the product's being manufactured, uh, is, the, is there data at scale or is there extensive scale up that's being proposed? Um, we're looking at the manufacturing complexity of the unit operations, how the applicant has uh, provided data to demonstrate that they understand the state of control. Um, and, and we're looking also in terms of uh, cross-contamination to the extractable leachables was a good kind of connection to this talk. Um, uh, the extractable leachables possibly from the process as Chris talked about. Um, reported deviations, so we're looking back at those, those facilities, what's, what's going on with the facility? Are there reported deviations? Are they related uh, to the product that's being manufactured? Um, and also any, any issues that were encountered during the development uh, of the product. Um, and one of the key things that we're also looking at is the quality surveillance information. So bringing in other information and other sources uh, from uh, the Office of Quality Surveillance and OPQ. Uh, so how do we make that risk-based decision? So uh, we're first looking at that prior inspection history. Uh, so we're looking at whether it's a new facility, a new building in, in a facility that we have history with, or a new manufacturing line uh, within a building. Um, we're looking at prior experience with that similar manufacturing process. Um, so does the company have experience with uh, aseptic manufacturing? Does the, the, does the company have process, uh, experience with uh, modified release dosage forms, things like that. Um, and then we're also looking at what information we have from other regulatory agencies. So especially from the, uh, our partners uh, in EMA and MHRA under the uh, mutual recognition agreement, we're looking at the, that information uh, to see what can be leveraged and what we know about the site from that to, to, to then make a determination on how we'll uh, evaluate the facility. Um, we'll look at CGMP issues relevant to the application product. Um, so obviously if the site makes sterile and non-sterile drugs and the site's having issue manufacturing non-sterile drugs, but not sterile or vice versa, we'll, we'll factor that into the, the assessment. Um, specific product and process risk, so OPQ conducts a risk-based assessment. Uh, with, uh, you know, the drug product disciplines, the drug substance disciplines, and the manufacturing assessors, and the team will come together and, and understand the product and process risks and see if we should cover up, uh, you know, cover those uh, on an inspection or through a, a different evaluation. Um, and then obviously when we look at, at supplements, we're looking at are there significant process changes either at a facility or for the product itself. So how do we make this assessment? Uh, so we look at, look at all the risk factors I just talked step is to then say, well, okay, maybe we want to do an inspection, but are there other factors that we can consider to then, uh, rather than do an inspection on site, request records from the facility and then, then evaluate the facility through an alternative tool. Um, and so essentially, oops, sorry, quick click too many times. Um, so essentially what, what we wind up doing is we go through this process, do we need to do an inspection? Do we have other information that can mitigate the need for that inspection? Um, and, it, and that can either occur through a records request, uh, through a voluntary remote interactive evaluation, um, or, or uh, obviously an, an inspection. Um, and then once we use that alternative tool, we'll then assess whether the information that's provided back mitigates the risk that we identified. If those do not identify the risks, we can either proceed to an on-site inspection or we may proceed if deficiencies are identified to take a complete response action based on an alternative evaluation of the facility. Um, so as we're doing this, whether it's an inspection or an alternative evaluation, we're, we're looking at the evaluation in the context of the, the compliance program 7346832 for pre-approval inspections. So we're evaluating the facility in the context of objective one, are they ready for commercial manufacturing? Objective two, is, are the operations at the facility consistent with what's in the application in terms of the manufacturing process, the formulation, the control strategy. 
Uh, we're then also looking for data integrity, right? So the application, one of the foundations of our review is that we're trusting what you're giving us um, in the application while we're conducting the review. Uh, and so on inspection, we're then validating through the, through the inspection, the laboratory controls or possibly through remote regulatory assessments, whether there is concerns about the integrity of the data that we're looking at to then inform our, our review. Um, and then the fourth objective that was added uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the most recent update to the compliance program is the commitment to uh, quality and pharmaceutical development. Uh, so that's very similar to what you've seen in the surveillance program and the quality, uh, the quality and maturity indicators. And so we're looking really from a pre-approval perspective, what's the culture at the facility in, in developing and, 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 and supporting product development for new products as they, as they bring on new products. They, they kind of identify the risks uh, associated as facilities continue to build and build and build their product portfolio. Um, so when we do inspections, just some quick tips, um, you know, Make sure that you're, you and your partners, because a lot I know a lot of folks are also um, uh, working with CMO. Make sure you, your facilities and your and your contract manufacturers are continuing to operate with a state of control, uh, following the regulations and policies outlined, uh, you know, in in two elevens and and the guidances and the inspection guidances. Uh, really stay up to date on on what what's going on in the facility. Are there trends? Are there are, are there are there issues that are that are that are, that are going to flag uh, to the FDA? during an inspection that will then want to want to dig further into to see if you're following up and investigating, right? It's not just, um, you know, finding the failure and fixing the failure. It's then also preventing that next failure. Um, and so um, always document, 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 right? Just because you did something and you tell me you did it, you're gonna have to prove it to me while I'm on the site. Um, uh, and then, uh, and, and, and sort of in line with that, 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 that corrective action, the trend really, you know, monitoring the product life cycle and looking what's going on, you know, uh, you know, from don't, you know, don't, Kind of dis 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 uh, avoid or, or kind of disavow a, a, product, a quality defect report from from a, a consumer complaint or something like that. Really dig in and see if if those those complaints that you're getting are uh, potentially a, a signal that needs to, that, that that something's going on with the process and needs to be updated. Um, very similar to that uh, the the point on objective four in the pre-approval program that robust pharmaceutical quality system uh, that's very mature and that's staying in front of issues rather than reacting to issues. Um, so the other aspect of our facility assessment is the alternative tools, right? So the main uh, one that folks probably are familiar with from the pandemic are the ro remote uh, regulatory assessments. And so um, what you found during the pandemic, we have now implemented um, as a part of our routine assessment process. Um, so, and, and so starting in October of last year, uh, we in OPQ are actually now leading the 704A4s for pre-approval inspections. So during the pandemic, uh, most often uh, the Office of Regulatory Affairs was issuing the records request and, and we were collaborating with them on the assessment of, of the facility for the applications. Um, now, um, we are now leading those, so tying directly to the application review, so we feel that's gonna bring in a nice strong synergy between the application review uh, and the facility evaluation. Um, to date, uh, we've uh, we've initiated over 20 RRAs, um, and and so most have have so far led to approval recommendations. So we're really hoping that um, as a part of this, we are uh, mitigating the need to do on-site inspections where feasible, where there is lower risk, um, and really conserving the agency's resources uh, from an inspection standpoint, and really it's really targeting the higher risk facilities. Um, and so one of the things that we haven't done uh, too much uh, in great volume is, is look is the uh, remote interactive evaluation. So we're, we're continuing to look for opportunities to explore that voluntary remote interactive evaluation experience, um, leveraging what we're learning from, from, from various ongoing initiatives. Um, so some tips for the remote regulatory assessments. Um, treat the records requests like you're responding to requests during inspections, right? I mean, this, this, this is basically our way of inspecting the facility but not doing an inspection. Um, Provide clear, accurate records and explain the context of the information provided. Uh, it's really critical that you know we may ask a question. If you're unsure of the interpretation, really you know, you know make sure that you're being clear. I'm giving to, I'm I'm giving to you to this in response to this, and here's why I'm giving it to you, and here's what it means, uh, so that that it kind of prevents the back and forth or, or doesn't open up questions during the the assessment that might lead to concerns from the agency uh, related to what we're seeing. Um, and make sure that your CMOs are prepared for the, for application specific requests, right? Uh, you know, you know, one of one of the things that we sometimes see, even on pre-approval inspections, is we'll show up, and the company will say, "I didn't know I was named in the application." Uh, so, so we haven't necessarily seen that on the remote regulatory assessment side, but um, you know, just make sure that they're prepared and and, and they understand, um, you know, that the the request is in support of the application, and how critical that is, especially you know the goal dates. They may not know the goal dates, things like that. 
Um, and so some of the resources, just to, just to, to, just to flag that have been that, that have been issued recently. Uh, so we've issued the alternative tools guidance uh, in September 2023. Um, the remote interactive evaluations guidance was updated updated in October 2023. That was the guidance that you guys are probably familiar with uh, during the pandemic. Um, and then and then we've also issued the conducting remote regulatory assessments to questions and answers draft guidance uh, in January 2024. So there's a lot of resources out there. Um, and that's why I'm not going into too much detail uh, because these are great uh, guidances to sort of what to expect uh, while, while these, uh, what, well, as we proceed to these remote regulatory assessments. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Rocky uh, to cover the good for three. It's always hard to follow Derek, but I hope you guys are awake because I have really hard questions at the end. So I'm going to talk about some of the GADUFA 3 related updates, uh, especially focusing on facility related updates. I and Derek come from the same office, Office of uh, Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment, and we review NDA, ANDA, BLA for manufacturing and facilities. So you saw a lot of what we do on site in terms of inspection related documents, but what uh, changes we made uh, from submission perspective so that uh, you can get a hang of it. Be uh, this happened la like 2022, so we already have a year worth of experience on all these changes. So I'm gonna just touch very briefly on that. So as you can imagine, um, GADUFA 1, 2, and 3, we are making improvements so that we can enhance the assessment, we can enhance first cycle approval. That's that's the basic goal. Uh, and uh, with that, keep that in mind, uh, because we want to make sure that we facilitate timely access to patients. Now, I'm just going to talk about three updates which are facility related uh, and what we have done so far. Uh, there are lots of other GADUFA related updates that you heard in different sessions. So uh, the, the PFC or pre-submission facility correspondence, uh, I'll abbreviate them a lot in my presentation. So PFC, um, it was authorized, uh, it was part in GADUFA 2, but we have made some updates in GADUFA 3. So I'll just go over those changes that we made. Uh, then uh, the reclassification request from major to minor, this is a new, uh, thing in GADUFA 3, and we have already seen a uh, large number of applications coming in this category. And then uh, the third one is submission with uh, the facility not ready. And the, uh, we have this is also new in GADUFA 3, but uh, so far we don't we haven't seen um, much applications coming in this category. So for PFC, um, you can see I've compared GADUFA 2 versus GADUFA 3, so it's easier to understand uh, what has really changed. So in GADUFA 2, uh, we had needed all ECTD sections for CMC to be submitted, um, as well as the bio, bio balance report was needed. So this to a requirement, and then uh, we would not accept if there were any changes with your P PFC versus uh, final ANDA submission. I hope you all are familiar with PFC. So PFC is pre-facility correspondence comes two months prior to ANDA application, and uh, OPMA reviewers mainly take a look at it along with the filing review, of course, and we make sure that there are no uh, inspection which will be needed when the application comes in. And based on that, uh, we accept the PFC. And uh, so under GADUFA 2, there were no changes allowed. Now GADUFA 3, now uh, we made some changes because we heard industry voice. Uh, so now you can present to us limited ECTD information, but also keep in mind that we need information that we would need uh, to make sure that uh, we have enough information to make pre-approval inspection decision. And that's why I had Derek go before me, so you understand what is needed to make pre-approval decision. Um, Bioequivalence report is no longer needed, but you can always submit it. It's, it's always nice to have that. Then uh, the significant changes are not allowed between PFC and a ANDA. That means some minor changes are allowed, but the changes should not impact our decision on pre-approval inspection. Otherwise, PFC will become invalid. You, when you submit your original AND application, of course you submit with BE report. And that time we determine that, oh, we need inspection, we can, uh, then we don't, you don't get eight months cold date. So keep that in mind. 
So I have uh, one simple case study, uh, like where the PFC was submitted two months prior to uh, original ANDA submission. Now keep in mind, you cannot submit ANDA submission within those 60 days. Otherwise, PFC becomes invalid automatically. Don't don't worry about the dates too much. I have calculated. So say PFC was submitted on a day one. Um, you had provided adequate CMC facility information uh, so that we could assess whether pre-approval inspection is needed or regulatory uh, remote assessment is needed. We determined in OPMA that, oh no, we don't need any pre-approval inspection. We have adequate information from our facility database and from your submission that this uh, facilities, uh, this application facilities, there is no need of uh, inspection. There was no BE report submitted. The entire original uh, and application came after 60 days. Um, again, I've calculated the dates, so you don't have to worry about the dates here. Uh, we determined that there were no changes made uh, in support of manufacturing facility inspections. Uh, assessment, uh, there, as I said, there are minor changes allowed, but that shouldn't impact our ability to assess whether peer pre-approval was needed or not. And the report also did not reveal that we need any additional inspection. So in this case, we granted priority uh, status for the AD application. So it's, it gets eight months uh, goal date. Now, tips for submitting a PFC. So, as I said earlier, you know, submit it completely uh, uh, as much as information you can provide for making our facility assessment. The the more information it is, better it is for us. Uh, so, make sure that it's complete, it's accurate, because we have seen sometimes inaccuracies. You submit some facility in PFC, and then uh, ANDA comes in, and we contact the facility. They are not even do doing your function. So please make sure that you talk to your CMOs, as Derek mentioned, that they are doing the function that they are putting in the applications. Uh, the facility need to be ready for inspection. Uh, although we have determined that no inspection is needed, we can always change our decision during review. If we have more information from, uh, say, uh, say there is data integrity flag that a reviewer comes up with, then we would need to do inspection, right? So it, it doesn't need made, make you exempt from inspection, but uh, so facilities have to be ready uh, for inspection. And then uh, make sure that you're, you're not submitting earlier than 60 days. The original ANDA has to come after 60 days, otherwise PFC becomes invalid. And any significant changes, put it in cover letter, otherwise, uh, it's, it, it becomes a nightmare for reviewers to skim through what came in PFC compared with your original application. So make sure if there are significant changes that you highlight in uh, cover letter. Now, second thing I wanted to talk about major to minor. This is a new uh, thing in GEDUFA 3. So uh, this major to minor classification request comes after a CR letter goes to applicant like you guys. And then we, we get that uh, request. So that can be requested only if the major deficiency was facility related. So this is new in GEDUFA 3. So far, we have already seen a lot of application. I can tell you in 2023 fiscal year, we received almost 61 uh, major to minor classification request. Um, how many got denied, how many got approved, because we were also learning. So initially we saw that uh, applicants were not submitting it correctly. So facility should be the only major deficiency and it, it has to be through surveillance inspection. So Derek mentioned about pre-approval inspection. If you got a pre-approval inspection and uh, your facility def was deficient, we would not accept a major to minor reclassification. It has to be surveillance based and surveillance is uh, um, like OMQ, Office of Manufacturing Quality does the surveillance uh, OAI type of uh, assessment, and they have determined that the facility is now NAI or VAI, so there is no or voluntary action indicated. Uh, so you will have to submit that uh, information to FDA when you are submitting this major to minor request. Um, we will look at it, we will, OPMA gets involved and in making this determination. So we will look at it, whether a uh, facility is truly NAI or VAI, and your CR letter was a year old. It cannot be prior to that. Now we make, always we make exceptions when it's a drug shortage or public health emergency. So, uh, but as much as possible, we would like to have CR letters within one year, right? So make, make sure that you understand that and some of the other requirements that are listed here. 
again, there is a case study. Um, um, we are all in Bethesda, Rockville, so put Rockville manufacturing facility as uh, they got surveillance inspection. So now what we have done since Kedufa 3, we are making prominent for you guys to understand whether the facility was based on facility deficiency was based on surveillance inspection or pre-approval inspection. So you see the first word following surveillance inspection. Now um, this is a little bit old uh, boilerplate that I have put in here, but the new deficiency also will look very similar. So we'll have following surveillance inspection at your facility, blah blah blah, and uh, so you understand that your deficiency was surveillance related. Uh, the application got submitted, then the surveillance follow-up, surveillance inspection happened. We uh, OMQ, ORA determined that uh, we can downgrade uh, from OAI to BAI, your facility. So now you are ready to submit your M2M classification, right? So you submit it to us. You have to submit that your facility got downgraded. We look in uh, some other information also. So automatically, oh, your surveillance inspection is VAI. Um, if there is some other concerns, uh, procedural concerns from process or product, we may deny that. Uh, but so far, we have seen a great success. Uh, out of 61, I think only four were denied, and that was very early in the program. This year, uh, I was looking at FY24 numbers uh, already. We have 55 in-house. We already received 55 requests. Um, and now, I don't exactly have how many we have denied, but uh, I think so far only one, one has been denied. So, so it's a great success. Uh, this, this really helps industry move forward with their uh, product and product approval. Now, again, I'm not going to repeat it, but I already said tips for M2M, so you will have this slide. Uh, you make sure that uh, it's prominent in cover letter, this M2M request. It's only facility-based deficiency you had in your CR. So if you have other discipline deficiency and facility became VAI, please do not submit. Your, uh, your application, like your request will be rejected. It has to be only facility deficiency remaining in CR letter and it has to be only surveillance. The letter has to be only a year or within a year old, right, CR letter. So make sure that you understand because early on we got some CR uh, M2M request which were CR letter were issued much before a year. So we are not accepting those. Now third, uh, third new thing that happened in Kedufa 3 was facility not re uh, ready for inspection. So this is only applicable for original application. When you're submitting original application, if your facility is not ready for inspection, you can check mark on 356 edge form. That's how we get notification that, oh, this uh, application has a facility not ready for inspection. Automatically, you'll get 15 months goal date. Um, it won't be eight months, 10 months uh, prior, like we, we will be giving 10, uh, 15 months. But during that 15 months, you can submit amendment stating that now your facility became ready for inspection. And from the date that we receive uh, the amendment, goal date will be calculated, right? So uh, if it was priority, if you had PFC submitted, uh, then we will assign eight months of goal date. If uh, it's a standard application, we will assign 10 months of goal date. So again, um, there is another 15 month period that I'm not gonna discuss too much about, but say, suppose you don't submit as amendment until 15th day, uh, 15th month. Um, we automatically extend your goal date to 30 months now. We have commitment to uh, assess 90% of such applications. So in those uh, remaining 15 months, we will try to contact the facility if you don't submit as amendment because we may have to come for inspection. We have to have adequate time for inspection. So there are some nuances, but uh, fortunately I can say that so far we only had one application that was submitted under this category and uh, the applicant submitted within first 15 months uh, amendment say, saying that um, you know they are ready. And this could happen, you have um, dis natural disaster, you have to shut down the facility, you're not ready for inspection or something is happening and you, are, and you are ready with the rest of the submission. So that's why this was included in GIDUFA 3, but we hope applicants are using it to minimum extent. We don't want to see this because uh, we are not going to start assessing unless we, we see your amendment stating that facilities are ready for inspection. We are not going to 
even uh, starting to look at it substantially. Maybe we can, some, some disciplines might start looking at it, but at least OPMA cannot look into it because we, we do combine facility knowledge with our process knowledge and we do that kind of assessment. So, so application is just sitting in our BPMQ. So I hope that we, we don't have too many of this situation. But here is one case study. Again, it's a fake example. It's not the real example that I was talking about in earlier slide. But um, say Bethesda Pharmaceutical, they were not ready for inspection. Still, they submitted the application. And one facility came up. Uh, so we immediately gave 15 months goal date, right? But within those 15 months, on 14th month, the applicant submitted that now they are ready for inspection. Now we calculated goal date after that date. So they got 10 months because this was a sta uh, standard application. And I have some tips uh, very similar to what uh, Derek had. Uh, please make sure that you are listing all manufacturing sites. Manufacturing includes testing for us as per FDA, so all testing facilities should be noted down on 356 edge form as much as possible. Mark them for ready for inspection and have them ready for inspection. Sometimes we find that you have marked it on ready for inspection and we contact the facility or contact the applicant, they are not ready. So it becomes a problem, right? Then we have to withhold and you don't want to be in that situation. We really want to move forward with first cycle approval. Uh, your facilities should be in compliance with GMPs. Uh, operations should match because reviewers are, probably would go on inspection at from time to time, and we do look at uh, the operations are matching. And data integrity is a big thing. Make sure that your data is accurate. And of course, uh, I didn't talk about manufacturing unit operations, but OPA maybe do that assessment also. So we want to make sure that our entire manufacturing process is fit for purpose, right? And uh, we have control strategies in place. Uh, with that, I'm providing you, you with all the resources that are already there. We published some guidances and maps on some of the things that I talked. So please read. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us. But a lot of information is already on the on website or uh, in the letter. With that, I'll pass it on to Elisa. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for having me today. My name is Elisa Nickham and I'm a project manager in OPRO. Um, I've been with the agency quite some time. I've been a chemist for a while and I was a reviewer and now I'm a project manager, so I've worn a lot of hats. And today I'm gonna talk to you about the Emerging Technology Program and the Advanced Manufacturing Technology Designation Program, which is a mouthful, and I'm gonna try and use my acronyms correctly. Um, we'll see how that goes. So which program is right for me? The learning objectives today will be to be able to describe the programs, both the ETP and the AMTDP. List criteria of each program. There's some overlaps and there's some differences. And then to be able to apply to the program, so providing some information and helping you understand that process. So a quick poll question. I don't know that this was um, viewable by those in the virtual space, but maybe by a show of hands. Uh, let me know if you're familiar with either of the programs. Raise your hand. Okay, seeing a couple hands go up, that's great. Um, so we're probably gonna lose hands as we go here. I'm interested in applying to the ETP or AMTD, and maybe that answer will change at the end. <laughs> great, I see a hand up, awesome. And then you have applied. I'm gonna guess the answer is probably no. All right, oh, you have, excellent. I'll chat with you later. Okay, I'm gonna talk about ETP first. We'll start with the background. It was established in 2014, and if you can do math, I, I'm still you know, relatively good at that, I think. Um, we're celebrating an anniversary this year, so we are excited about that, um, 10 years with the program, and I've been the project manager for about a year and a half. It's a collaborative program where industry can meet with um, FDA, the ETP team, and it's for development and implementation of novel technologies prior to filing. And when I say novel, it's, it's kind of one of those things where maybe FDA doesn't have as much experience um, from you know, reviews or inspections yet. And to, with it, um, industry, be able to discuss, identify, and resolve potential technical and regulatory issues. Who is the ETP? 
we are the emerging technology team. And so we use ETP and ETT kind of interchangeably, um, the program and the team, the people that you're actually gonna be engaging with. It is a small team, um, between 20 and 30 people. I think right now we're at 28. We have a chair, his name is Joel Welsh. Our vice chair is Tom O'Connor, I'm the project manager. And representation from the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality is, is most of our, our membership, as well as Office of Compliance and Office of Regulatory Affairs. And we also pull in SMEs from time to time, people from maybe CDRH or CBER, um, or also within OPQ, folks who have um, specific experience on a topic, we bring them in. Talk to you about the criteria for ETP. So having the potential to improve product safety, identity, strength, quality, and purity. Um, and so it's including one or more of these elements um, subject to quality assessment for which the agency, again, has maybe limited review experience. So for product technology, we might be looking at dosage form or container closure systems. Manufacturing process might be design, scale up or life cycle approaches. And control strategy, maybe testing technology or process controls. How do you apply? We have a website, and I will provide a, a link in one of my last slides. And so there's a guidance document there. And initially, we asked that you develop a proposal for us. It's about five pages. We asked for it, kind of keep it short and sweet. Um, you know, and just talk about the novelty and the advancement of it. So it'll have a brief description of the proposal or proposed technology, um, you know, why it's novel and unique a description of how it could potentially um, improve the safety, identity, strength, or quality or purity, a summary of the development plan, and maybe some high level, um, what you think the roadblocks are gonna be for you. And these can be technical or regulatory. And then a timeline for a submission, which is not a requirement, but strongly encouraged. And then once you're accepted, um, you'll follow the Type C meeting format, and that would be a meeting package, and you'll have uh, your, your questions in there, and we will respond with written answers ahead of time and then have a meeting with you. So I just wanted to give you some metrics of the um, accepted proposals over time. You can see, again, we started in 2014, um, and just kind of increased over time. Word got out, and uh, you know, interest in, increased. And then of course, you know, we had a, a pandemic, so we lost a, a little bit of um, our momentum, but we've had a pretty, you know, consistent um, engagement over the past few years. And also, um, what's nice about ETT is it's not a one-time only thing. So you come to us with your initial set of questions and we answer them for you. And then, you know, maybe sometime down the road, you're at a next development milestone, you can reach back out to us. So we've had a lot of re-engagement with folks. And then just a quick breakdown of the, um, the topics that we've, we've generally received proposals on. Continuous manufacturing is obviously pretty big. Uh, I do expect over time that some of these other categories might increase, like distributed manufacturing. So now we'll pop over to AMTDP and give you a little bit of background. It was a $1.7 trillion spending bill. This was signed in December of 2022, and it was uh, fiscal year funding for 2023, addressed a range of domestic policy priorities. And under that spending bill is the Fedora Act, it's Food and Drug Omnibus Reform Act. And within that, there were several um, quality-related provisions, and it was both AMTD and also ETP was included in there as well. So specifically, the language of Section 3213 is for the Advanced Manufacturing Technologies Designation Program. And it was starting a new program, having a public meeting, which we had at about the 180-day mark of, it was last June. And it was a chance to get stakeholder feedback. Uh, there's a draft guidance that was published in December of last year, and then there was a comment period this spring. And so we are in the next steps with, with that. And then also in, I think a couple of years, there'll be a report to Congress based on the, our um, success with the program. Who is the AMTDP? So you maybe, um, you know, the reason I did ETT first, it's, it's gonna be the same people. And I think there's an opportunity here for engaging with ETT first 
and then once you're to that, that net, you've met the criteria of AMTD, you can apply there. And so it is um, both Cedar and Seber. We are aligned with CAT as well on this. And you might work with one of us independently or depending on your project or your proposal, you might be working with both of us. We'll talk to you about the criteria. Uh, so per the act, the um, kind of the big parts of this are reducing development time or increasing the supply of critical medicines. Let's see. And it's intended for more mature methods and technologies. So the idea is that you'll have more data at this point. And who can apply? The AMTD is open to companies that intend to include a novel technology as part of a regulatory submission, and this can be to both Cedar and Cber. Um, let's see if I have anything else I want to add here. So um, I'll expand on the criteria a little bit. It's a method of manufacturing or combination of me methods um, that incorpor incorporates a novel technology or uses an established technique in a novel way. So there's, there's a couple um, different ways to look at that there. And uh, like I said, reducing development time or increasing or maintaining the supply of a drug that is life supporting, life sustaining, of critical importance to providing healthcare or something that's on the drug shortage list. How do you apply? Again, we have a website and we have a draft guidance. And so there are like the, the three sort of um, big things that we want to see in your proposal are to explain the novelty so that it uses an established technology in a novel way or incorporates a new technology. Uh, that there's process improvement, reducing development time or um, supporting the supply of something that's on like the drug shortage list. And then the key part here and why this would, um, this more mature program is the model data. So data and information necessary to support the request and is specific to a particular class of drugs. Includes developmental data, including batch analysis generated using either a developmental candidate molecule or a model drug. So the benefits of both programs. A collaborative approach. Um, as I mentioned before, it might be an opportunity to start with ETT and then work your way over into um, you know, the AMTD process, or maybe you've started with CAT as well, if it's a biolog biological product. And you'll be engaging with the same team, the same members. And um, something we encourage, especially from the ETT side, if you've engaged with us before you're ready for a submission, when you do submit that application, you put in your cover letter that you've had ETT involvement. And so it really helps like our, my fellow project managers uh, identify you know, team members that can maybe support the review. And both of these, it's early interaction with FDA uh, prior to the submission process, timely advice and communication, and having uh, meetings with us, both written responses ahead of and then meetings. And so here's my page of resources for you, the Emerging Technology Program website, as well as a link to the guidance, the um, Advanced Manufacturing Technologies Designation Program web, uh, website with the draft guidance. Uh, you can look at the, the specific language from um, the bill there as well and uh, reference to that June 8th meeting that we had last year. So in summary, uh, both programs encourage and support the adoption of novel technologies. Both provide opportunities to gain agency feedback and they both have criteria for acceptance, some the same and some different. And there are guidance documents available for both to help you through the application process. So challenge question number one. What FDA center or centers are part of the Advanced Manufacturing Technologies Designation Program team? CDER, CVM, CDRH, CDER, and CBER. I'm hearing D in the audience, and that is correct. Yay! <laughs> it means I did my job. I, you know, it's really more on me than it is you all. <laughs> Challenge question two. When was the ETT established? I think I mentioned we had a little anniversary, and I'm hoping we can get a party at work. I know that uh, we're all busy, but it um, started in 2010, 2014, 2019, 
or start of this year. B, 2014, mm, oh yeah, you're right. Very good, thank you. <laughs> Okay, closing thought. We are definitely here to support you. I think it's it's an opportunity for FDA to learn alongside of you and to you know help you help you through the process and kind of you know hopefully see ahead a little bit. Um, you know we can help you maybe discover what some of those regulatory roadblocks are going to be. And so if you have questions, please reach out. I will tell you that both of those email addresses come to me. <laughs> so you will you will be speaking directly to me as the project manager. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Can you please come back up to the podium? So we are running a little late, but let's see how many questions we can accommodate before we break. We may have to take a few more minutes into the break if that's okay, if we have enough questions. And as we decide which is the best seat here for the camera, Okay, any in-house questions? Who was up first? Doesn't matter. I'll go to this one first, sure. the one closer to me, in-house. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for all the presentations today. Um, my question is for Dr. Shu. With regards to the design of the leachable studies with respect to testing during stability, um, is there a requirement to include multiple batches of packaging material? Thank you for your question. <clears throat> so yes, so the leachable study is typically performed during formal stability study using three batches, three product batches uh, under both long-term and uh, accelerated conditions. And to your question, do you require to have three different lots of component closure system, right? Yes. Ideal, yes. But we recognize we recognize that sometimes it's difficult right. to get three different lots of uh, CCS. So do your best. Okay, great. Thank you so sure. much. Thank you. Next in-house question, please. Hello. Thank you again for your presentations. Um, I had a question for Dr. Shaw. Uh, what should we put in the submission for an FNR? You you mentioned marking it on the 356H, but should we discuss it in the cover letter? And do you want to see it in any other module sections or? What's the so reference? The requirement is it should be marked in 356H form, uh, definitely. Uh, other than that, there is no other requirement, but if you can put it in module three, which particular testing facility or manufacturing facility, and if you can provide also information on when it will be ready, it, it helps. We don't take that uh, as official amendment to reset your goal date, but that always helps that, uh, for example, we had application that came with FNR, uh, but it had that we anticipate it to be ready around March or April. So we kept an eye and then they submitted amendment during that time. So uh, amendment is essential so that you reset your goal date. But uh, other than that, there are no requirements, but more information you provide, it's always better. Thank you. Thank you. Online question, please. We have a question for Dr. Chris Petkar. Can the agency confirm whether extractable detected above the analytical evaluation threshold, but once identified and evaluated as safe, i.e. well below the permitted daily exposure at the amount detected, does not need to be included in a leachable study? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, it depends uh, if you have provided a detailed safety assessment for extractables about AET. Uh, we recommend uh, such assessment provided for maybe one or two extractables. But if you have many extractables that are about analytical evaluation threshold, we recommend you actually carry out eligible studies and see if they are really present about AET in your final drug product. Okay, question in-house, please. Yes, sorry, for Dr. Xu again, please, um, as a follow-up um, with regards to the testing of leachables during stability. Um, I know you mentioned that it should be tested on multiple time points. Or, to be specific, do we follow the ICH time points, which is uh, every time point at, from zero to shelf life? 
if you can't, I'll be great. Yeah. But uh, we recognize that the stability study requires many, many points. Uh, for example, three, six, nine, twelve, and uh, you, you may not have to follow exactly the um, the uh, stability time points, but at least you need to do multiple points so that, as I said earlier, that you can that uh, testing at multiple points will help it inform the trending of digital studies. Thank you. Sure. Anyway, in house, no. Let's go online, please. Next question for Derek. What factors do you consider when deciding whether an inspection can be done using alternate methods? Thanks, yes, yeah, so as, we, as I discussed in the presentation, we're really looking at um, how uh, successful the facility has been in demonstrating uh, compliance, both from a, a general GMP perspective um, as well as on prior uh, uh, pre-approval inspections. And then it really depends on, um, you know, what's being proposed in the application. Is the area new? Is the building new? Is it a new operation? That, that, that That's highly complex. Um, yes, yeah, so it, it, it's a really, it's a, it depends answer, but it's more about the facility's history and experience and demonstrated um, history of compliance um, will, will, will generally potentially lead to the use of an alternative tool um, uh, you know, and, and otherwise we'll be knocking on your door. Thank you. Question in-house, please. This is for Rakhi Shah. So um, like based on the recent updated guideline of the PFC, it is not needed to submit the PE report as part of PFC. But um, it says that there are chances that when we submit the PE report in the ANDA, it could result that the inspection is needed. So what are those cases which raise this result? Is it like doing the study at totally different site or it's about the complexity or what? So B, uh, B uh, site evaluation is not under OPMA, but uh, I can tell you that the reasons that you cited could be uh, one of the reasons are if there are data problems or data trends that we see that always triggers and uh, facility ass assessment and that might result into evaluation right on site. So there are various reasons that B report could trigger uh, the inspection for the BE site, but it's evaluated by our counter office. So they, they take a look at it. We, OPMA is responsible for only manufacturing and testing for CMC. So we do not look into BE report and we do not make that call. Uh, but when BE reports are submitted, that goes to the, that office and they look at them. So, okay, so in continuous to that only, can I go or, okay. Yeah, so, sure. Yeah, so um, if I submit the BE report as part of PFC, then also the case remains same, right? Because when I sub if I submit the BE report as part of PFC, it is not going to be in the detailed review at that stage. That's like we, we do not have a requirement of review in BE report, but if you submit it as part of your PFC, um, <laughs> It, it's always helpful, right? We can look at it, the QOSI can look at it quickly and see, but there is no necessity that OFDA will evaluate those uh, during those two months period. It's it's a very short time yeah. to evaluate so many things. So our uh, the requirement is facility information should be submitted for manufacturing and testing, and that will be evaluated in those two months. And we will determine if we have all the information in, in house to determine inspection for uh, manufacturing facilities. V facilities has no such commitment in Gadufa, so I can't seem, oh. <laughs> I can't speak on their behalf. No idea. Thank you. Second, uh, thank you. Second uh, question in house, please. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your presentations. Um, my question relates to extractables. Can the agency elaborate on the expectation for method validation for extractable studies? and advice on how to perform the validation when you don't know what the extractable will be? So for, at least for the manufacturing process uh, related extractables, we don't expect full validation studies. You can provide um, 
method um, qualification report, or you can say that the method is fit for purpose is what we are looking for really. So uh, we are mostly interested in LOQ, LOD, and uh, if the method, if the if the technique is correct, right? For example, you know you're you're looking at inorganics or metal ions, then you have ICP or something like that. Or if you're looking for, say, volatile, volatile, then you're looking, you know, you're using GCMS. So the method should be fit for its purpose, and it should be sensitive as well as uh, it should be um, adequate. So that's we are not looking for a full validation, at least for the manufacturing process acceptables. So for Chaprata, I agree with what Corey has said. We follow the same methodology, fit for purpose, based on risk. But also remember that uh, uh, you also need to do legible study, right? So when you do legible study, you, don't, you need to qualify the method. At that stage, you may, you may need to fully validate the method for, for legible. And oftentimes, that the method used for extractable study is also the same as for legible study. So it depends on what you want to do. If you want to vary that earlier, that's for a benefit uh, to get it done earlier. But if you want to delay a little bit later for a little study, and as Chris said that, you know, fit for purpose for fit for purpose for a charitable study, that would be fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Question online, please. This question is for Alyssa. Reading the guidance documents, it seems that ETP requires or anticipates a drug application, whereas AMTDP does not, as AMTDP can use a model compound. Is that understanding correct? So if I understand the question correctly, um, ET, well, or let me try and cover, I think. ETP doesn't require an application to be submitted. It is strongly encouraged. Um, it also is, there's an opportunity for you to pair with someone who would want to do an application at some point. So we do see that the direction that you're going to take the, um, the technology. AMTDP, um, yes, a, a model drug is um, acceptable. Uh, so you wouldn't have to, but I think again, that expectation is there. Thank you. We do have a question in-house, please. Uh, my question is to Shitaj Bhatkar. Um, so in terms of like, if there is a change in an API manufacturer, even though we're using the same API, but we just changed the API manufacturer, or there's a slight change in the excipient from anhydrous to hydrous, do we still need to conduct any leachable studies or extractable studies in such cases? Or like an addendum is okay? If I understand your question correctly, you're talking about the change in the API? Yeah, uh, it, with respect to the drug product formulation, would this uh, would this mean that we need to reconduct any ENL studies? Right. Um, if the API is a solid that is dissolved in formulation and, you know, typically, say, like 5%, 10%, the API by themselves do not really have extraction power. But if your API is, say, castor oil or liquid, or your API is basically constitutes majority of the formulation, then um, maybe. But um, basically, we're looking for extractables from manufacturing equipment. So it's a equipment that is more important here. So as long as your equipment remains the same, probably not. OK, thank you. Thank you. Question from online, please. We have a question for Chris. Could you kindly specify the subsection or section of 32R, for example, 32R1, P1, 32R2, P2, uh, et cetera, where ENL data is to be submitted? It could be a section by itself in the 3.2.R. OK, we have time for one more online question, please. OK, a question for Rocky. Um, is there any time frame that an M2M must be submitted? Yes, within one year of your CR letter. So if you received CR letter, uh, we have to have M2M request submitted. Your CR letter cannot be one, more than one year old. Or, as I mentioned during my presentation, only in case of drug shortage and some other things, we do make exceptions. but. Otherwise, we expect within a year. <laughs> OK, thank you. We have one question in-house. 
Thank you. Um, Dr. Xu, can the agency please elaborate on the current expectations for setting the acceptance criteria for uh, leachables in the drug product specification? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> so, <laughs> she said so, this last. <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, we take a, a, a loose base approach, okay? And um, if you observe a legible that is close to a tox level towards the end of shelf life, uh, you may want to uh, have it in the specification. But having in a specification may or may not be the best control strategy because at the beginning of the batch, you don't you don't see legible because it takes time for the legible to come out from the CCS. So, if you see a legible that is approaching uh, the uh, tox level, the risk is considered high. You may want to take other approaches to mitigate the, the risk. For example, can you replace the CCS altogether, or can you do some um, pretreatment, for example, for equipment. Um, so that uh, you reduce the level legible in the product. Mm -hmm. So so there are different scenarios, kind of hard to uh, come up with a uh, yes or no answer in a way. So yeah, so based on risk and, and come up with the best approach and then submit the certification to us as to, to justify the, the approach you want to take. Okay. Thank you. Very helpful. Thanks sure. a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of this Q&A session. We will break now and resume at 3.05. Thank you so much to our panelists. Can you guys, if you're not in a hurry, can we meet over there for a photo op, please? And
Okay, everyone, we're back from our break. And this is our very last session of the day. So thank you for everyone who's with us in the room and online. You are true, true SBIA supporters. So we thank you so much. And especially for our speakers who are speaking in this last session as well. Okay, so for this session, we will have the first presentation is improving the sterility assurance application to the FDA. And the presenter will be Dr. John Arigo, Division Director of a Division of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment II within the Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment at OPQ. Following that, we will have the bacterial endotoxin specification points to consider, and that will be delivered by Dr. Erica Feiler, Unit Supervisor, Division of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment VI at OPMA OPQ. The next topic will be general overview of ANDA's labeling requirements for RX to OTC switched products. And this will be delivered by Sunny Payon, Labeling Project Manager, Division of Labeling Review within the Office of Regulatory Operations at OGD. And sharing that topic would be Bailey, Dr. Bailey Larson, Pharmacist, Patent and Exclusivity Team within the Division of Legal and Regulatory Support within the Office of Generic Drug Policy at OGD. And uh, the final presentation of the day will be regulatory reminders at the finish line. And this will be shared by Captain Vincent Sansone, who is the director of the Division of Project Management within the Office of Regulatory Operations at OGD. And also Dr. Rinku Patel, Program Management, Division of Legal and Regulatory Support within the Office of Generic Drug Policy. So let's please welcome our first speaker to the stage, and that, <laughs> that will be Dr. Arigo. All right, thank you so much. All right, so as she said, I'm John Arigo. I'm talking today about improving the sterility assurance application to the FDA. So the way I have this set up, let's give you a little background. I've asked managers, reviewers, a bunch of people in microbiology for the last 10 plus years what they see as the most common problems in applications. Then we all discussed and we thought, okay, these are, these are the big things, I'm gonna talk about them. We're gonna keep trying to hammer this home so we can improve the submissions. So the first thing, it might seem obvious, but I think this is worth it. Make it easy to read. So quick story, I like to ramble. When I left grad school, I ended up in a patent law firm. And one of the senior attorneys said to me, when you're trying to make a point, say what you want to say in the beginning, say it again in the middle, and then say it again at the end. Now that doesn't exactly apply here, but it's something I've never forgotten. And if you use a little bit of that tip, you're going to get the you're going to get your point across because remember a reviewer is sitting there and they're overwhelmed with all of this information so make it very clear so let me talk about this auto, like an autoclave an autoclave qualification for example look at the sentence i have written here autoclave x was qualified by performing three empty chamber heat distribution runs three worst case heat penetration biological indicator runs in 2016 the worst case load covers all loads proposed for production results are provided on page 18. Sometimes we just see results, and they might be hundreds of pages of results. But look at what that sentence does. It tells you what autoclave you're talking about, what types of runs were performed. It tells the date. Now, this slide's a little old, so 2016's not the greatest, but you get the point. It talks about what types of loads, worst case, what it covers, and it tells you where to look for the load, the, the actual results. You can also provide summaries of the results. Tell us what the minimum and maximum temperatures are the minimum maximum of zero and the BI results. You can say that the summary is on page 15, the actual results are on page 18. That really can move the reviewer along. And give the simple things. Which machine are you talking about? What autoclave, what is the name? What is the filling line name? Are there multiple names that you use for this line in your, in your facility? What room numbers when you're talking about it? For example, don't assume that we know there's only one filling line in a building. That might be common sense to you because you know, well, this is the building we work in. There's only one filling line here. But we might not see that right away. So by calling it, oh, the filling line has been qualified, we might think which one because we're used to seeing facilities that have multiple filling lines. 
Certainly English translations are critical, and all of this is to move the reviewer along for a faster and more efficient review. So as I said, I'm jumping on, you're going to jump topics quite a bit here. So now sterilizing filtration. We see quite, quite an increase in the use of pre-sterilized, commercially available filling and filtration trains. That includes pre-packaged, pre-sterilized filters, tubings, uh, tubing, large flexible bags, et cetera. So this is, this is all great, but just clearly mention the use of this in an application, right? Where is it being sterilized? Are, are you purchasing it sterilized? Are you, is it, if you're purchasing it that way, are you relying on a DMF to provide the sterilizing data? If you're sterilizing it yourself, tell us that. And right, I'll talk a little bit about DMFs later. But the idea is here is it, it just doesn't hurt to tell us too much information about what you're, what you're expecting us to quickly understand. We might not pick this up. This is trying to avoid deficiencies, right? So if, if you're buying the filter sterilized, we might, you might know that it's in an autoclave load, but we didn't know it's in the autoclave load, so we're trying to find a DMF because you've sterilized it as well and you've put it in the autoclave load. If you put it in there and we've already looked at the autoclave load, then the problem's solved. We might not know if your worst case load covers everything, so tell us exactly what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish. We also see reuse of sterilizing grade filters during production campaigns. We recommend you avoid doing this, but we understand that you can. So when it's possible, uh, when you're trying to do this, just tell us the maximum number of times you're trying to reuse it or re-sterilize it, because that way we're going to need to see the data to support that. We don't want to review some data and then find out down the road that, oh wait, they're planning on reusing this five times? That means that we have to go take a look at this data again, and like for the bacterial retention studies, did it cover five uses? That's the kind of questions we're gonna be asking. So we want to see that the data utilizes the worst case scenario for the amount of times you're reusing, reusing it. All right, so drug, drug master files. I think we all probably know what this is, but they allow confidential information to be referenced from another party. However, when it's not appropriately referenced, DMFs tend to cause a lot of confusion, and they can decrease review and application approval efficiency. So I've used this picture down here for, for quite a while. But this was back in the day when there were large volumes that the reviewers had to literally walk across the street to a document room, check out five or six or 10 volumes, put it in a cart, and push it through a parking lot back to your office. Now everything's electronic, but I'm still scarred from those, from those days. So that's why I want this thing here so we never forget that. But the recommendation here is clearly tell us where the information is. These DMFs can be enormous. These companies are huge, and they have an enormous amount of data in them covering many types of products. If you're, if you're using it for a rubber stopper, they might have tons of rubber stoppers, different sizes, different, different chemistry of the stopper. And just saying, hey, go look at DMF1234 can be an hour or more to try to find what we're talking about or what you want us to go see. So if you're relying on a DMF, please ask the company where the exact data is for what you have purchased and what you want us to review. Because we, will, we have to issue deficiencies if, if we don't know where it is. We can't just dig through a DMF forever, because it just takes forever. And again, that's the theme here. We're trying to increase the reviewer's efficiency, which essentially speeds the approval process. All right, so most of this I've been I'm going to talk about sterile situations. But in this scenario, we've, we've, we've come up with this situation where the type of product is a non-sterile powder. And the non-sterile powder has package insert instructions to reconstitute in an aqueous solution, and then there's a hold time associated with it. So the two situations I'm going to talk about is a multi-dose scenario and a single-dose scenario. And the single-dose scenario has an excessive hold time. So again, we have a powder as the product, then the, the instructions say mix with, with an aqueous solution, and then you can hold it 30 days, seven days, whatever, whatever that may be. And our recommendation is this. For a multi-dose scenario, we want USP51, the antimicrobial effectiveness test. We want USP60, B. sapatia testing, at release, or a risk assessment, right? So I think that's key there, or a risk assessment. If you don't want to do USP60 at release, we, we, that's okay but then show us how you've controlled your water systems, how you've controlled your manufacturing environment for Bisapatia, that you're looking for it. Prove to us, explain to us that you've done an assessment of this, that your facility is, is free of this organism, and then you won't have to show it at release for every batch. We also want an assessment of preservative content at the end of the storage time, because some of these, 
some of these products can be held for 45 days. So show us that the preservative is still there at 45 days. So now the single dose scenario. This is when the package insert has excessive times for a single dose product and it usually does not have a preserving agent in it. We're looking for a microbiological challenge study over the proposed, over the proposed storage time. So this is when you can put your microbiology hat on and design a study. What organisms do you want to use? You're spiking it with an appropriate amount and you're carrying it over the storage time and you're going to show us that no excessive growth has occurred. In addition to that, we also want USB 60 for the B. Cepatia at release or you can do a risk assessment. That's the key here because these are aqueous solutions or they're being resuspended in aqueous solutions. We want to make sure that your manufacturing facility has controlled for B. Cepatia. And we think this is providing an improved risk assessment for these types of products. All right, bulk bioburden sampling. So this is when you're sampling the bulk solution to see how clean your scenario is, right? So sometimes we see situations where there's a 0.45 micron pre-filter, there might even be a 0.2 micron pre-filter, and then there's a sterilizing filter. Sometimes we see the sampling of the bulk solution taking place in between these filter setups. And that's really not acceptable because these filters really, they work well. So if you sample in between a 0.45 or a 0.2 micron filter, it's going to show no organisms. What we want is for you to understand that and do the testing prior to any filtration. So sampling after a filtration doesn't tell you how well controlled your solution is. It can give you a false impression. And certainly microbial metabolites can pass through the filters, right? Endotoxins can come right through it. And it might, it, as it says, it's going to give you a false impression. You're going to think that you're controlling the solution, but it's just because you've sampled after a filter. So we'll issue deficiencies sort of asking, where are you sampling this? And if you're sampling it in between a filter to change the sampling to prior to filters, filtration. All right, biological indicators. So these are gonna be used for autoclave qualifications, right? These are the spore forming organisms that you're trying to see. Does your high heat really kill these? And what this is focused on is the incubation time. And the idea is seven days or an incorrect 24 hour incubation. So sometimes we see 24 hours, 36 hours, but what we're looking for is seven days. This comes from USP 55, which, which suggests seven days after inoculation. The ISO document, commonly recognized to be seven days. So I'm providing this here just to show that seven days isn't something that we're just making up. This is the established seven days. But what happened here, and there's no one's at fault, CDRH is not at fault for doing this. This is just, this guidance has come about and people have misinterpreted it. So CDRH, CDRH issued a guidance for healthcare facilities, right? So it's for sterilization systems in healthcare facilities, hospitals, dentist office, things like that. And you can go read this at your leisure, but I'm trying to just point you to the, the, the yellow here. They're saying the incubation period for BIs can be reduced from the standard seven or more days, provided you have validation studies, right? Now, if you, the next, bullet down there says if you have 97 percent of your bi positive control grow out so they're they're getting this if you can if you can recover 97 percent of your positive control at three days then they're saying that's okay so for the drug world for the manufacturing facilities we say that's not okay and the reason is because of, of what i said it's not a complete grow out right is is 97 percent of a positive control is that acceptable for your facility for your manufacturing facility no. So please do seven days. All right, so Erica's going to talk about endotoxins next, but one thing that I have in my slide here that we commonly see is just the idea of pooling of samples. All right, so USP 85 in the question and answer section of that, uh, the addition to that document, says that you can pool three units. So rather than do one test, you can mix three units and then, excuse me, rather than do three tests, you can mix three units and test once. But what happens here, if you think about what you've just done, you've made a threefold dilution. So while you're doing your endotoxins math and you're calculating the maximum valid dilution, you need to adjust that. So you take your maximum valid dilution and divide it by three if you're pooling by three. Right? You don't have to pool, but what we notice is in the, in the instructions on how to perform the test, when we're seeing how that's written, it might say, oh, pool three vials. But then the MBD has no divided by three. And then the reviewer is thinking, well, wait, did they account for this? Are they aware that basically they're diluting an extra threefold? And this can directly interfere with the ability of the test with inhibition and enhancement and things like that. So please consider that pooling concept. And if you are doing it, please tell us and then adjust for it. I threw a bonus down here. 
So while you're looking at the package insert, think about the pediatric dose. A lot of times we see the pediatric dose being missed, right? It's not all about the adults. There might be infants, there might be children that are being prescribed this medicine and you need to adjust for that. There's usually different doses and things like that. So keep your eye out for that. All right, media fills. We want you to clearly indicate the maximum proposed time for production, the, the filling time for production, right? So we'll see these beautiful media fill studies and they might be for 18 hours, 20 hours, but there's no mention at all of how long you're proposing to fill for production. Well, if you're proposing, I don't know, 36 hours for production, well then are your media fills really worth it, anything? Did, we, did you prove to us that you can fill for that much time? So clearly indicate what you're proposing for production, that way we can compare it. It seems quite straightforward, but I think there's just can be a mix up into what you think you need to tell us. And if lyophilization is utilized, let us know exactly what lyophilizer was used in the media fill. Right? This really goes for any piece of equipment that you're using. The media fill needs to, needs to include the exact equipment that you're proposing for commercial production. And this gets back to that early slide I had where just, I'm asking, just tell us over and over again what you're using. If you have four lyophilizers that you're proposing to use, then we want to see those lyophilizers be incorporated in the media fill. Tell us the names of them. Tell us which filling line. Tell us again what filling line it is. Just to make sure we know exactly which one you're trying to qualify. All right, so now I'm moving into supplement filing tips. And it's the same theme, right? Tell the FDA. Tell us. Tell us, tell us, tell us. If you're proposing a bunch of changes, just make that cover letter so crystal clear in what you're trying to do, right? Even if you have to bullet change number one, we have a new rubber stopper. Change number two, there's an increased filling duration. Change number three, there's a new autoclave load, right? Just make it so clear on the front. Don't assume that we have all the prior reviews and submissions easily accessible, right? As wonderful as technology is, we all know what Adobe can do when you're trying to open a PDF that might be 600 pages, right? It can be very painful. So if you just have this very clear in the front, you can tell us what we're looking for, and we don't have to go into the historical records of these, docu uh, these reviews, which might be over 10 years old. We might not even be able to find them because they're in a different repository, something like that. So try to make it clear, right? We have a new rubber stopper. We're changing from this size stopper to this size stopper. Or it might be something simple. We're simply changing the composition of the stopper. There's no change to the size. Just things like that. Tell us there's no change for things. Really helps. If you're, if you're doing like a prior approval supplement, trying to get the CBE 30 or CBE 0, I think the best thing to do is just simply tell us, what are you basing it on? Right? Tell us when and what was approved in the past. If it's not a confidential issue, and you can tell us, hey, and a number X, uh, 123 in, in January 2023 was just approved with this same filling line, I mean, that is a huge time save to the reviewer. And then make it logical. Right? We propose CB30 because this filling line was previously approved on January 1st, and nothing else is changing. Right? I added the italics there because I think the reviewer would just love to see that phrase, nothing else is changing. Because it, it, it sounds crazy, but when you're sitting there reviewing it, it's so easy to think, are they changing this? Why, why did they give me this autoclave data here? It's supposed, to be, it's supposed to be something different, but there's all this data. Should I review this? Why do I have to review it? Maybe they're just giving me too much information. But if nothing else is changing, maybe you just gave that and we don't really need to see it. So therefore, the reviewer doesn't have to waste three hours. So think of it in terms of that. All right, time for the quiz. This is, this is intense. So if your manufacturing plan includes purchasing a pre-sterilized filter, but you also put that filter into the autoclave load, what do you do? Do you tell FDA you're also sterilizing it yourself and include the data? Do you tell FDA you're sterilizing it yourself and do not include the data? Or you don't even tell FDA anything about this? Any thoughts here? I know it's the afternoon. All right, hey, I'll give it to you. Tell us, tell us you bought it sterile, include the data, give us a summary, do everything you can to make this easy for us to review. If we don't have to dig into doing a DMF, we don't want to. It's much, we've already reviewed the autoclave, right? Remember that, we've already reviewed the autoclave data. If you've got the filter in a worst case load, we're done. If you don't tell us that, now we dig into a DMF and you're picturing me 10 years ago pushing the, the volumes across the parking lot. All right, question two. You're sampling the bio burden of the bulk solution and you're sampling it in between two filters. Is this okay? No, there we go. Yeah, she's good over there. No. 
All right, so the next couple slides, I have just a bunch of references. Uh, you're welcome to, to look through those. There's my contact information. And up next is Erica, who's going to dive into endotoxins a little deeper. Oh, thanks, John. You set me up nicely for some stuff. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Erica Feiler. I'm here on behalf of the Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment, and this afternoon I'm going to talk to you about the bacterial endotoxin specification. All right, a couple of learning objectives for us today. So what are endotoxins and why are they a patient risk? How do you control endotoxins in injectable drug products? And how do you go about setting the acceptance criteria for the endotoxin specification? Let's, let's jump in. All right, so why am I here? And don't worry, this isn't a meaning of life question, but rather why has SBIA dedicated a session at this conference for me to talk to you about endotoxins? Well, first of all, the people in my group are the people who are scrutinizing the endotoxin specification found in your andos. It's something that we scrutinize very closely because we know that too high a level of endotoxins in the drug product presents patient risk. And finally, we get a lot of andas with the endotoxin specification set too high. And so this necessitates us to send information requests. We may have to ask an applicant to change a specification. They may need to do new method suitability studies. You know, stuff that we want to try to avoid during the assessment cycle. We also get a lot of questions about the endotoxin specification through our control correspondence program. So, you know, taken all together, this is an aspect for which there is patient risk and there seems to be a lot of confusion on the topic. So I'm here today to tell you how we approach looking at that endotoxins acceptance criteria to try and help you get that specification set right the first time when you submit your ANDA. Okay, so what are endotoxins? Now, endotoxins, they're just a normal component of the cell wall of gram-negative microorganisms. Now, you see I've got a little cartoon here on the slide, and the cartoon is a cross-section of a gram-negative microorganism, and you see those little, those little hairs there on the top of it, those little red molecules labeled lipopolysaccharide. It's just another name for endotoxin. Now, these molecules can actually have a very dramatic reaction with the human immune system. So the reaction they can have can lead to outcomes such as fever, shock, and if you're exposed to too many, even death. And so, you know, this is something that we want to scrutinize very closely. Now, this is not a theoretical concern. There have been noted instances of endotoxin reactions to injectable products, including one notable occurrence involving gentamicin in the late 1990s. So, you know, this is something that we at FDA and you in the parenteral drug industry are keeping a very close eye on because we want to prevent that type of adverse patient outcomes from our drugs. Okay. So, Microorganisms are ubiquitous in the environment. That's a fact. So how do we go about controlling the presence of endotoxins in our drug products? Now, I bet some of you are thinking, well, Erica, come on now, the drugs are sterilized, right? And that's gonna get rid of the microorganisms. That's correct. Sterilization gets rid of live microorganisms, but Endotoxins, they're kind of the remains. They're kind of what's left over also from killed microorganisms. So all the microorganisms that the product is exposed to along the manufacturing path, they can have an additive effect on the endotoxin burden. And as it turns out, most common sterilization methods do nothing to inactivate the endotoxin molecule. So sterilization isn't going to help us here. So what can we do to reduce 
the risk of endotoxins in the drug products? Well, this is an aspect of manufacturing for which we have to take a quality by design approach. Right, So for the typical quality by design approach for small molecules for, to keep uh, endotoxins at safe levels, it's going to involve activities like choosing the correct grade of API and excipients for the drug product, going to want to keep good bioburden control, particularly at the formulation stage. And I know John talked about that just a little bit in his presentation. We're going to want to be sure to depyrogenate our container closure system, get rid of the endotoxins where we can. And finally, the cornerstone of any good mitigation strategy is going to be some in product testing. Now, I've highlighted release and stability testing here on this slide. And why did I highlight that? Because that's where we see most of our issues in our applications. So let's take a closer look at that specification for endotoxins for our drug products. So we know that a specification consists of a test, a method, and an acceptance criteria. Let's break it down as it relates to endotoxins. So obviously our test is gonna be for endotoxins. The method that we most commonly see for ANDAs, for endotoxins testing, is found in the United States Pharmacopeia's chapter 85. Um, now this is also a harmonized chapter, so you're gonna see this in the European and the Japanese Pharmacopeia as well. And within the chapter, there are a number of different methods that you can choose from to perform your endotoxins testing. So we got our test, we got our method, our acceptance criteria. Now the acceptance criteria for endotoxins, that can also be found in USP 85 as well. Let's take a closer look at that. Okay, that's it. That is the acceptance criteria for endotoxins and sterile injectable drug products. It makes you do a little work, doesn't it? It makes you do a little bit of math. But it's, it's pretty simple, it's pretty straightforward. So to get the endotoxins acceptance criteria for your drug product, you have to divide the variable K, which represents the threshold pyrogenic dose of endotoxin per kilogram body weight, and you have to divide that by the variable M, which is the maximum recommended bolus dose of product per kilogram body weight. Okay, I mean, it asks you to do a little math, but it's not that much, and it only asks you for two variables. So I guess the only question remaining for this is gonna be, what are K and M? Okay, so here at this conference, I am here today to tell you the secret to finding K. It's really hard to find, actually. Um, so on the screen, I've got a snapshot of the last page of USP Chapter 85. It's small, but I'm just trying to show you a location. Um, about midway down the page, where I've got a blue box outlined, in really teeny tiny font, that's where you'll find all the values that you're going to need for K. So now you know the secret because you attended this conference. You know the secret to finding K. I did transcribe some of the values here on my slides so we could take a bit of a closer look at them. First, I'm going to introduce a unit, the endotoxin unit. Um, that is just a measure of the biological reactivity of the endotoxin, and you'll see K expressed in endotoxin units per kilogram. But the other thing that we notice about K is that we've got a lot of different values for it, right? So there's a K for intrathecal injections. There's a K for injections by all other routes of administration. There is a K for products dosed based on body surface area, and we see a lot of our oncology products dosed in that way. Um, there are also a couple of other Ks for radiopharmaceutical products that I didn't list here, but again, I've highlighted something on the slide, and that is the 5 EU per kilogram K. Um, we're going to do some math here in a minute. Don't, don't act too excited. We're going to do a couple of calculations here in a minute. So you're going to see that 5 EU per kilogram again. So I want you to remember that. 
Now M, M is much more intuitive, right? It's just the maximum dose of your product. That's pretty straightforward. But what I want to caution you when we're talking about M is that you need to take the value of M from your product label. Now, John mentioned this earlier in his talk as well. You cannot guess M. You cannot take M from a monograph. You need to take M from the product label. Um, one other thing that we don't see as much, but I wanted to add it on the slide, that is if you've got a kit, so a product that's co-packaged, maybe product and diluent packaged together, the, contrib the endotoxin contributions of both of those should be considered as one, but we don't see that too terribly often. All right, so you see that both K and M have aspects of body weight. So what weight are we talking about here? For endotoxin calculations, OPMA considers the standard adult body weight to be 70 kilograms. But we know that there are products that have indications for a pediatric population as well. And those need to be considered when you're setting that acceptance criteria. So to find the appropriate pediatric body weight for your patient population, we recommend referring to the Center for Disease Control's weight for age charts. And I'm going to show you how, to, how we approach that in one of my case studies here. Now, if you're setting a specification and you feel like you're doing a lot of legwork, a lot of calculations, had to figure out you know, my M for this population, all this stuff, there is a place in the submission where you can explain your thinking, you can explain your rationale, and that's in section 32P56. It's a great place to discuss the rationale for your K and for your M. Okay, case study time. Time for me to do math on stage. Everybody ready for that? Yeah, I, I had somebody check my math beforehand, so I had a, I had a, a reviewer actually check my math beforehand. Um, all right, we're gonna do one simple and one complex case study. So we'll start out with the simple. The product for our simple case study is called luprolide acetate. It is a product for the treatment of prostate cancer. It's got a very simple dosage information on its label. And this is pretty much all it says. The recommended dose is one milligram administered as a single daily subcutaneous injection. There's not much there, but we've already got enough information to figure out how we start to set up the problem for our acceptance criteria. So this is a subcutaneous injection not intrathecal, so we know what our K is going to be. There are no pediatric indications listed on this label. And finally, this is just a vial of drug product, no kit to have to worry about. So we go back and stare down our acceptance criteria calculation that we have to do. But hey, we have all the information that we need. We take our 5 EU per kilogram K, we know our dose and our adult body weight. And so after that, it's just a matter of doing a little bit of arithmetic and canceling out the units to get an endotoxins acceptance criteria of 350 EU per milligram. Easy peasy. Okay, now let's turn it up a little bit, make it a little bit harder. The, pro the product for our complex case study is a product called Leviteracetam. And this is an anti-epileptic, present in a lot of different formats, tablets, but there is also an intravenous injectable format. Okay, that already tells us something. We already know that our K here, this is an intravenous injection, is gonna be five EU per kilogram. Ooh, but look at that dosing information. That is a mouthful. Um, we've got pediatric dosing. We've got lots of different ages, lots of different doses. Well, okay, so we're going to have to we're going to look more closely at this. Now, obviously, I've worked this example for us, and I'm not going to go through this line by line. But hey, I think we should take a look at this one as maybe being our maximum dose for the drug product. We've got patients 12 years or older with a dose of up to 1,500 milligrams. 
All right, so we're going to turn to our CDC weight for age charts, 1,500 milligrams in a 12-year-old patient. So these charts separate male and female, and they also do the age by month. So what we're looking for here is we're going to look for a 144-month-old female. Why female? The weight is lower, so it gives us a worst case for the dose. We also recommend using the 50th percentile weight for this calculation. So what we end up with here is a 41.8 kilogram patient. Do our math, 36 milligram per kilogram. We're thinking that that is our worst case dose. So I go back to the label. Just double check, yes, 36 milligrams per kilogram is our worst case dose, and now we have our M. We had to work for that M, but now we have it. Plug in our values, do our arithmetic, cancel our units, and we end up with an endotoxins acceptance criteria of 0 0.14 EU per milligram. All right, a couple of resources for your perusal. Um, USP 85, I talked about that the entire time, really. But one thing I want you to know is that there is one type of injectable product that doesn't have its K in um, 85, and that is ophthalmic injections. You're going to find that information in USP 771. Um, got our CDC weight for age charts. But honestly, you could just Google CDC weight for age charts, and that information will come right up. There's the URL if you need it. Um, a great guidance on endotoxins testing and a guidance on our controlled correspondence program, where, again, we do get a lot of questions about that endotoxin specification. Okay, recap. Exposure to excessive endotoxins is a patient risk. Process design and in-product testing are both important things that work together to ensure that endotoxins are controlled in your drug product. USP Chapter 85 contains information regarding both methods and acceptance criteria for endotoxins testing. And when you are setting that acceptance criteria, you should be taking your information from the product label. Okay, time for our quiz, and then we'll wrap up for the day, and I'll turn it over to our next speakers. Okay, now you're all very clever, I know, so I know you're going to get this. The acceptance criterion for the endotoxin specification for a subcutaneous injection should be calculated from the formula provided in USP 85. I don't hear anybody. That's true. As I said, you guys are all very clever. Excellent job. Next one is much less wordy. Okay. Um, K. K is the same for all injectable drug products. True or false? False. Oh, you guys are great. Excellent. All right. Well, that is the end of my time and my material today. So, Thank you for your kind attention, and I'd like to turn it over to our next presenters. We've got Bailey and Sonny. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Erica. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to switch gears and do a little policy and labeling talk. Um, so my name is Bailey Larson. I'm in the Office of Generic Drug Policy on the Patent and Exclusivity Team. I'm here today presenting with um, my OGD colleague, Sunny Pion, from the Division of Labeling Review. Uh, we're going to talk about ANDA's labeling requirements for RX to OTC switched products. Before we begin, uh, just want to go over the learning objectives. We'll explain how a prescription or RX drug product may initiate the change in marketing status to over-the-counter or OTC through the new drug application or NDA process. We'll discuss the process for labeling and policy updates when a reference-listed drug or RLD undergoes an RX to OTC switch and identify the roles of uh, the agency and the roles of um, you all, the applicant. Um, so just want to read the room and online a little bit. Um, 
there'll be the poll online and we'll collect the results. I won't be able to see them live, but um, how many in the room, have you sought approval for an RX to OTC product? Anyone, yes? Okay, I'm assuming the rest are no or with the FTA. So um, thank you, we've got a couple and hopefully you will um, learn something and if your RLD ever makes a switch in the future, um, you can remember some of these tips. So as an overview, there's uh, two types of RX to OTC switches. There's a full switch and a partial switch. Um, the full switch is when an NDA holder switches the drug product covered under the NDA uh, to OTC manufacturing status um, in its entirety. So in other words, all the conditions of use. Um, when a full switch occurs, there is no longer the prescription product. It's uh, only marketed as over-the-counter. Um, we'll be focusing on full switches for this presentation. Um, uh, a partial switch is when a NDA holder um, switches some of the conditions of use um, while retaining others with a prescription status. Um, this usually requires a full new NDA um, and the product will have condi different conditions of use. So examples of this are um, levocetirazine solution or proton pump inhibitors. I'm sure we've all seen that um, you know, PPIs can be um, over the counter for short-term GERD or prescription status for things like peptic ulcer disease. So um, we'll focus on full switch um, tips today. So uh, how does a full switch um, come about? Um, the NDA holder will switch the drug product to non-prescription um, marketing status in its entirety. Um, by submitting an efficacy supplement. We've talked a lot about um, PAS today with David and John, um, so the similar things. Um, there was a change in recent years in the agency that the um, RX and OTC product are um, now considered the same drug product, so they'll even have the same product code. Uh, NDA holders may submit patents within 30 days from the date of approval of the efficacy supplement. And um, holders or applicants of approved and pending ANDAs referencing that NDA must submit a supplement or amendment to their ANDA relying on the RLD for OTC conditions of use and associated labeling. So that's really a, the key bullet here for this audience. Um, it does not require a completely new ANDA, which uh, as we know is beneficial, there'll be you know, no unnecessary data collection, quicker review times, and um, no user fee agreements. So here's some high level regulations. Um, after a supplement is approved, the FDA will continue to list the patent information um, that was listed for the original NDA for 30 days or until form 3542 is submitted. If the patent was already listed in the orange book, the patent submission date will stay the original pre-switch date. Um, if a patent information if patent information is submitted, the, the date for the patent information will reflect the original date of submission. Some examples of this are a, um, a relisting of method of use codes, um, uh, adding a new patent uh, to cover the new conditions of use, or a revised MOU. Uh, if the NDA holder does not submit Form 3542 within the 30-day period, the carried over patent information will be removed from the orange book at the end of the 30-day period. Um, because the OTC and RX uh, product are um, now considered to be the same listed drug, um, that also applies to 180-day exclusivity. So why do we um, care about this and what does it matter and kind of what's the history behind all this? So it's all, it all goes back to the patient, right? We need to protect the public. Um, in the 1940s to 1960s, there was uh, abuse of amphetamines and barbiturates, which was one um, key factor that led to the Durham-Humphrey Amendment of 1951. So this act was um, what distinguished the OTC and RX drugs. Uh, prior to this, the determination as to whether a drug was safe and effective 
for self-medication was left to the manufacturer. So as you can imagine, this was really confusing for patients and pharmacists and um, other healthcare providers, and it limited the agency in um, deciding what was safe for over-the-counter use um, and with that medical supervision. Um, so this uh, amendment in 1951 uh, gave the agency regulatory power. Um, this is also where the labeling of Rx only came from, so we've all seen the caution federal law prohibits dispensing without a prescription. And um, when things like this break down, we get misbranding. So um, Rx and OTC versions of the same drug product are not permitted to be marketed at the same time. We must have a, um, uh, a reasonable difference, so either dosage or um, indication or um, route of administration. Failure to maintain labeling that is consistent with that of the RLD is basis to propose withdrawing approval of an ANDA. So I'll now bring up Sunny to uh, tell you a little bit more about the labeling requirements. So thank you, Bailey. So um, again, my name is Sunny Pian, and I'm from the Division of Labeling Review. Um, I'm going to kind of go over what this means actually for your ANDA application. Um, so first, we're going to discuss pending pending original applications. Uh, pending ANDA, if you if there is an RX to OTC switch, uh, you must submit an amendment to conform to the labeling requirements. So if new patent information for the OTC entry. Uh, compared to that of the prescription entry is listed, that is, newly listed patent or revised method of use, and the applicant must provide an appropriate certification, recertification, or statement. So I'm going to provide you with a hypothetical just kind of example. So let's say that there is a drug, and we're going to call this drug a uh, Dendrocom. And this is completely made up, so you don't need to like look it up. Um, so let's say for this drug Dendrocom, it has the, the prescription or the RX indication, and the indication is for the treatment of the fear of forest. So you're definitely afraid, afraid of the forest, and has three patents associated with it. Patent number one is for the treatment of the fear of trees. Okay, patent number two is a treatment of the fear of pine trees. Okay, and then patent number three would be for the fear of bugs, you know, because we find bugs in trees. So now uh, the NDA submits an OTC uh, switchover, and let's say for the OTC indication, it's approved or they're proposing to treat short-term fear of trees. So as you can see, with this indication, it's a more limited indication, but it's still overlapping. So the first indication, so the treatment for the fear of the forest, the first RX indication, no longer exists when it switches over to the OTC product. So the NDA sub, uh, applicant, or the NDA sponsor, let's say, submits a new efficacy supplement for a full switch to the OTC. So patents one and two, so again, patent one was the fear of tr for the treatment for the fear of trees, and number two was for the treatment of fear of pine trees. Okay, so patent number one and two, they get carried over, and the use code stays the same. At this point, the ANDA applicant must recertify. Now, for patent number three, which is fear of bugs, it is not carried over as it is not related to the OTC indication. So the NDA, uh, with the OTC supplement being approved, the patent and the use codes are addressed by, it must be addressed by the ANDA. So again, patent numbers one and two, which has the overlapping indication or, or protection for uh, treatment of fear of trees and pine trees, they must be certified or recertified. Okay, so now that we discussed um, the pending originals, we will discuss uh, approved applications. So ANDAs are responsible for monitoring the orange book for updates to the RLD. So approved ANDAs is required to submit a prior approval supplement, a PAS, to comply with the updated labeling requirements. So generally, an ANDA labeling must be same as your RLD with the exception of 
uh, things that may be due to manufacturing or distributor uh, differences. And again, um, along with monitoring for the orange book, uh, it is also the ANDA applicant's responsibility to monitor drugs at FDA to make sure that you submit supplements or amendments accordingly when your RLD updates. And again, specifically for the RX to OTC switches, the ANDA applicant must submit a PAS as soon as possible, otherwise your ANDA is considered to be misbranded. So when you do submit your PAS or your amendment, um, but in particularly for the PAS, a filing review and subsequent acknowledgement supplemental, supplemental ANDA receipt letter will be issued with the appropriate goal date attached to it. And this PAS will undergo standard review practices. OGD will then issue any formal communication through our standard practice through the IR and the DRL, so information request or discipline review letter process. So now I have challenge questions. So for challenge question number one, which of the following statement is not true? Is it A, RX and OTC versions of the same drug products are permitted to be marketed at the same time? B, Pending ANDAs should submit an amendment to switch their ANDA drug products from RX to OTC. C, ANDA applicant is responsible to update their labeling. And D, FDA does not consider post full switch NDA product to be a different listed drug. Any ideas? Yes. Thank you. So the correct answer is A. RX and OTC versions of the same drug products, it says are permitted, but they are not permitted to be marketed at the same time as Bailey has discussed in her presentation. Okay, so challenge question number two. What type of submission should approved and applicants submit for a full RX to OTC switch? A, a CBE zero. B, CBE 30, C, a PAS, or D, submit a new ANDA. Correct, thank you for paying attention. Yes, a PAS. Um, you will be submitting a prior approval supplement. So in summary, pre and post full switch drug products are considered to be the same drug product under section 505J 5B4 of the FDNC Act. And the applicants are required to update their labeling to be consistent with the most recent approved RLD labeling. Pending ANDAs must recertify to any new or updated patents from the RLD. And lastly, monitor for RLD updates when an RX to OTC switch is identified, submit a PAS or an amendment as soon as possible. Thank you, and then now I will pass it over to Captain Vincent Sansoni and Commander Rinku Patel for their next presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hear this is the last presentation, so I'd like to say they saved the best for last, but um, given everybody that went before us, I don't think that's appropriate. But um, anyway, I uh, hope this helps. And I think this uh, presentation is apropos because this is actually regulatory reminders to the finish line. So this is actually kind of wrapping up the day, which makes sense because this is those later stages where everything's going to be kind of wrapped up and moving towards approval. So we're hoping to get that action. So I think it's a good way to cap the uh, present, cap the uh, conference, and close it out. So um, myself is Captain Sansoni. I represent the Division of Project Management. With me today is going to be Rinku Patel. She represents the Patent and Exclusivity Team, and we thought it would be, be befitting to do this presentation together because the Division of Project Management and the Patent and Exclusivity Team actually work hand in hand when it comes down to these final stages to approve an application. So we thought both groups together would be adequate to present today. So. 
when we talk about regulatory reminders to the finish line, what we're actually talking about is finishing up those last stages to approval. So your application has made it through those rigorous scientific reviews, you know, you're moving into the final stages, your deficiencies have been um, deemed adequate, and you're looking at getting that application right next to the finish line, getting that approval letter that you want. So that's kind of where we're kind of at right now and what we want to monitor in between then. You'll see us kind of reiterate the word vigilance and monitoring uh, throughout this presentation because this is really where you want to, you know, don't lose gas, right? You want to step on the pedal here and make sure you're being, you're watching things that will come over today to make sure we get that application to approval and it, and it gets to you as soon as we can. And I guess it's important to also note that, you know, we have a shared interest, right? The FDA and industry to get that application to approval. We want to make sure that we facilitate, you know, generic entry just as much as you want to get that application approved for the same reason. So we kind of have a shared interest in this category. So we definitely need to work together. It takes the village and that's what we need to do. So what are some of our learning objectives for today? We're going to discuss how and when to respond to changes to patent information. And we need to be very cognizant of the fact that these changes to patent information occur throughout the life cycle of an application, right? It's not just when you submit the application that these changes stop. Changes occur throughout the life cycle application because you have a lot of confounding variables that are happening outside of your control as well. And again, you need to monitor those changes. We're also going to review the best practices for ANDA applicants. So what to do when these changes arise, what to do when these changes occur, how to address them, what's the best way to get it done, things like that that uh, Commander Rinku will go into and give you a little bit more detail and that'll get you through the next phases of getting this application to approval. And then lastly, we're going to bring it all together. Um, we'll go over some other things that you need to be vigilant and cognizant of to monitor for your application, and we'll wrap it up all together, hopefully so that you can see the bigger picture and how this application is going to get to its final stage. So we didn't want to step off the gas here a little bit, and we wanted to also talk about what is industry doing well? Well, industry is doing well at the beginning of the submission, and this whole, the pretext of this slide is all at the submission of your application. We find that these four bullets kind of being addressed during the initial stages of your application when you're submitted at filing. Uh, you guys are the industry certifying to all patent listed, doing a great job there. Please keep that, you know, get, keep that going. You're providing timely notice. That's good. You know, you're notifying the NDAs, et cetera, et cetera, of your patents, uh, patent certifications. You're submitting the documentation of notice for original P4 certifications that we, you know, we have to have as a regulatory requirement. So you're submitting those documentations of notice on time. And you're also notifying the FDA of the first civil action complaint, meaning, you know, hey, if you guys got sued or industry was sued when you submitted these notices, you're telling us of that fact, which is good. But this is all on the onset of the application. You know, this is at the time of filing, which you're doing a real good job of. But we want to make sure you guys understand that this not only stops here, this also matriculates through the application process, meaning you're going to have to, you know, monitor for the patent changes to the Orange Book, et cetera, and things like that, and make sure you're meeting all the necessary regulatory requirements that ensue. So it doesn't just stop when you submit the application, it goes all the way up to the final approval. And again, we're at the final approval stages, we want to help you break through that barrier, make sure you're not missing anything, not have us kind of try to chase you down to make sure you submit necessary regulatory documents that would hinder approval. That's where you're going to get stymied. So I think Commander Rank 2 is going to go over some of these specific details of where we've seen applicants might need a little help and a little bit more information. Thanks, Vince. Um, as he said, in the next three slides, I'll be sharing common deficiencies uh, and sort of observations that we have, as well as identifying areas of improvement. Um, so going to the first bullet here, addressing timely submitted later listed use codes. So you might be asking yourself, when can that actually happen, right? Uh, when can an NDA holder submit a new use code, or what could trigger an NDA holder to be submit, to submit a new use code uh, that for a patent that's already been listed in the orange book. 
There are a handful of instances where a newly listed use code can be, can be submitted but and to be considered timely listed. A common situation is when an NDA holder has obtained supplemental approval seeking a new indication and they submit a updated patent information within 30 days of approval of the corresponding labeling change. So essentially what you would have to do if the patent is submitted or the use code submitted to, and is considered to be timely listed, you've got three options. You're either going to submit a Section 8 statement indicating that you're planning to carve out that uh, indication and sort of initiate the carve out process, or you're going to be retaining the protected information and uh, in which case you've got two options. You're either going to state that you're going to wait until the patent expires and submit a pa paragraph 3 certification, or you're going to challenge the patent and submit of paragraph four certification. Either way, you must be consistent across all patents that are associated with that use code or similarly worded use codes. What we often see is applicants trying to take the original paragraph four certification and state that they have already addressed the patent and therefore the use code with it with their previous P4 and, and notice. However, we require you to submit new P4 certification. Simply put, a previous P4 certification and notice associated with that previous certification cannot cover a new use code that was submitted after the original notice was sent. Therefore, it's not acceptable to address the use code without submitting a new certification. And essentially, by the virtue of a P4 certification, you have to send a new round of notice. Some of the common challenges that we run into is sort of showing adequate documentation of notice. And there are times where you have you, you guys do really well and you guys submit, you, you've you know, addressed the use code with a P4 certification and, and you've noted and you've sent the documentation, but you just haven't told us about it. So when you when you when you when you've done the first half of it, be sure to submit the other half of it so we know that you've done that. And the other sort of instances uh, where we often see is that notice itself is not aligned or incomplete with the with the the requirements under 31495, the notice requirements. So be sure to ask yourself, have I checked to see if the right applicants were got the notice? Was the notice sent to the right address? And more importantly, was the notice actually delivered? So transitioning on to exclusivities, when exclusivity is recognized for the relied upon listed drugs such as three-year exclusivity or orphan drug exclusivity, there are two potential pathways. You either are going to retain the retain the protected information in your label or you're going to omit the protected information and seek to carve out and you're essentially saying if you're going to be carving out that information you're seeking approval of the application prior to the expiration of that exclusivity. Either way just make sure you're clearly stating the intent of how you're going to be addressing the exclusivity. And to the extent that you have a licensing agreement, you've procured something to say that you are able to go to full approval with retaining the protected information prior to the expiration of that exclusivity, you must obtain a selective waiver. And in that waiver, what we're looking for is, is it on NDA letterhead? Uh, does it indicate the effective date? And to the extent you can, ideally, we would want to know what exclusivities has the NDA holder or the what's the agreement for? What exclusivities has the NDA holder um, essentially wait for you, for you? So we all know uh, folks are eager to get their applications approved, and so are we. We want to help you guys get to the finish line and get the application out the door. However, it's imperative for you to submit litigation status on patents that give rise to a 30-month stay. Otherwise, we'll assume that the earliest lawful approval date is the expiration of the 30-month stay. And the regulations do require that an applicant under 314-107 does require the applicants to submit uh, within 14 days of the decision that's been entered by the court, submit that information to the agency. And so for all the information, for all the hard work that you've done and that you've you made sure that you, you know, you've got the litigation terminated, just tell us about that. And tell us about that so we can help you navigate what the earliest lawful approval date is. Uh, one area that we happened, um, we sort of run into as well is whether or not the order 
order itself was signed by the judge. What we can do is assume that the proposed stipulation or in order is what you guys have agreed to, because it's possible that there is another agreement that happened after you have submitted the one you've sent to the FDA. So what we want to know is, is it signed by the judge? Is this the, app, is this the order that terminates the 30 month stay? Um, and additionally, the regs still require that the order must be signed. So again, providing us with the litigation status helps us determine what the lawful, earliest lawfully approvable date is for your application. Uh, now shifting gears to sort of post-approval requirements. Uh, commercial marketing requirements are required for both sort of the traditional patent challenge 180 exclusivity uh, for those who are considered to be first applicants uh, who have challenged a patent or for first approved applicants who satisfy the definition of competitive generic therapy in the exclusivity sort of provisions. Um, so to highlight some key points in relation to the traditional 180 exclusivity, commercial marketing notification must be must be submitted in order for us to know that you've triggered your 180 day exclusivity. Not only does it benefit you, it will also make an impact on other, any other approved applicants to d indicate whether or not they have to sort of initiate or they or they essentially know that they've triggered, that 180 day has been triggered. Um, 180 triggered, 180 day exclusivity, any triggering of that also impacts any unapproved products as well. Um, by the definition and sort of what the statute provides is that commercial marketing, not only of your drug, but of a listed drug, so that means authorized generic, you must send that information to us as well. And then to the extent that you are a first applicant that was approved, but we, you did not secure final approval or tentative approval within the 30 month time. And what we did is we punted on your 180 day exclusivity. You know, it's possible that you're still eligible for that 180 day exclusivity, but you have to, uh, looking at the approval letter, you have to indicate that you've actually commenced marketing. So to avoid losing the benefit uh, of part of the 180-day exclusivity, you must submit this information within 30 days of when you've commenced marketing. If you do not submit this information within 30 days, the date of approval of your application will then govern the date that the 180-day has been triggered. I'm gonna say that again. To avoid losing the benefit of the 180-day exclusivity, you must submit the required documentation within 30 days of when you've commenced marketing of that of your app application. If you do not submit this, the date of approval will be then govern the date the 180 day has been triggered. And sort of shifting gears to uh, CGT exclusivity, the blocking effect for folks who are sort of in this arena and have had an pr approval letter, you will indicate, which indicates sort of um, in length what the requirements are. You, we, can, we will not be uh, blocking any other approvals from happening until you've triggered your 180 exclusivity. So it's very imperative for you guys to submit that information to us. Uh, the letters say that they have to be submitted to your ANDA file, as well as indicating and letting the patent and exclusivity team be aware of that in order for us to prevent or halt any other approvals, or any other sub subsequent approvals. Uh, and, and, and the forfeiture space for CGT exclusivity is very simple. You, if you don't commence marketing in 75 days, you forfeited your uh, exclusivity. Uh, we try to provide as much transparency as possible. The paragraph P4 website and the CGT websites both indicate the eligibility of forfeitures or the eligibility of 180 day exclusivity and whether or not an applicant has forfeited, as well as indicating um, when they've commenced, commenced marketing. Vince, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, so why am I back up here? Well, you've walked through all the patents, you've gotten everything straightened out, you know, you're now in those final stages. Well, you want that letter from the Division of Project Management saying, hey, my application is approved, right? That's the end goal. That's the goal of all of us to get this application. Well, we still want to reiterate, just because you've, you know, listened to Renku, you got her presentation down, that's not where it stops. Monitoring is paramount, and it's paramount throughout the life cycle of the application. There's other things you wanna make sure you've been vigilant of. Some of those things, just to make reference here, you know, USP updates, are you conforming? Did a make sure your facilities are in line. Did any of those facilities become withhold, or there's a problem with the facilities in the late cycle of an that could 
derail it. Um, you want to make sure that you monitor the Orange Book and you want to make sure you monitor for drugs at FDA for RLD updates. You need to monitor these things. If you monitor these things and act accordingly and in an expeditious manner, you will get to that final finish line for approval. So again, monitor. If we ask you know, anything of a reg affairs department externally, it's be vigilant, make sure you stay on top of things, stuff that are outside of our control. You know, NDAs are submitting supplements to their um, respective applications all the time. Are you modeling the labeling accordingly, et cetera? All those things need to be monitored by the external stakeholders industry. So we want to make sure your reg affairs department are doing their due diligence. That way you can help us and we get to that same overarching goal to get that application out the door. So that's kind of where we're wrapping up. Um, we'll go over some challenge questions now. So the first challenge question is within how many days are you required to submit notification of court, to court actions or consent to approval? 60 days, and I, I, we'll go through the end. 30 days, 14 days, or 10 days. This is where I would usually go around a room using the Socratic method, but I'll spare you guys since the room is so empty. Um, answers 14 days. So that's the time you need to make sure all your court actions and consent to approval are sent. Challenge question two. Which of the following statements is not true? I can be eligible for final approval before the 30-month stay expires without having to submit a court action. A court order does not need to be signed by the judge. There is no set requirement to submit a documentation of notice. Lastly, my original P4 certification will cover a newly listed use code. I hope nobody guessed B because I think that was our easy giveaway. But the correct answer is all of the above, right? These are not true. So we want to make sure that you guys do all these things in a timely fashion. Rinku went over a little bit in this presentation. Submit those notices, submit the documentation, submit the necessary regulatory requirements, and you'll get your application to approval. So that's it for our presentation. Thank you guys, really appreciate it. Um, right now I think we're going to turn it over to Brenda for the Q&A panel. Can we have oh, six speakers come back up to the podium, please? As, as we are getting um, settled in, I do have a couple announcements, and it really pays to stay to the last. Apparently, there was a mix-up for those of us who parked in the hotel's garage yesterday. We paid more than I had advertised, and I cannot be accused of doing false advertising. So there was some crook with the system, the hotel's parking system, garage system, and everyone who's parked in the garage today will receive a complimentary ticket, so you don't pay anything today. Pick it up from the registration desk on your way out, please. And as you're exiting, <laughs> as you're exiting the garage, if you still have any problems, push that with the red button and explain the situation and they will resolve it for you. Second uh, comment, we had a data discrepancy with our, with our registration and attendance information yesterday. And this is probably primarily for those attending online. And many emails did not go out to attendees. We have rectified that since and we have sent emails to those individuals with yesterday's information. Today's information should be sent to the comprehensive list. So, any questions on that and the parking for those people in the house? How many people actually are in the garage, the hotel's garage? Good, excellent. Be sure to get your ticket outside, please. If you're parked in the public garage, I can't help you. All right, let's start with our in, well, any questions in house? Okay, let's start with our online questions, please. Okay, first question is for John. Can a bio burden sample between the pre-sterilizing filter and sterilizing filter be justified and accepted by FDA if the filtration process is lineal without holding periods and the substance has my antimicrobial properties like antibiotics? Oh, there you go. go. 
So you're asking if you can still sample in between filters. I just want to make sure I'm having trouble hearing you. To make sure you still you can still sample in between filters if there's other situations going on with the drug. I, I think I the answer is so no. We, we want sampling. If that we helps. want sampling yeah. prior to filtration. Between, yep, between pre-sterilizing filter and sterilizing filter. Prior prior to filtration is what we're looking for. Antimicrobial properties of drug products shouldn't be relied upon to like to improve your CGMPs, right? Like you need to treat drugs kind of the same in that way. John and I work together, so we <laughs> it's a package deal. This is this is how we spend our day. So Okay, thank you. Next question please. Okay. Next question will go um, with or for Erica. Um, please elaborate on the CDC weight table in a little more details. Uh, for example, what is a 50th or 75th percentile weight and why 50th percentile is to be chosen? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I don't know if, if you've had like little children that you have to take to the doctor and the doctor's like, oh, they're the 99th percentile of the weight. That's what those um, charts are essentially it's essentially the same chart that's probably what your doctor is using it just means that i think it the actual thing that it means is it encompasses 50 percent or 70 percent or whatever the number is of the population um we choose 50 uh, just to give sort of a safety margin for individuals who may be smaller than the highest weight, but also to still be reasonable with endotoxin specification setting activities for pediatrics. Now, I would say there could be a scenario where it would be wise to choose a lower weight, to choose a lower percentile, choose something like the 25th percentile, depending on the patient population that you're talking about. So if you've got a patient population that's very dramatically underweight, you may want to go lower with the weight that you choose for those calculations. So John, you want to you want to jump in on mine like I jumped yeah, in on sure. yours? You know what? I would just say also justify it. If you make a choice, explain it. If you explain it with some, some reasonable thought behind it, we're probably going to agree with you. Okay, thank you. Let's go to in-house question, please. Hi, uh, my question is to John. So sometimes when we're using ready-to-use uh, container closures like stoppers and vials, uh, do you think it's sufficient to just um, reference the LOA or do you also need like a statement from the, from the company? So I assume you're, you're talking about referencing... The sterility assurance package. Yeah, for, yep. so you would need an LOA Okay. For are you talking about a DMF? I assume. Yeah. Are you DMF. About sterilization or deprogenation of these components? Is, or, uh, no. If you're not deprogenate, uh, it and we're just using a ready to use, ready to uh, sterilize or ready to use thing. Do you think the LOA would suffice? Well, the LOA will give us access to the DMF, which has all of the information in it. Okay. So I think just have that LOA as clear as possible. From have the company tell because we understand you don't know those details, right? right. The, co the company should be able to tell you. Here's what you purchase. That information is in volume 14. Okay. And I also have a uh, second question to that. So sometimes we do have uh, like container closure DMF owners who make changes to their sterility assurance package, and they also notify us of the changes, but we don't have like a lot of details on it. So do you think that we need to take the more conservative approach of like, having a supplement change, like a CPE zero, or should we just put in a control correspondence in situations like that? Hmm. That's a good question. So you're talking about the, the, the DMF holder is making a change yep. to their sterility information. Yep. I believe what happens is they, they tell you, right? Yeah. And then you file a, mm -hmm. if it depends where you are, if you file an amendment or a supplement for that change, it, change. it would, right? And then it would come to us that way. So yeah, we would still need the information. I mean, oh, enhance. The review, right? If, if you don't tell us where it is, we'll, we'll probably find it. It just won't be as efficient. Okay. But in this situation, you think that we should take more of a conservative approach by putting like an annual report or like a CBE zero? No, like, I would mm -hmm. wait. I would, I mean, I would, I mean, again, it depends on the change, right? Because yeah. some are annual reportable, things like there's a lot of complicated situations yeah. going on. But I think I would just listen to them and, and I, I wouldn't just start bombarding us with potentials, you know, like it might have changed or there's an annual report, then, then it might not even get assessed if it's an annual report. It's, it's convoluted. 
Okay. Okay, thank you. Let's go to online question, please. Question for Bailey. What happens to the RX ANDA once the associated RLD undergoes a complete switch to OTC, and how long can the generic manufacturer continue to market to the RX ANDA? Can you repeat it? Sure. Um, first part, what happens to the RX and uh, once the associated RLD undergoes a complete switch to OTC? And the second part is how long can the generic manufacturer continue to market to the RX and? Uh? I, I think the clearest answer is in general the um, and it needs to submit the um, supplement as soon as possible. As soon as they get notification of the switch, they should be submitting the um, prior approval supplement to match the labeling exactly of the RLD. Okay, thank you. Next question, please, online. Okay. Next question is for Rinku. How and what should an ANTA holder communicate to the agency when they believe they are still eligible for the 180-day exclusivity despite not obtaining a TA in 30 months from the time of submission? Okay, so I'm just gonna paraphrase the question. So the question is, what should I submit to the agency if I did not secure tentative approval within the 30-month time frame, but I believe that I still hold exclusivity. So um, I think the simplest format would be to submit some sort of correspondence indicating that you have, you, you, for your reasons why and the basis as to why you think that the 180 day has not been forfeited. Thank you. Do we have more online questions? Yeah, next question will go to Sunny. What is the best way to know if my RLD has updated? Hi, thank you for that question. Um, the best way is just to be vigilant. Um, you can check drugs at FDA, or also there is an email listserv that you can go on the FDA website and sign up for to receive updates. Thank you. We do have a question in-house, please. Hi, <clears throat> this is kind of a, again, thank you all for your presentations. It's kind of a follow-up to that online question. So does an ANDA have a time that they'll be able to leave their product on the market um, as an RX when the RLD is switched to OTC unexpectedly, or do they have to <clears throat> somehow withdraw product because its labeling has significantly changed from an RX to a OTC? So I can take that. Um, so when it does switch over, you do have to submit and you do have the, you know, you do have to be same as your RLD. Um, in terms of what you do with what's already out there, that is a business discretion that you would have to do. Uh, you, you would have to make basically. Okay. okay. Thank you. Online question, please. Question for Erica. If we are doing container closure integrity testing in lieu of sterility for stability testing, can we omit endotoxin testing from stability and just do at the release? So John, you can jump in on me on this one too. I'll, I'll take the first whack at it. All right, so what the questioner is asking about is there is the ability to, um, as part of the stability program, instead of doing sterility testing, to instead test the integrity of the container closure system, which kind of makes sense, right? Like over time, where's the sterility failure gonna occur on the shelf? It's gonna occur because the container closure system degrades. So um, that is allowable. So it is also allowable under, certain, under some circumstances to omit endotoxin testing at particular time points, but uh, we recommend certainly um, thinking about that, making sure that it's the correct decision for your product and keeping into toxin testing at the final time point for the stability program. Thank you. Next online question, please. Sure. Question for Vince. I'm a US agent that recently started working on ANDAs. Could you share three recommend three key recommendations that would assist with my application moving forward to approval? So 
Yes, I can. Um, there, I don't know specifics because that's a broad question. There's many things, but uh, if I was a regulatory agent that was just starting, and I, I would say again, you want to make sure you have all the necessary documentation in there, meaning you've been keeping track of your ANDA for one, meaning you've made sure all the responses were submitted to any kind of IRs, DRLs, and CRs. That's first things first, make sure that you're keeping up with your communications. Second thing, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, was monitoring. You want to make sure you're monitoring the necessary um, external changes that can affect DMF updates. You're staying in contact with your DMFs, making sure that they're not submitting any amendments that you don't know about that could potentially derail. That's another kind of regulatory thing that I think is valuable that's overlooked. Um, and the last one is definitely probably making sure that you're staying in touch with your facilities, making sure they're up to date, making sure they're all adequate and nothing has transpired on that front that would derail the application. Thank you. Online question, please. Question for Rinku. What happens when there are multiple first filers eligible for 180 day exclusivity and one of the first filers does not provide notification of commercial marketing within 30 days? Will this impact the start of the exclusivity for all the first filers? So I'm just gonna paraphrase the, the question here. So the question is what would happen to that applicant's 180 day if they do not submit notification even though there's other approved applicants in that space? Um, so assuming that you've actually commenced marketing because uh, the question is a little bit more vague than originally stated, indicated, you would be essentially triggering 180-day exclusivity for the entire cohort, uh, and maybe the other applicants will sort of note that too and, and want to, and there's an incentive for you to submit it. There's an incentive for the other applicants to know about it, therefore they can start triggering their marketing as well. Thank you. Next online question, please. Uh, question just for the panel. When an RLD undergoes RX to OTC switch, but the ANDA holder does not switch and continues to market the drug as RX and appears on, or, on an orange book as RX, does the agency monitor this and what action will the agency take considering the product is deemed misbranded? So just to, I guess, rephrase the question, basically what happens when an ANDA applicant does not convert over, correct? Um, so basically, it would really just depend, um, our favorite answer, but initially, it would first, we would have to kind of see when the switch happened for the NDA, because if we're talking just maybe a week or two, then, you know, we, we got to give people time to also submit, right? Um, but. We do monitor, but if we are aware of it, we do monitor, and if compliance needs to take action, we will go that route. Thank you much. That's it for online questions. Anyone else in the house with a question, a very burning question? Doesn't have to be very, any questions? Okay, well that brings us to the end of the session, and we thank our panelists, but let's hold on. We do want to invite Tony Schumer, who is the Senior Advisor from the Office of Generic Drugs, to give us her closing remarks and wrap up. Would you like to stay seated? Yeah, okay.
fun uh, conversation with someone who was talking to me about our usage of acronyms. So to be honest, we do our best. Um, we definitely want to be mindful of using acronyms. It is like a second language to us, but even in-house, we get a little lost and confused in our own acronyms. So we do our best to explain what those acronyms are in the beginning, but um, in our daily language, those acronyms definitely sneak out on us. So um, in closing thoughts, what I wanna leave you with today is a few um, tips. Every product that you're developing, every submission that you're preparing, and every interaction that you have with FDA has its own unique elements. So to make sure, um, to help you out with that, make sure that you know what the resources are available to you. My call to action to each and every one of you is there's so many resources out there. And because of the unique elements of every situation, create a customized toolbox to help you. When building a customized toolbox, it's really important to have a strong regulatory affairs department to help you with that. Don't forget when creating your customized toolbox, the GDUFA 3 commitment letter is also a valuable resource. The GDUFA 3 commitment letter provides new enhancements to the program, which are designed to maximize the efficiency and utility of each assessment cycle. It's intended to reduce the number of assessment cycles. So these new GDUFA 3 enhancements offer a lot of opportunities for prospective applicants, applicants, and application holders to interact with the agency more than any of the two previous iterations of GDUFA. While our presenters may not have specifically referred to the GDUFA 3 commitments with every presentation and every tip that they provided to you today and yesterday, be sure that they did and refer to these opportunities often. We understand that there's a lot of information and to ensure that the pathway to generic drug access continues, we wanna be sure that you have the resources you need and you know how to use them. This is where that customized toolbox comes into play. We also understand that all of this information is hard to process. This is why we participate in events like this one. As you heard from Brenda and others throughout the forum, FDA participates in several forums, conferences, and we also um, prepare a lot of webinars on current issues to help provide you with these resources. We also like to share best practices and current tips for you. I think I even heard about secrets today. So this is the advantage of attending these forums. Please keep an eye out for all of our events as they might help you with developing this customized toolbox that I'm speaking about. We look forward to seeing you all at our future events. Uh, if you were here yesterday, I believe Brenda started the day off with wanting to know um, how many SBIA events that you have attended. I think she was a little disappointed when she didn't see more hands of folks that have pretended, had attended to 10 or more. So this year alone, I think that they have probably at least 10 events. So hopefully um, you guys can keep attending those um, and next year you can help Brenda out by making her feel better that uh, you have participated in many more. We do a lot more outside of SBIA. We host our own events. We also work with the, um, the comp CRCG. See here, I'm using an acronym. The, com the Center for, does anybody remember what that is? Center for uh, Research of Complex Generics. So um, keep an eye out for those. In closing, I wanna thank each of you for participating in our first hybrid GDF since the pandemic. Whether you were here or in person, your participation um, demonstrates your quest for knowledge and desire to stay up to date on current topics. We hope the event was useful um, and informative. Before I walk away today and before we all leave with our free parking tickets, um, I wanna give a big thanks to SBIA for hosting this event. Brenda, Will, Jeff, Nora, Matt, they're all in the back of, room, back of the room, so if you could please turn around and give them a wave and a, of appreciation, we would really appreciate that. Thank you so much, everyone. Drive home safe.